Hello and welcome to Gwent World Masters. The season five final is here. And my name is Pavel Buja, and I'm as always joined by my co-host Ryan Scow. I probably pronounced that properly. Finally! It was beautiful. Thank you so much, Buja. I'm actually incredibly humbled, honored, happy to be here at the very final Gwent Masters tournament. As a community manager, though, I uh, actually did speak to the community. I know it's crazy. Uh, and uh, they told me that there's uh, already quite a few community tournaments on the horizon happening, so there will always be time for some competitive Gwent. Uh, speaking of community, I'm actually so happy because uh, we're not going to be alone today. We have True. around 50 to 70 community members watching and celebrating this tournament. Here in our studio. In the studio, Perfect. which is super exciting. Um, and usually I bring you some leaks as well, but not this time around. It's my job. Don't take my job. Exactly. I was uh, lectured on that. But, but there is more. Uh, we do have some surprises for you, so make sure to stay glued to your screens. Don't blink, don't miss it, uh, because yeah, I'm, I'm excited for uh, what we have prepared for you. And it's not Gwen too, I want to get that out of the picture, <laughs> it's don't even think about it. Uh, but what's most important is we also have the casters with us here today yes. in the studio, they're actually right over there. It's incredible because it's been four years since we have them with us. Uh, the pandemic kind of changed how we do esports and everything was done online. But now the players will be online while the casters are with us in the studio. It's amazing. It's our 30th tournament ever for Gwent the Witcher card game, of course, official one. And I can't wait for this weekend. It's going to be nostalgic. It's going to be great. There's going to be tears for sure. Maybe from me, maybe from him, from him for sure. Uh, but we can't wait, we're excited, and since we're so excited, maybe we'll just stop talking and we'll throw it over to Shinmiri and Sili who are standing by. That's right, here we are, live from the studio, just as our wonderful and ever so stylish uh, hosts just let you know they're right over there. And with me, who's also right over here, is Shinmiri, my good friend and co-caster. Yes, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you, Seely. Uh, it's crazy to finally be casting alongside you in the studio. Uh, this is World Master Season 5 Grand Finale. Uh, we have eight of the best players, a massive prize pool of 42,500 USD. And these players have uh, been working hard all year to, to qualify to get to this stage. Some of them by winning the mid-season tournament, uh, one by having the most crown points over the entire year, and a lot of them through through the group stage, the brutal group stage that was happening uh, last weekend. Yes, exactly. That means the decks have been out for a while, all the players have been able to prepare, and also you watching at home have been able to uh, complete some divination challenges, and we'll be talking about those a little bit later as we go through the results and see what you think in terms of divination. Uh, but before that, please uh, keep in mind that even though we're here in the studio right now, the players are still connecting online, and they are playing on a 30 minute delay uh, so that is how the tournament will take place today yes and don't forget about twitch observer that is still live and operational so make sure you take advantage of that hover over those cards if you have any questions you can check the decks the graveyards and uh yeah this very very useful tool to make sure you are using it that's right get comfortable at home take your time hover over those cards that's what i do if i watch from home and we also have some very special rewards for you for watching the tournament on on twitch this weekend uh we have the twitch drops which is right as you see in front of you for four hours of watching you will be getting the beholder title and at eight hours the masters card back 2023 a beautiful unique card back uh, featuring uh, School of the Wolf symbols. Yes, really beautiful and of course symbolizing the Masters logo. Uh, definitely make sure you get that one through those drops, but yes, make sure that you actually go and claim them so that you can reach the next milestone. Uh, sometimes I forget to do that and I've been sad when I haven't been able to get those sweet rewards, so just make sure that you do that. Um, and yeah, I think we should look at the players, right? Yeah, let's take a look at who are the eight players who are competing for the World Masters title in Season 5. All right, first up we have Bukowski going head-to-head -head with Magpie in the first series. After that, cast by Ghost Arya and Lionheart, it will be Katzberger versus Sandventer. And all of these players from the top uh, side of the bracket have qualified through the group stage uh, that was competed last weekend. Yes, and as well as Joe and Miyamon, those, uh, those two also came to the group stage. We have Kaneki Yamori, who was the champion 
champion of the mid-season tournament back in June. He uh, punches tickets straight to the top eight, as well as Pyable, who acc accrued the most crown points throughout this entire season by winning multiple uh, pro rank seasons throughout the year. And as you can see, the uh, match stake for the quarterfinals is $2,000, and that will be split up depending on the game score. So if you win 3-0 in the quarterfinals, you get all $2,000. If it's 3-2, then it gets split up 60-40%. That's right. The players are hoping for a 3-0, of course, every one of them, because that's how you earn the most cash. But we know that we have some intense games coming up, so we'll see how those series end up going. But of course, we'll keep you updated throughout on this prize pool distribution. And in terms of a fun little update for everyone at home, you can use the hashtag WorldMasters and tell us about what you think of this event. Maybe tweet uh, and sound off any fun moments anything that really stuck out to you and if you are here at uh, cdpr then you can also show us your pictures from the event for example we'd love to see who you're watching with and yeah. how things are going down at the watch party yeah so let's also take a look at the brackets now how see how the action will unfold this weekend um, as a reminder these are best of five uh matches so you will have um, up to five games. The first player in each half of uh, the first player in each half of the bracket will have blue coin or going first uh, games one and three and five, and then this, the second player will be going first games two and four. That's right. Now, for anyone at home uh, or for anyone new watching, uh, for example, then make sure you get the game as well. It is free to play. You can go to playwent.com, grab it there for free to play. Uh, so many cards around, so much to do and explore and fun decks to craft. Just go crazy, even though it is the last uh, patch that has been um, out now, you can still, as the community, influence some of the balancing uh, in Gwent. That's true. We have Gwentfinity and the Balance Council going forward. So uh, players nowadays, it's, there's a lot of passionate debate about how to properly balance and influence the different archetypes and you get to change the meta the way that you want to see the game being played. Exactly. And don't forget to check out Play Gwent social media as well. Yes, we are at PlayGwent on uh, Twitter as well as Facebook. All right, so coming up first, we will have uh, Bukowski versus Magpie for our first quarter finals. Uh, we have a lot of great words and interviews from them, and let's hear what they had to say coming into the top eight. Hey, I'm Bukowski. I started playing Gwent since 2020 and competing tournaments since August 2023. When I started playing Gwent, I just couldn't got my eyes out of those beautiful cards and I can't wait to unlock every story node to discover secrets from legendary characters and a fascinating world. And that would be my favorite Gwent moment. I am playing against Magpie and my thoughts about him are He is well known and uh, liked by community The first year I started playing Gwent, I knew there was someone called Magpie exists I think he is a great deck builder Always can find something unique to play This time he brought Mushroom Skelliger that I found out to be really powerful it's even better when nobody expects it. So I'm really looking forward to play against him, a legend of Gwent. Hello everyone, my name is Magpie. I think like most of you know me because uh, I feel like I'm one of the oldest players in Gwent. I've been playing Gwent like for, uh, for seven years now. And yeah, that's, that's quite a lot. Uh, yeah, uh, this is my last tournament and uh, I think this is like everyone's last tournament in Gwent. Uh, so I hope that uh, I will do my best and try to win it. Uh, and try to show like the best gameplay uh, I can possibly I could possibly make. Um, 
Talking about my favorite moments in the Gwent, I was thinking about the Challenger 5 moments uh, back in the day when I won this tournament, uh, or like any any time I went to Warsaw to meet uh, the guys from CPR and other Gwent players, uh, because every time I go there, uh, it's like very happy days for me. Uh, I enjoy spending time. Uh, but, but, there is one moment, uh, I think, uh, uh, that makes me proud, uh, that, uh, I became a Gwent card, uh, yeah, there's a magpie in the game, unfortunately this card sucks, <laughs> uh, because no, nobody plays it, uh, but yeah, I think community have a chance to buff it and uh, make it playable. Uh, so yeah, I would say that this is my favorite moment in Gwent, that basically I am immortalized in, in the game. Yeah, that's it. Talking about my opponent, uh, Bukowski, uh, in the CIS community we call him Legendary Bukowski, uh, because uh, I played him in the qualifiers, the qualifiers that I won uh, on these Masters. Uh, and he had like every chance to win these qualifiers, but he like did everything wrong. He misplayed a lot, and uh, that's why I'm here. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I think I have a pretty decent chance versus him, especially because uh, my decks are just no, my decks beat his decks. So yeah, I think I won't have a hard, hard time uh, winning versus him. Um, yeah, that's it. I always love watching these interviews from the players taken beforehand. Uh, really wholesome players, some of them we know a little bit more than others. For example, Magpie, as he said, has been around in terms of these official tournaments. Bukowski, on the other hand, a little bit newer. Uh, but yeah, I really loved those assets as well. And the players giving out the quotes, uh, kind of a nod to Gwentfinity there, I think, from Bukowski. And Magpie, as he said, has now a card in Gwent. He does, he does. <laughs> but it doesn't see that much play so maybe if you're a fan of magpie maybe you vote to buff that magpie card in the future um, but interesting I th that I heard from magpie in his interview that he mentioned that Bukowski was actually uh, an opponent in the qualifier that could have maybe beaten him uh, but let him through to the uh, top to the to the world masters group stage here and I wonder how Bukowski feels about that if he maybe wants to get some revenge or redemption against Magpie here in the first round quarterfinals. Exactly, the stakes are really, really high, of course, for both of the players, and getting a rematch is always pretty interesting. Um, so we'll have to see how that goes. Uh, yeah, so um, we have a little bit of a surprise for you here in the studio. Um, I think Ryan might have that for you right now if we can throw it over it to him. It might be Ryan, it might be Bourgeois. Yeah. We don't even know because uh, we can't see them that well over there. But we'll see what's going on as they'll be showing us what they have prepared. It is quite a surprise because I have Game King here with me. Game King, how are you? Thank you for coming over to the studio. I'm good. Uh, nice to meet you. <laughs> it's great <laughs> to be back. Again, yeah. we're reunited again. What have you been up to? Um, I've done a lot of gaming and also other in real life business. Oh, okay. Solar panels and stuff. Solar panels. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. So this is kind of a you know our last official tournament. Of course, like Ryan said, there will be more community tournaments. But I wanted to know what's your like most memorable moment from Gwen's esports team. From Hall of Quentin Sports, um, I'd say the Challenger event, the Challenger Moshna oh, Castle. Nice. I think that was the most memorable yeah. moment yeah. for me. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, it was an, was I an still awesome think time. of it um, yeah. every now and then, like yeah. every every few months. You reminisce <laughs> about the good old times, yeah. Yes, yeah. those were the golden times. I always say <laughs> when I talk to friends. We have, of course, the community with us uh, here in the studio, so some familiar faces uh, you'll be seeing probably throughout the weekend. But yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome to have you. So you're saying solar panels, but you're still in in gaming. Are you playing any card games at the moment and stuff like that? Yes, I'm. I'm playing um, all sorts of games like that I like from different gaming companies. Yeah, also but not Cyberpunk anything professional, esports. 
or a little bit of also like you still have that competitive edge in you. In in, in games that are strategy games like card yeah. games and others, I'm I'm capable of um, playing in esports uh, okay, I, if I'm good enough. Yeah. But in all the other games, I'm not good enough. <laughs> Even if I tried, I could not play a professional play in, in the uh, in any game where you need to click fast with your hand. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. like the all those FPS. As yeah, well. I'm, I'm not yeah. good enough for those. <laughs> but the strategy games, I always try, and then if I have enough time, I can also. Yeah. If I randomly qualify for some random tournament, then You'll I play probably it. Go for yeah. it right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, but like you said, you're busy. You're also working now, so there's not not enough time for all that. I'm stuff. working on my own yeah. with my brothers, so I basically always have time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I just use the the entire time for gaming and, and yeah. other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So it's awesome to having you in the studio, and it's awesome chatting with you. Hopefully, we can chat a little bit more later. Thank you for for joining us. Anything you want to pass on to the people watching? Um, enjoy the tournament today, it's awesome, and good luck to the players. Exactly, and let's go back to the casters. That was really fun to hear from Game King. Of course, uh, a lot of you know Game King from previous tournaments, and I think it's just great having uh, him here. It's, it's so cool to see that. Uh, I'm a big fan of Game King, and uh, I love hanging around with him. Every time I'm here in Poland, he's a really, really fun guy to be around. Absolutely. But we do have a series ahead, and speaking of which, you all have decided, or you have divined perhaps, uh, and we will see the results of the divination uh, challenge that was uh, ongoing, and, and kind of see the percentages of who you think will be taking the series. Look at that, Whoa, Shigeru. That is insane. 84% of you say that Magpie will defeat Bukowski here in the quarterfinals. Um, that's not surprising to me. Magpie is a veteran of the game. He's won Challenger 5 from Season 1, as well as I believe he won Open number 1 from Season 4. So a lot of uh, wins under his belt. Whereas Bukowski, relatively newer to the scene, he says he's been playing the game since 2020, but his first competitive appearance uh, was only in August of this year, so after the mid-season tournament. That is really new, so yeah, I agree with you. It does make sense uh, to, to see that, but yeah, I, what I do you think, think? I think people are underestimating Bukowski a little bit because yeah. he has had really, really impressive ladder uh, results over the past several competitive seasons, and he's one of the players that I know a lot of the pros have been on the lookout for as like a new ri rising star from China, Magpie, of course, from Moldova. Um, this is going to be a pretty epic clash, I think. I think so as well. This is Bukowski's time to shine. This is Magpie's time to defend sort of the, the title of uh, um, returning player, so to speak. But we need to check out what are they playing? What are they bringing? Yes, let's take a look at their deck list. We're going to start with Bukowski, who is going to be going on blue coin first. He has Enslaved Nilfgaard, Pincer Maneuver, Northern Realms, Off the Books, Syndicate, as well as Guerrilla Tactics, Scoia'tael. Yeah, this Enslave list, we've seen a kind of classic version from Nilfgaard a couple of times, plays a lot of Assimilate engines that ultimately will be taking uh, as they as they get procced from uh, Nilfgaard's creates. So Nilfgaard doing Nilfgaard things, stealing your cards potentially, or creating them rather, and then using them to their advantage, maybe even better than the faction that uh, they are stealing from. Uh, but we do have a sort of a star here of the, the deck, and that is Taurus Vor Emrys that we'd like to highlight here. Yeah, let's take a look at closer at him. Uh, he does a lot of different things. He's got two different forms. Uh, his first form is the one that's more commonly used in this Assimilate deck, where he can put spying onto up to three units in your opponent's deck that have 10 provisions or less, and make copies of them in your own deck, which then you can shuffle towards the top of your deck with a card like Calvit, and then you can play your opponent's strategy perhaps even better than they do, and you can play multiple copies of their cards, too, uh, with the version that Taurus creates with a coup on the version that Taurus puts a spying on and then uh, spawning it from Terra Nova later. Exactly, and Taurus does have a second form as well that can be used uh, for the Assimilate tank. For example, uh, you can move an allied unit that's not from your starting deck uh, back into your hand and then play it again to trigger some Assimilates. But I think it's quite safe to say that Taurus is generally used uh, earlier on in round one, for example, for that big, big kind of reach and point slam that Nilfgaard typically doesn't have that much of. But let's take a look at this pincer maneuver list. I would say at this point, this is another classic. The Erland uh, sort of muta generator deck boosting archetype that relies on putting the boosts 
on all of these four provision cards that you see, quite a, quite a tall list of those, and then utilizing the Erland uh, to, to then benefit from those boons later on. Yeah, and protecting all of those boost points with the immunity that Erland has. Uh, and, and a newer addition to this uh, deck list is the Iris Companions and Iris Von Everett combo, uh, able to tutor Iris early on put her in the graveyard, discard her with Iris Companions, and have her ability boost every unit remaining in the deck, especially when three are also being spawned by Temple of Mothlay. That's a lot of carryover uh, from that card. It sure can be. And then off the books, Syndicate. Quite a strong list now with a lot of things happening since the Vice keyword was released. Uh, we'd like to look at these open sesames, I think in particular they're worth pointing out just because uh, these are the setup to that Vice keyword. If you set up these in your graveyard, you can get a lot of coin carryover, more so than Syndicate could before. It was always known for that unique mechanic, but with these open sesames, you can really really line up things beautifully in your uh, graveyard and create some of the swingiest plays in Gwent currently. Yeah, so Open Sesame can give you five coins immediately off the bat, and then as well as potentially four more coins in a future, uh, in the future with every time you get down to zero coins, every time you spend down to zero coins, it will trigger its counter, and after six counters, it'll give you that four extra coins. So this Syndicate deck is all about carry over, carry over, carry over. You've got um, a lot of coins from your leader, you've got the coins that you can carry over from the round just based on Syndicate's passive ability, as well as now the, all the open sesames. You can create open sesames from Shady Vendor. Uh, it's just so many points, even without something like Acheronte, but when you combine that with Exora and Acheronte, you can really get crazy board states. Absolutely. So keep an eye on the, the graveyard, if you can, with your Gwent Observer uh, to keep track of all the things that will be happening with Syndicate because a lot usually uh, is going on uh, with that Vice keyword and the coins countdown and the graveyard open sesame. So a pretty fun and explosive list, I would say. And last but not least, we have Guerrilla Tactics Shiru Milva deck from Bukowski. This has been uh, the go-to Skoyatel deck for a couple of months out for pro competitive players. A lot of flexibility, a lot of control. Yeah, that's right. Um, with the Mahokan Pass and of course the Veil there, you can actually line up your uh, Shiru to be quite tall and it is almost like a game within a game. When you're lining up that Shiru value, you have to time it right, uh, but it can be a really, really big threat that your opponent has to keep in mind constantly. Not to mention that offering that also can increase your Shiru to a five if it is in your deck, but your opponent of course does not know whether you boosted that or perhaps something else. So kind of like a mind gamey list a little bit as well. Yeah, very powerful. I love playing this deck on ladder. Let's take a quick look at Magpie's list, what he will he be bringing against Bukowski uh, in this first quarter finals. Magpie's got Pincer Maneuver, Northern Realms, uh, White Frost Monsters, Battle Trance, Skellige, and Deadeye Ambush, Skoyatel. All right, this Pinsler Maneuver list does play Traveling Priestesses, and together with Onager, Tritum Infantry, you can thin quite perfectly so that your Priestesses are still in your deck, and then when you play them, ideally as like a last say, then you can just explosively use these Order abilities and get a pretty nice uh, point boost at the end, but uh, you need to secure your round to be able to do so. You need to secure round three, and together with cards like Siege, you can really amp up the pressure. So Magpie might be playing this list quite aggressively, quite early on. Muta Generator here as well. Magpie saying it's good enough to run in the list to get some carryover on all of those five P's you see. Yeah, and one of the five P's that we really want to take a look at is Onager, um, a ver re relatively newer card, super strong in the game right now, one of the best bronzes in the game. It's able to amplify or multiply all the values you get every time you use an order ability, whether it's from a unit or from your leader, it'll damage a random enemy unit by one. And this card is very flexible in this deck. You can use it early in the game uh, in combination with your reinforced ballistas to really get a lot of engine value, or you can use it as a finisher late to be played with a priestess, and milita uh, a priestess which will have um, maybe like 11 charges on it, and it's going to double the value of every single charge, especially um, unconditionally almost when played with Vernon Roach and combos with uh, the Priestess on the same turn. Yeah, I'm excited to see that deck in action, but also White Frost Devotion. 
uh, again, fitting kind of the point slammy theme that we immediately see here from Magpie. Not so much maybe acting, interacting with your opponent's board, but rather relying on Frost, relying on these Foglets to go really tall and ideally uh, not be removable by your opponent. Uh, and yeah, strong Wild Hunt cards in the gold front are Gaith Echo for the ultimate Frost uh, application. You know, devotion, uh, devotion lovers are cheering yes. for Magpie <laughs> right now. The first two deck lists he's brought are both devotion decks, uh, and he's even brought the Nithral in the <laughs> Wild Hunt uh, deck. Nithral, uh, a blast from the past almost. Haven't seen this card in a long time. No, that is true. It's replacing sort of the, the classical Toad Prince, I believe, in that slot instead. And I'm curious to see how much engine value this Nithril actually is able to generate for Magpie. But it is a cool card, and I mean, if it's all dealt with, it adds up. Yeah, it does add up pretty fast. And a third deck we have here is uh, one of my favorites, the Battle Trance Skellige Alchemy deck. Magpie's got uh, a lot of new cards in this deck. It's It's been buffed, this archetype, uh, pretty significantly with things like uh, Ale of the Ancestors uh, getting the Alchemy tag. Let's take a look at this. Yeah, this card, of course, uh, does now boost potentially your engines and gives that infusion. And through this infusion, of course, your four permission alchemy cards can ultimately end up playing for 20 points or so, which is that big buff coming to the archetype itself. It's also quite consistently tutored uh, from Ermion because of that alchemy tag that you mentioned. And it has resilience now, which is huge, potentially being able to take advantage of that in two rounds and not just one. Exactly, and uh, one thing you can do is also stack up on those infusions on the same card, which is worth noting as well. It can be nice to, to utilize, uh, but we'll see how Magpie plays it out. A lot of pre-planning required, I think, from this deck for things to really go well. You have to set up your graveyard for that Otkel. You want your Freyas in the graveyard. You also want to have access to Crow Clan Preachers, as those will be the engines that we're going to be seeing uh, the most from Magpie. Yes, and uh, finally we've had Deadeye Ambush uh, Elves from Magpie. Uh, a very strong list if you can draw your cards, but notoriously known as an inconsistent deck that doesn't really play a lot of tutors. You've got the Reordain that can get you a trap or an elf, but you don't have anything like a Royal Decree or a Call of the Forest to actually get this Reordain, which is why you see that stratagem there. It's the Cursed Scroll Stratagem. Maybe this is a uh, Magpie's thinking to uh, play this on Blue Coin to use that Cursed Scroll to get some consistency. We're going to have to see, uh, but these are the lists that we will be seeing in the first series, both from Bukowski and from Magpie. And in addition, we'll be getting a nice analysis from Specimen, who is currently also here, but uh, he'll be taking you through these games after the series. Yes, love to hear what the analyst Specimen was going to say later. Um, so glad he's here, and we have uh, a first quarterfinal matchup, an epic one, between Bukowski and Magpie. They are going to battle it out here and get us started on this action this weekend. I'm really excited to see the games. I'm so excited as well. We have two different strategies, as we mentioned. Magpie going more so for that heavy point slam. Not a lot of board interaction. Bukowski, on the other hand, a bit more reactive uh, decks, including. But here, let's take a look at the bans. Of course, best of five format. One deck will be banned from both players, and it is the double Scoia'tael ban. What do you think about that, Shenmue? Yeah, I think it makes sense. Um, like you said, Magpie's strategy is mostly on the solitaire side and trying to just like get as many points as he can on his side of the board. Bukowski needs to control Magpie's greedier strategies, and that Scoia'tael uh, Shiru Milva deck that Bukowski has is one of the best control decks that he has at his disposal. So Magpie doesn't want to have, see that, and. Um, Bukowski banning Magpie's Deadeye Ambush Elves also makes a lot of sense. It has some great matchups as we were looking through uh, potential decks that they could face off against each other. Uh, we thought that the Deadeye Ambush Elves was favored against almost any everything that Bukowski had. Yeah, exactly. We did try to theorize what these players would ban in advance, of course, while we are uh, preparing as casters, and I think we definitely agree with this conclusion from the players here because indeed it is quite difficult to control the Deadeye, uh, de Deadeyes that will uh, ultimately have carryover on them and play out for really, really big tokens on the board. You can't do much to deal with this one. Yeah, um, you know, when we were talking about this one when discussing the bands, it's like 
the elf deck is such a difficult deck to think about whether you should ban or not because it has such a big variance on whether it draws its card or not. Maybe it's favored when it draws all of its cards, but in how many how many of those games will it, will it miss something important? And do you you know do you leave it open thinking that oh my opponent's going to get unlucky and miss something and then I can take advantage of that, or do you just make the assumption that oh they're probably going to get stuff and uh, I'm going to be in trouble? Yeah, it's a choice because of course we do know that Magpie has very threatening decks and you have to decide which one of those is not going to be allowed to be played. And these players have scrimmed a lot, so Bukowski probably knows that yeah on blue coin with that cursed scroll you might be finding what you need a little bit too easy despite there not being an inclusion of Call of the Forest, anything like that. So yeah, this ban makes complete sense uh, and it's going to be, like you said, an epic showdown. Really, it's going to be neck to neck. It's really, really difficult to say whether either of these players have an edge going into this series, uh, but I'm just so excited to see how it all plays out once we get to the games. Yeah, uh, Magpie versus Bukowski, the veteran versus the newcomer. It's uh, it's a really good storyline, actually. I'm excited, and oh, yeah, this is so I'm, good. I, I'm super excited as well. That storyline is, I feel like, a kind of a repeating one in Gwent We've a seen lot it a of lot. the time. Yes. Exactly, and I feel like you get a little bit of extra fire when you have to go up against a very well-known player, which would be Magpie here. But let's see how it all goes as we have our first games here. Bukowski, of course, on blue coin, choosing to play Syndicate. Magpie here responding with the red coin, Devotion Frost. A lot of pressure going to be coming down here from Magpie, uh, I think. Shin Marie and Syndicate, on the other hand, has to defend or either get out early enough. We talked about those vice cards being quite dangerous, so I think Syndicate, one of those decks that you a lot of the time want to have round control against and potentially decide to bleed. Yeah, that's right. Oof, and Bukowski drawing into that King of Beggars uh, bricked card as the uh, as the very last mulligan. That's going to be trouble for him because he is on the blue coin. He is at risk of losing on even, and you know Wild Hunt. Uh, Frost is one of those decks notorious for abusing that red coin tempo, um, getting things like Winter Queen to extend their reach very, very quickly into the round. And look at this first play. Candle coming out, not typically seen in round one from Syndicate, as it is a card that you would like to utilize in round two, going into round three. But here, we can definitely see that Bukowski is taking things very seriously uh, in round one. Of course, we have the Flying Redavian as well coming down here at uh, nine coins in the bank. Has been buffed now uh, for power, quite strong. Will be coming back later. Uh, and in response, we see a Nithral being set up there by Mad Pine. Yeah, Nithral is the opening play. Um, Bukowski making sure to take dominance quickly away from that Nithral so it only deals one damage per turn at the moment and putting that poison on it, getting ready to, um, to, to remove it the next turn. Yeah, it will take a little bit of time, of course, to remove it, but no dominance here, as Shin Marie mentioned, which makes it a little bit less uh, damaging right now. Um, An Aristocrat coming down here as well. Nice little engine to have on the board. Frost application as well. You want your Winter Queen to come out eventually, which requires two rows of frost uh, as well. A little bit of extra thinning. And uh, here comes the poison finish from Bukowski uh, on the Nithral that won't be ticking anymore. Yeah, um, it's a good... He, now, Bukowski taking his time, deciding whether or not he wants to spend the rest of his coins with this candle, thinking, calculating just exactly how many points he needs to be ahead if he wants to have a chance of passing on the next turn, because he is at seven cards. This is his first opportunity to pass, uh, and if he stays in this round too long, he will lose his chance to maybe get out of round one um, up a card. Exactly. You have to decide though here with these open sesames, of course you want to chain them quite nicely so you might not want to put them into that graveyard too early but with that coin carryover and this uh, guard as well that we see in the deck, kind of an infinite spender for Syndicate that is very, very good um, in terms of putting points on the board. So you might not have to commit anything too big too early, but we do see Eridin here as a response. And now Bukowski is going to have to decide whether to go uh, a little bit more into this round. And uh, see what I mean here with the Eridin? and the uh, Frost and the three damage, he, Magpie was able to get ahead by exactly one point. If Bukowski had spent some of those coins maybe last turn, uh, he could have maybe been 
uh, had the option of passing, but now forced to continue playing this round if he wants to try to keep card advantage. Does slam that Oxen for guard. As a four-piece better, one of the best cards in the deck, actually, because it is able to translate coins to points at better than a one-to-one -one ratio every time you spend down to zero. Magpie here, on the other hand, does move that guard away from its adjacent units. And meanwhile, Winter Queen, of course, coming out there with that double frost application and Foglet now at nine points. And you know what else is really annoying here, Shinmarie, is the Veil tag for a Syndicate. It's, it makes Foglet so good because it is not poisonable. You really have a hard time removing it. Not a lot of answers for Bukowski in general here. Poison being one of them, but completely not working on this Foglet. Though. Yeah, Poison being really the only tall punish in this Syndicate deck having had to cut the morels that we've seen in maybe previous versions for something like that Serenity. Exactly. And now it seems like Bukowski is in a little bit of trouble here with that Frost being online and Magpie taking advantage of just playing this four provision card, getting boosted by the opposite row of Frost as it has the Wild Hunt tag and uh, taking it slow for now. Magpie does have a hand that can play quite far into it. And meanwhile, like you said, that unfortunate King of Beggars draw for Bukowski does not allow Bukowski to potentially play as far down as uh, he would like to. Yeah, and here we're looking at the Eventide Plunder choices. Uh, three, four provision spenders for Bukowski. Will he go with the Sea Jackal? The failed experiment, which could provide a poison, but I don't think, I don't think Bukowski has another poison in his hand at the moment. Um, he might be able to get one if he ended up committing something like Acherontia, but I, I, I think we might see, you know, Bukowski have to exit this round pretty soon. Yeah, taking a soul here, uh, not spending any coins either anymore, just holding on to them because they will go into that bank. Uh, Magpie here doing exactly, I think, what the White Frost deck came here to do as well, applying pressure. Uh, definitely a deck can go, that can go from both coins, but on red coin, I think it's so scary just because of the sheer power that it has and that can be applied here in round one. Yeah, and you see that Karen Theory in Magpie's hand already at 16 power and probably still gonna grow a bit if more frost does come down. The Aridin really helping the Karen Theory grow at a faster pace because he's, it's making the frost deal three damage instead of two. All right, Nogglefar coming down here uh, has a choice of either Oberon here or Wrath. Oberon, of course, being a more later round card, not really something you want to commit in round one. We see the Imloret's Wrath coming down here instead, and Oberon now being on top after Oof. that Nogglefar. That was a pretty unlucky pull by Magpie. I know he was looking for that Ardgaeth, or maybe even the Gels to tutor Ardgaeth. There were four golds in his deck at the, at the time, and he ended up pulling the only two bad ones. So ended up having to play a very, very underwhelming Imworth's Wrath, especially when that's like one of your very few control cards in a deck like Devotion while Um Magpie ha has to be not happy to see that, and maybe Bukowski given a little bit of a, a, a second chance here. Absolutely. Now, we do know that uh, Azar here is in Bukowski's hand, a pretty good defender, which is really difficult to get through anyway. So perhaps that Imlarith's Wrath would have a little bit of trouble later. And as you mentioned, uh, we also see Karanthir, Golden Child, tick up here to a 19-point uh, card right now. And yeah, again, no poison here from Bukowski anymore in the hand to respond to some tall threat. It is looking really tough. There is an Acheronthia, though, uh, in Bukowski's hand. What do you think? Is that something that uh, Bukowski would be okay just committing? Or is the point gap getting a little bit too big now as Tierna Leah has also been committed here by Magpie? I, I, think it, uh, I think it's too far. I think Bukowski got what he wanted, even though he didn't win on Eve, or he didn't get get out of the card without losing on even, and he is going to probably lose on even. He has uh, both open sesames in his graveyard for carryover, and Magpie has no frost carryover, which is a big deal for this deck. The, the Devotion Wild Hunt deck wants to um, bring a lot of turns of frost over with the Tirna Leah, and then uh, stack that, take advantage of that with the, the Navigator, with an Ancient Foglet, and that's a big miss on the not finding the Ardgate through the, um, the Nagalfar in round one. 
That's right, Bukowski has all the setup. Now, one thing that Syndicate might have an issue with is just the fact that when you start committing, it's oftentimes very much a all in or nothing situation. And that is what Magpie is going to be pushing out. And this round absolutely wants to see some of these big vice payoff cards like Acheronthia now. We, also, Magpie, of course, is aware that the setup is there and has to get it out because otherwise Syndicate is just going to be a little bit too powerful in a long round three. Bukowski now does have the candle set up, uh, will not carry over to round three anymore, but we'll try to play this out and, and perhaps gets out of the round, has to maybe spend something good or can uh, get away with not doing it. Depends on how deep Magpie is willing to push. Yeah, Magpie opening with the Aristocrat here. Um, seemingly just four points, but one of the best engines in this deck as she gives you additional turns of frost every time you put frost on your opponent's side of the board. So here Bukowski going for that shady vendor on the range row, trying to find payday or maybe um, the mutations, the select, uh, the mutagens, I mean, to deal enough damage to kill that aristocrat, getting it off the board. I, I think he even chose that over an open sesame because he recognizes how powerful and how uh, big of a deal this engine is. Yeah, Shady Vendor in this deck, really beautiful, can create a card that you need. The pool is a little bit bigger now, so it's about a 50-50 to see the result you actually want to see when creating. Uh, but a lot of the time we do see the, the Syndicate deck kind of utilize it to get that uh, open sesame, additional open sesame into the graveyard. But in this case, of course, like you mentioned, it was payday instead. Art Gate on the board now, just applying Frost. Nothing for Bukowski to actually interact with on Magpie's side of the board yet, but that Foglet uh, uh, is a nice find for Magpie, has the Veil Tag as mentioned, can come down at any point uh, to, to utilize some of the Frost that's on the board currently. Yeah, we also see Moral in Bukowski's hand. Some uh, usually a very threatening card that you know threatens poison, uh, and it's very difficult to deal with. Not you have to answer the Moral, and you have to maybe purify or veil your poison target. But uh, not a great card in this matchup as he is row locked uh, on the melee row. Uh, wild fr wild. Wild Hunt having multiple movement options with their leader uh, or with a bruiser, but that defender, that Azar Javid, actually going to be played on the front row, probably to try to block this movement option uh, that Magpie might be using as a response to the Marauder. Exactly, and of course, Emirates Wrath are not going to take down these Scarabs anymore. Uh, here is the Foglet, uh, one of those cards that can very nice go tall, but also uh, dodge the Emerald removal that is sort of inevitable here. But let's see just how far Magpie is willing to go. Not really happy enough with just seeing the Azar. As we know, there is Ixora, there is Acheronthia, both really, really scary threats from Syndicate that I'm sure Magpie would love to see before this round is uh, over. But for now, just a Oxenford Guard here coming down from Bukowski. Nice spender online. And again, open sesames as well, right? Yeah, open sesames are in the graveyard. They're at five counter, so it's still going to take quite a bit before they're activated and giving you those four points each. There is also a flying Redanian in there that would come out if Bukowski ever got to nine coins, but there's um, not that much profit right now. The Acheronti is really the main card that's giving you profit, uh, or you're going to have to spend some leader charges. Yep. All leader charges still at Bukowski's disposal, which is a nice thing about off the books. You do have those uh, and accessible at any time. Magpie, on the other hand, just applying a little bit more frost here by the order ability of Tirnalia, uh, playing the Wild Hunt Riders and a Navigator. Look at that 22 point yeah. foglet. That is insane. There's uh, no fear <laughs> coming from Magpie's side because he knows there's not that tall punish except for the poison. And this morale is kind of burning a hole in Bukowski's hand here with no good target even this deep into the round. Exactly, and Acheronthia has now been played out by Bukowski. It is safe and sound behind the last Scarab that is going to be defending it. So quite a powerful card coming down here from Bukowski also has to catch up in terms of points. Um, oh so man, this is dangerous. He is spending, Bukowski is spending those coins and setting the uh, Acherontia as his tallest unit, but boosts enough with that extra use of leader to take it out of reach of that nine damage uh, Lord Riptide that would have been able to clash with the tallest unit on Bukowski's side. Yep, there it is, the Lord Riptide with 
nine power and two armor on the board. Karanthir not looking as juicy as it did the previous round with the amount of frost uh, having been applied here. But will there be a commitment here from Magpie? Or is Magpie saying, okay, I saw the Akaranthia and that's good enough for me. But no, here comes Karanthir, Golden Child. Now here is a morale target, uh, potentially. Yes, that's true, but Morale, it's gonna take Morale an extra turn to uh, finish the poison if he doesn't have any other help. So, like, if Wukowski were to just play Morale here, it's not gonna get him ahead, and he's gonna maybe uh, have to use an extra card and then give Magpie double last say in round three. Because there's still Frost ticking. There is, though, this Acherontia that's almost triggered on its vice, and so Bukowski may be thinking about using two extra leader charges here to get a card from the top of the deck. Wow. It is Exora, a really, I would say maybe an overcommitment uh, in this round. So that's kind of one of the weaknesses of this deck. You don't know what you're gonna get off the top with the Acherontia. It could be something that's too good or it could be something that's too bad, like a King of Beggars. Yeah, exactly. Um, also, one card that we peeked at there in the deck still not having been found from Bukowski yet is well, Madame Marquis, which is a card that you can play sort of earlier on to thin your deck and also put a lot of points and engine threats on the board that again, we would know that Magpie couldn't deal with very efficiently, but unfortunately just a card that wasn't found earlier for Bukowski and perhaps resulting in maybe not the most optimal um, draws either later on, but yeah, Exora coming out here is quite big. Uh, the second sort of big vice threat, both of them are out now, and Magpie's saying, all right, I want to see your last card too. Playing the Lord Riptide, Morale being used here, and of course, Shady Vendor can be played. It can be played, but it doesn't have tribute, which means it will not activate the King of Beggars, uh, and it won't really give you any uh, many coins carried over into the next round, and you won't have a chance to maybe see like uh, another open sesame off of it. But now we've got both players going into a top deck situation in round three. In our first game of the first quarterfinals, uh, Magpie getting the echo from the Argaith. It's actually kind of a downside of the card. You don't want to see that Argaith in such a short round. No, there is the first bull game from Magpie as well getting rid of this Art Gaith currently. Uh, and of course, the King of Beggars has to go back into the deck. Now, Serenity might still be a nice card to find as it would solve the problem of King of Beggars not coming out. Its tribute is so high, but no. No Madame Marquis here to, to trigger out the King of Beggars either. And we see that Magpie has found Oberon, his finisher, into the wild, the triple wild the Hunt Riders. <laughs> Uh, that is 19 points in one card and very, very well spread out points too. So nothing too tall for that poison uh, that Bukowski plays. Now Bukowski has eight coins, nine coins now because of the Novigrad. Ending that turn with nine coins gets him the four extra points from the Flying Redanian. Wow, triple Wild Hunt Rider coming down here from Magpie. I, that's like the ideal of Ron. I think we're all aiming for when we are playing the card. But Bukowski, of course, does still have coins in the bank, uh, has points to put online. As we're seeing the Eventide Plunder choosing a create here, but no this, this spender. Is, this is from oh, the Novigrad. Novigrad. This is from the Novigrad. He doesn't find a spender from the Novigrad, but he still does have his Eventide Plunder in his hand to find an infinite spender, which he does with the street urchins, and I believe there will be enough uh, for him to trigger both open sesame in his graveyard. Look at, look at this spender now going up to 21 points. It is a seven point lead for Bukowski, and it is gonna be so close, <laughs> but Magpie pulls this out with the bruiser wow. finisher, um, getting the buff from the Oberon as well as the buff from the uh, white frost passive as there was still frost on the road. What an insanely close game that was. Really exciting to see, but yeah, wild frost just a little bit too strong there, a little bit too powerful for a syndicate. Uh, Bukowski perhaps not finding what he needed to find earlier, playing out that Ixora as well from the Akaranthia yeah. instead of another card. Could have cost him that game there. A couple of points, just about. You know, when we when we practiced and looked at this matchup, we 
saw that it was close on a lot of occasions, and uh, the difference maker here, I would say, is one missing Madame Serenity for Bukowski, not finding her, and even by the end of round three, still wasn't finding her. So that's your most expensive card in provision, still stuck in the deck, which is uh, the weakness of the deck because you. It's so powerful and it double thins, so it helps you find everything else. But if you don't find it, you're thinning less and you have less chance of you know, getting all the cards, all the golds that you want. And then the other thing I think was when we mentioned um, in round one, maybe if Bukowski had spent a couple of extra coins early in that round with the candle, maybe he would have had a chance to pass without losing on even cards. And uh, maybe that extra card could have been the difference maker since round three was so close. Yeah, I think an extra card definitely would have helped there, uh, only a couple of points short. But all is not lost for Bukowski, Magpie still has to get two decks through, being Skellige, Alchemy and Northern Realms Pincer Maneuver. Now the coins will be switched, so Magpie will be going on blue coin, Bukowski responding with the red coin. Now do you have any thoughts of what we might be able to expect from the players? Uh, I think maybe on blue coin Magpie, uh, Magpie would maybe bring Priestesses? I could see that. I could also see Battle Trance being played on Blue Coin, right? I think yeah. either I think either could be played on Blue Coin. Um, both very very powerful decks in their own right. I think Magpie did a really good job in Game One uh, with the Wild Hunt win, and we've got uh, Devotion deck, 100% win rate Devotion deck in <laughs> World Masters. You heard it here first. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, I do think that, you know, in terms of blue coin, the Battle Trans deck might uh, utilize the Mask of Aurora stratagem pretty well there and get that one extra thinning to have ideally your setup into later rounds. And uh, Priestesses is kind of like a siege can smork pretty hard on red coin and go in. So perhaps we might see that. But, but as you said, both decks are quite flexible. We might see either. And Bukowski, of course, does have a choice of either deck or any of the decks to be played. So could go Syndicate Replay, we could see Enslave, or we could see, what else does Bukowski have left? The Shoop Erlen? The Shoop right? Erlen, that's right. That's, that's right. actually... Pincery Pincer, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, we asked a couple of players uh, what their thoughts on, on their coins were with their strategies, right? They're bringing the same decks as they played in the group stage, at least the, the ones that did play in the group stage. And uh, we got some, when it comes to Shoop Erlen, we got some different responses. Some players said they wanted Shoop Erlen for red coin, some people mm -hmm. said they wanted Shoop Erlen for blue coin. And uh, I, that's pretty fascinating to me because it is, it's a deck that, wants to go for so much carryover in round one with that meter generator. And here we go, actually. We're jumping into game number two, and it is the Shoop Erlen that Bukowski brings on red. All right, here we go. Shoop Erlen versus Alchemy Skellige. All right, Magpie is looking again for that graveyard setup. There is a fray on hand, quite valuable. You potentially do not want to get rid of it at this point. Dwim Vandras can be activated on Truffle, for example. So the Dwims uh, are kind of mulligan targets for now. Avalok and Ermion in the opening hand is absolutely beautiful because that means you have access to exactly the, the scenarios, the artifacts that you are looking for. And um, yeah, I think this hand is looking really nice from yeah. Magpie. And, and same for Bukowski. He's got a really powerful hand with Muta Generator and Temple and Rune Mage and uh, Iris Companions as well. And here's the portal opener. Magpie looking to thin the deck here tutoring it with Avalok, and uh, on the other hand, Bukowski setting up the Temple of Melitola, choosing between these options of what is going to be put into the deck, something that Bukowski can, can really try to use later. We saw like a Philippa, for example. Philippa can come down on like a Crow Clan Preacher if you really want to. There's always that option of choosing the kind of the, the tech choice, or you could go over whatever is most value. So, um to let's give you guys a heads up for the Temple of Melithlia options, Bukowski ended up going with one Philippa, a War Elephant, as well as a Revenant Kimbolt. So two huge threats with the War Elephant and the Revenant. Um, 
pretty difficult to remove for Magpie's deck as he only really has that Giga Scorpion decoction uh, as a removal tool. Darren coming down here on range row, putting Crow Mother into the graveyard. And that means every time an alchemy card is going to be played, we will see Crow Mother pop right back up uh, onto the board for Magpie. So we saw Redanian, uh, Flying Redanian in Syndicate, and now we're going to see Crow Mother for Skellige. I think that's really fun. It, uh, it's cards that we haven't really seen in a while, I think. For for these factions, yeah, definitely. I I actually really really enjoy Crow Mother and her mechanics. So it's nice to see a card like that get a buff in the uh, in Gwenfinity from the Balance Council. Absolutely. Now Bukowski does have the Muta Generator as well, pressing the Order ability from Temple of Militula to tutor out a card that then gets boosted by the size of your hand. Uh, and say is typically the card that you would choose. Interesting. But we are going to have to see. It is an 18-point War Elephant instead. Unconventional choice, perhaps. But uh, yeah, let's see what Bukowski is planning with that. Yeah, um, normally you want to double the value of your duel with the Onseus, but instead Bukowski actually just slamming the War Elephant early in the round, maybe thinking, uh, taking a little bit of a different approach than your normal game line in this matchup, thinking that he needs the points to help win round one for him. And War Elephant has cooldown six, so it, it's gonna survive in this matchup and it might be able to be even clicked twice. It might be, and that is the thing with this Skellige deck and all those alchemies. It has so many points when it plays the Gedineth, when it plays alchemies and has those infusions from Ale of the Ancestors. So I do think that Bukowski might want to uh, push the deck a little bit to get some of those vital pieces out later. Um, and that's why Bukowski really is valuing the point slam here instead of uh, setting up the regular Muta Generator carryover that you, you would regularly see. Yeah. Yeah, the trade-off here is that you, it's been it's been three turns. You still haven't played your meter generator. Uh, you're not really getting all that carryover that you normally would be getting at this point. Bukowski taking a leader, spawning that volunteer soldier that gets half of the crew tag for Rad uh, for uh, War Elephant and Radovid coming down, uh, pr providing the second half of the crew tag. And when War Elephant is crewed, it just boosts himself by eight straight up. No downside, no damaging adjacent units. 22 point Foglet, 26 <laughs> point War Elephant. We're off to a good start today, everyone watching. This is really exciting. We're already seeing kind of unconventional lines being played yeah, I here. I love it. Yeah, it's, I'm so excited for the series. Um, but yeah, let's see how this round one turns out. The fight clearly is going to be quite intense. First um, Froth coming down here from Magpie, boosting all of these uh, three adjacent units going into the graveyard. Uh, and, and we can also see that Crow Clan Druid in Magpie's hand can be utilized to remove the Crow tokens and replaying a Bronze Alchemy card from your deck. And that would happen to be the, the Froth that was just put in there. Yeah, exactly. And you can see how good um, the passive from Battle Trance is healing the Darren up as Magpie is playing alchemy cards. The Darren damages itself down to five, but he's probably going to end up at full power, at eight power uh, by the end of this round. Yeah, nice passive points here for Magpie. Now, Bukowski, on the other hand, is going to have to see... I mean, it will be cool to see how greedy this Northern Realm still is can also be, just because we know that for Magpie, only the uh, Giga Scorpion decoction is really the only card that interacts with your opponent's board at all. And currently, Bukowski is just holding on to that right of it. It hasn't yeah. pressed that leader charge uh, anymore. Could this be a bait? Maybe. Like, is Bukowski <laughs> trying to bait Magpie into killing this uh, Radovid with the Giga Scorpion decoction and saying that once you use this, I can really leverage the Raven and Kimbolt that my temple created later and get a ton of engine value with him. I, that would be really amazing to see. But yeah, that might be a tactic. That might be a tactic. Now, um, and I, I'm still, like, I can't believe the Muta Generator still has not come down. Does Bukowski not even plan on playing it in this round now? Well, at this point, it would be a little bit too late because you've sacrificed a lot of value and there's not really cards you have in your hand that you can play out to boost anything. Perhaps you'll play a melee for a little bit of provision value, but currently the board sits at a lot of different provisions, so playing yeah. your Muta Generator melee does not seen a great either. Magpie here taking the pass and giving the round to Bukowski. Okay, interesting. 
No Krauklan preacher set up yet for Magpie did not find them through portal. They could have been found through portal. Currently, we do see the double uh, Skellige Bear Witcher, though they're at four provisions. All right, Bukowski plays the Iris Companions, discards the Iris, uses the Iris Companions to tutor, to bring the Shoop into hand, which is something that Pincer Maneuver cannot do because Pincer Maneuver can only get uh, Northern Realms cards. Uh, it's another really good upside for uh, Iris Companions uh, as a card. And Bukowski will have to use an extra leader charge here, just um, getting a little bit of carryover value on this Traveling Priestess to get that two extra points from the Volunteers and yet again to stay ahead and uh, um, not have to go two cards down here. And we're gonna see if Bukowski decides to push round two or not. Normally, you know, Alchemy has a really, really strong long round with all of its engines. Bukowski does have some removal here with, you know, Philippa and Shoop potentially being able to remove the scenario. So I, I'm curious to see what Bukowski wants to do, especially because he still has this Muta Generator and Muta Generator wants a long round as well. And I am also very curious to see how Magpie actually plans to stick these engines on the board now. Shoop can offer a way to deal with these. We have, we saw the Philippa create that currently was tutored by Bukowski also in his hand currently can remove some of these engine threats. Erland currently seems to be going back. Yeah. And uh, Rune Mage as well could potentially help you create something useful and say is instead is tutored. I feel like Bukowski is ready to deal with some engines right now. A Muta Generator coming down first. And Magpie on the other hand perhaps can utilize this Ale of the Ancestors to, to buff up something, but will anything stick just yet on the board? Uh, of course, the Crow Mother Alchemy Tag is out and it's beautiful. That's there it such is. a cool interaction. You played uh, an artifact that has an Alchemy Tag, it brings out the Crow Mother, and you immediately get a buff target on an empty board. And as you mentioned, resilience tag. So this Ale of the Ancestors is sure going to get its monies or provisions worth rather, as it will be going on to the next round as well. And Muta Generator action happening here in round two from Bukowski. Yeah, and this is actually pretty powerful from Bukowski. Uh, now he gets to control how long this round is. Normally, a Muta Generator in round one, you can greet for it and try to play it as early as possible, but your opponent always has the option of passing uh, and you might not have, get enough turns with that meter generator. Uh, Bukowski's patience in round one may have ended up getting him uh, more carryover than it would have in round one. And first, Crow Clan uh, Preacher is on the board. Of course, bonded ability card, so we'll really be happy if multiple of them survive on the board and those alchemy cards will be played then uh, to utilize the bonded effect to its fullest, not to mention all of those infusions coming down from Ale, but will it get dealt with? If it isn't locked and put into graveyard, that enables the Freya as well, so perhaps a lock is really what you're looking for. And we do see Nilfgaard runestone coming down here, but doesn't find a lock. That's a little bit unfortunate. A lock is pretty risky to take against this deck, uh, alchemy deck, the actually, a because yeah, because of Mahakam Ale is an unlock and an alchemy card at the same time. Bukowski ends up uh, going with the Tucson Knight Errant, getting an extra uh, two points of damage on that Crow Mother. Uh, I'm surprised to see, like, I guess Bukowski was trying to roll for an answer uh, with the Rune Mage, but Philippa would have cleaned that up very well. Uh, last turn and now that opportunity is kind of gone because the bonded the second one comes down the bonded tag is in effect and with the truffle order both of these preachers are immediately at eight now and you've kind of missed your window of opportunity for that philippa to guarantee to kill one that's absolutely right really beautiful turn coming down here uh, for both of these clan uh, preachers looking way more difficult to remove but Enseus is coming down to finish the job here and uh, yeah good point about the ale i almost forgot there it's such a good card at four provisions now that I even forget it has that passive effect of unlocking something. It's not a, just a tech card for a unlock that you have in your deck, but it's rather just a value card here. But hey, that means that uh, your Crow Clan Preachers really can't be locked either if you have access to your ales, which is absolutely fantastic addition for this alchemy. Deck. Yeah, and exactly. And Bukowski's uh, Northern Realms deck is actually playing two locks in Margarita and Dorigary in its deck, but those aren't really going to find value because Magpie even has like the option to play more Mahakam Ales with the Crow Clan uh, Druid that you know can can replay a four provision alchemy from his graveyard. 
And Axel, of course, can put those crow tokens on the board as well whenever he is played on the melee row, I believe, and um, can create some of that synergy if you're looking for tokens. Currently, no need for that yet, but here is oh. Shoop. And what is Shoop going to be doing? Room Mage, of course, was played, so now Bukowski gets to see all of the options here. And it looks like we went for the... Destroy an artifact. I wonder yep. if... I wonder if that was the one that he was actually going for. But they're both resilient into round three. I think the ale of the ancestor actually maybe gets more value over time. Yeah, there was a slight rope there, so yeah. perhaps he just had to act fast and say, fine, I'm getting rid of anything at this point uh, that's good enough. But yeah, still good value uh, for removing that artifact. 27 point Crow Mother right now on the board because of that infusion yeah. uh, put on by Ale of the Ancestors. You can look at how many infusions there are. As mentioned, the Ale of uh, Ancestors can stack on just one unit and uh, no tall punish here. So that Crow, crow Mother is really, she's right. flying to the skies. If you hover over the Crow Mother, you can see she's got three of these Ale infusions. So every time a Golden Frother Muhammad Hale is played on her, she's getting six extra points. All right, and here is the Axel setting up a nice wide row for Magpie to utilize. And uh, Decoction currently not really having a target yet. Uh, looking at Bukowski's hand, there is the Rodea that can find uh, whatever it wants, but also the Philippa that was looking to get rid of an engine. Kind of nice to just use reactively on the other hand, so perhaps not the card that would be coming down anymore, especially now that those crow tokens are on the board, really diminishing potentially the value, oh. the random value of Philippa. Oh, Bukowski actually maybe taking a little bit of a detour from his original plan this round, because we saw him mulligan the Erland away in round two, but now seeing how this round has developed, decides to get the Erland back with his pincer maneuver and uh, play it in this round, threatening a ton of tempo uh, when he clicks it next turn. All right, now Magpie does have the Giga Scorpion decoction, which is not so committal to uh, go ahead and play. It is an alchemy card, so again, all of those Crow Mother infusions <laughs> would be ticking from that. Let's see how tall this Crow Mother can get. Um, but yeah, there is also an alchemy, of course, utilizable from the leader. It is a Mardrum. But yeah, it does decide to play the Giga Scorpion decoction and actually <laughs> chooses not the option of damaging something uh, that you target six times, maybe hoping that all of those pings would have randomly hit the Maybe, Erland. that would have been insane, but actually instead does, <laughs> doesn't hit him a single time. And you see the Erland with 48 points. This is the value that you get from all the carryover from the Iris Iris, as well as the Muted Generator. And this is uh, a tough spot to be in if you're Magpie because you only have one Freya's Blessing in the graveyard. Otkel's really only at half power or less here, being able to play just one Freya's Blessing instead of two. Uh, and not really many creatures in the graveyard either. Crowclan Druid's gonna come back. It's gonna banish a crow. And we've got another golden frock on this crow mother. Oh. Is he catching up? Yes, yes, look, there's a martyr still from the leader coming down now. And <laughs> once again, oh, not it's taking, quite but enough. not quite. It was very close though. It looked like it could have happened. Not quite though, as Magpie is being 2 0 there with that Erlen play, the last minute Erlen play, the last leader charge utilized by Bukowski to go and tutor it and say, okay, I'm going all in now. We have our first 2 0 of this weekend at World <laughs> Master Season 5. Well played by Bukowski, pivoting his strategy. Uh, and having it evolve as the round went on, as he got more and more information on what potentially was uh, in Magpie's hand, how strong of a round he had, and really, really nice to see that Erland um, given that 2-0 opportunity. Absolutely, we can see Northern Realms uh, Erland be quite flexible in utilizing this strategy to bleed something that really requires that bleeding and threaten uh, a really big Erland, of course. And it was exactly played that way uh, by Bukowski. And yeah, I mean, Magpie has to be really kind of hurting not having found those Crow Clan preachers early enough in round one and single Freya from the Otkel as it would prefer to have two of those in the grave but only one Freya found. 
Yeah, and that's really that game goes to show the flexibility of Pincer Maneuver. Pincer Maneuver uh, uh, at its core is only a four point leader with its original two charges, and uh, but it gives you so much flexibility in altering your game plan, getting rid of bricked cards, and going for that two zero when you sense there's blood in the water. Exactly, and it is now a very, very tight score as it is 1-1, the situation. Bukowski has one win in and so does Magpie. So yeah, right. like you said, epic showdown, here it is. And um, the coins will be flipped for the next game. Magpie now will be going on red coin again, Bukowski on blue coin. On the other hand, perhaps we're going to see some assimilate coming down from Bukowski. Um, and Magpie on the other hand, what may he respond with? I think he'll maybe take Priestesses on red. If he's uh, thinking that he wants to play Alchemy on blue, then that leaves Priestess as the uh, only other deck that would be the red coin that he has now. Uh, so maybe knowing that, Bukowski can try to find a, a matchup that, that would be a little bit more favorable for him, whether that's Enslave or um, Off the Books. We'll have to see, uh, but we know that Off the Books was attempted on blue coin in game number one, but uh, didn't really find that Serenity, which is really important for having that coin. Exactly, so we do see Nilfgaard being the choice for Bukowski here on blue coin. Now, Nilfgaard assimilate on blue coin is quite interesting in that um, it's quite, sometimes you might get overpowered a little bit too fast uh, because you want to ideally play Calvis, maybe a couple of these four provision bronzes and then move on to a round where you're fine with getting bled. You try to be resourceful and protect that uh, when getting bled in round two as Nilfgaard assimilate. However, um, that may not be the case when you're playing against uh, Skellige in which you really want to win the round and, and really want to be the one bleeding instead. So we might again see Bukowski play this out a little bit differently, perhaps utilizing that round one Taurus point slam as we mentioned uh, in the deck lists. Yeah, we can see Bukowski has drawn into the Taurus, but on the flip side, Magpie has drawn his best Taurus target in Axel uh, as well as the Crow Mother. Um, so. Bukowski isn't able to get these key gold cards to copy from the Taurus. We'll have to settle for a couple of bronzes if he does play the first form. Yeah, we're going to have to see how that plays out. Um, Actually, that's I think that's well, what we see happening right now from Bukowski. Having to choose from Preachers, Dwim Viandras, Bear Witcher Adepts, uh, Crow Clan Druid, none of these are really that good. Yeah. For Nilfgaard, because like even if you take Preachers and you're able to copy a couple of Preacher engines on your side, how many Alchemy cards can you really play as Nilfgaard? That is a good point, for sure. I think also you have to utilize that leader charge really well in this matchup. You might be tempted and uh, leadering some, some carryover card later, but I think you have to really focus on these Crow Clan Preachers, for example, but that would allow you to get another one, perhaps? Um, later on, so we're going to see how that leader charge is going to be utilized as well. But a lot of points here for Magpie to catch up and finds the Bear Witcher uh, again here from the portal rather than a uh, something else. Yeah, and Bukowski actually elected, if you look into his deck with the Grunt Observer, he elected to take two Bear Witchers as well as a Crow Clan Druid. So actually zero Preachers, maybe going for a, a different idea here uh, with this Taurus, or maybe just not caring what he gets. As they're all four provisions, he just wants the points. Yep, exactly. Again, winning round one is really important, and the taller your Taurus is, the more likely uh, that uh, will be. But here comes Bruhurt with the Magni, drawing into Ku. It's interesting, utilizing this Magni before having played um, Calvit. Yeah, maybe he doesn't want the Terra Nova right now because the, none of the targets that Taurus puts spying on are very good for Terra Nova. You'd rather save the Terra Nova for later when you're after you've been able to put spying with a, a Mage Torture onto something like an Axel or a Crow Mother. That's right, you do want a very playable hand uh, here in round one. Now, Magpie also has a Darren, but we also see that Crow Mother from hand. So I guess we are going to have to see Crow Mother be played out as well from Magpie. Darren choosing to put the Crow Clan Druid into the graveyard, perhaps making that next 
portal pool a little bit more likely to hit a preacher. That's true, and it also gives um, like a Freya target later because you're going to be playing optimally four Freya blessings, so you're going to need diff a lot of different bronze resurrection targets in your graveyard. And now here is the Crow Clan or Crow Mother being played, uh, and then. We are. We have those tokens as well for the Kuro Clan Druid that can be utilized to resurrect an alchemy card. We see Ale, we see Truffle. Those are going to be coming down eventually from Mad Pie as well. Bukowski here taking the pass after that massive lead, saying, okay, I'm done here for now, I've done what I wanted to do. Yeah, Taurus really the MVP for Bukowski's Nilfgaard deck in round one, uh, giving him such good tempo to get out of uh, the round without suffering card advantage, even against a pretty well, um, pretty fast play by Magpie with the portal getting uh, these double Bear Witcher atoms too. So Bukowski survives round one. Uh, Magpie's gonna go multiple cards down and probably just look for a long round three. Now, who do you think is maybe favored in a long round three between these two decks? It's a little bit difficult to say, but I'm scared of the alchemy personally, just having so, so, so many points together with those infusions. And um, I'm going to give the edge to alchemy, I think, in the longer round. But Nilfgaard has a few tricks up its sleeve. It has the enslaved leader, it has the skeleton, and um, yeah, it has some crates as well. Doesn't Nilfgaard always have a few tricks up his sleeve? Yeah, exactly. And it also <laughs> has, uh, False Siri can be a big threat in the long round as well, uh, if Magpie's not able to deal with her. Now Magpie gets the Ale of the Ancestors, one of the resilient artifacts, onto the board with his quote unquote free card in round two. Because <laughs> yeah. he started the round with eight cards in hand and you can kind of play down to seven without any risk of losing card advantage because you will draw back up to the maximum hand size of 10 at the start of round three. That's right. And uh, of course, get in it. Something Magpie would like to have there in round three, as well as the uh, perfect graveyard, as well as as many engines as possible. I think four Crow Clan creatures is what we might be seeing from Magpie in one round, or what can be expected. Uh, Nausicaa Sergeant, a nice bronze card to utilize here with Magpie having taken the win in round one, because he's preparing exactly for what is about to happen, which is that long round three. And uh, yeah, Bukowski, ideal hands now, thanks to that uh, Calvite, is going to have to really uh, work out what to remove and what to steal and what to create. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see if Nilfgaard can really make it here in a long round three. Now, Shinbri, do you have any predictions? What do you think in terms of uh, alchemy or Nilfgaard assimilate? Is yeah. it going to be a bit of an uphill battle for Nilfgaard? I feel like I, I agree with you that I think that um, Alchemy should have a little bit of an upper hand here because Nilfgaard, it, they only have one Tall Punish in the Vilgaforts. There's going to be upwards of like four Crow Clan Preachers that you're going to have to deal with. And if you kill them early with damage, say like from a Stefan Skellen, that just gives Magpie the opportunity to resurrect them again. Right? Yeah. So maybe you can get rid of one with Enslave, which doesn't put it into the graveyard. That could be a, a key interaction here. But Magpie also has different ways of protecting his preachers on the same turn that he plays them with that Ale of the Ancestors, with his uh, Battle Trance Leader, as well as maybe um, a, a Mushy Truffle Order click as well. Yep, that's a very good point, but the long round is what we are looking for uh, or looking at currently. Um, Resilience there on the Ale of the Ancestors, Truffle also yet to be played, and getting it. Now, what do you think about the row cap potential that could be happening for Skellig? I think that's definitely something reasonable. Here we see Brothens coming out, uh, creating a spy. We see Axel in Magpie's hand. That's we see Gedinath. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of these tokens on the board, and perhaps Bukowski saying, that's what I'm going to utilize here in that long round, uh, but perhaps those alchemy cards are just enough by themselves, but we really were going to have to see. I do not know what the end result of this is going to be, and it's so exciting to watch. I think you're really onto something about the concept of row capping for Magpie's Alchemy, and I think that's what Bukowski is thinking as well. He's kept all of his spies in his hand. He has, uh, he kept an emissary, a 4P card that usually you don't really want to play as uh, as enslaved, knowing that you, you know, you probably have uh, better cards to potentially draw into. So the, the, 
the problem for Magpie is going to be filling up his board. Maybe he doesn't even play the Axel front row. Maybe he even just plays Axel back row. Could we see that? We and could Giving see up that. the alchemy activation, but saving potentially three spaces on his board. That could be a first, <laughs> for sure. Uh, seeing a range row Axel, and, uh, but yeah, I, I think you're right. There's the informant as well in hand. There is a create with our taunt. Here comes a Crow Clan Preacher on Bukowski's side of the board now. And yet another spy on Mag Magpie's side. He has, uh, I'm counting, 13 spaces left uh, and nine cards in hand. And so many of his cards activate multiple, uh, need multiple spaces to work. Otkel needs three spaces. Uh, Mushy Truffle needs at least two. And um, this scenario is still spawning another three crows. Yeah, well. exactly. That is kind of inevitable as well with all those druid tags going around. But here comes the Giga Scorpion decoction, probably removing that Vigo uh, and a simulate <laughs> engine that of course is going to be quite back. And here, Crow Mother yes. as well, taking up a space on the board. Yes, five points is nice, but if it prevents you from playing an extra card from your hand, that's going to be worth way more than five points. Oh, absolutely. Now, the Ale of the Ancestors is ticking still, putting on these infusions as we go. So that's kind of a, a slot on the board that is still generating value, which is quite nice. Uh, but yeah, again, crow tokens, emissaries, and yeah, Duchess's informants. There can still be two of those. And um, plus these creates. If, if Magpie isn't able to play out what he wants to here in this round, then uh, Bukowski might really be able to, to have enough with the Skellige creates uh, that would be supporting this sort of SK alchemy archetype. Yeah, and Magpie has to be careful about how greedy he gets with these Ale of the Ancestor infusions because there is still that tall punish from the Vilgaforts. Might want to spread out these infusions a little bit. Um, here we see the spying put on the Crow Mother. Maybe that, that ends up being the target for the Terra Nova. Here, uh, we've triggered the first chapter of the scenario. We see the crows go on the back row. So this is probably what Magpie's thinking, uh, trying to get range row value from transforming some of those crows with the Axel. Yep, that might be the case here. Um, but yeah, Truffle, of course, does have that froth on the order ability, but taking up a little bit of space. And now, Skellen is coming down on the board. And uh, I don't know, Bukowski could go ahead and now leader that Crow Clan Druid and utilize the infusion that was put on it even better. So didn't instantly deal with it, but perhaps now it's a little bit more tempting as it does have the infusion. So Magpie in terms of stacking infusion, as we saw in the Crow Mother, uh, potentially could not have done something like that because there is that enslave uh, leader, which perhaps is something we see soon. But Buk Bukowski seems to be uh, really thinking about where these next two charges will be placed. Here is the enslave, removes the bonded that was currently on Magpie's side of the board and the bonded uh, preacher is now on Bukowski's side of the board. Yeah, I wonder what the thought process was hitting the other preacher because that would have been uh, the tallest unit and that would have been delete, uh, destroyed by Vilgaforts. So there may be a, something else at play here. Bukowski thinking maybe he could find another removal from False Siri, perhaps? No, I don't see anything in the graveyard that he could use. No, but did not want to spend them on a Crow Mother either, or to remove any other uh, units, but of course, you don't want to remove anything if you're planning on clogging. Right. Um, but I still think one of those could have gone on Crow Mother. All right, so Magpie, over half his board filled already, <laughs> still has six turns left. Um, does play another Crow Clan Preacher. You've got the two Freyas still in hand, and Otkel having to play two more. These, uh, these bronze targets in the graveyard are kind of underwhelming especially when the Crow Mother, uh, or sorry, the Crow Clan Druids have to play, hopefully not another Crow's Eye Rhizome. <laughs> yeah, hopefully not. Of course, Ermion can still tutor a Alchemy card there from the deck, uh, and there is a Mardrum that you play with Leader, but that Ermion also might want to come down before that range row is completely blocked, mm -hmm. if there is something that you're looking for there. And Truffle, then, order ability, of course, has the 
a frock on it as well. But here is a bear witcher. There's one of the reses from the Freya's Blessing and a uh, little bit of a danger spot for Magpie. Bukowski, you, you, did you notice where Bukowski slotted his emissary? In between two of the crows on the range row. And he has two more spies. He could maybe uh, now take the position between the other two crows to block that transformation from the axle, but he actually doesn't. I th really thought he, that was what he was going for. Maybe just got distracted with something else. So Magpie has a chance to still play his uh, axle for full value right now onto the range row without um, losing some of that transform points. Yep, we might be seeing that come down. But then there would be eight cards on um, Magpie's ranged row, and we do still see a spy in Bukowski's uh, hand, which is Siri. So that might also be played, kind of blocking that Ermion off a little bit. Or Dwim, which probably also wants to go ranged row because of the, the truffle press. So um, the range row axle is also, it's a little bit of, um, yeah, a lot of cards want to go ranged row right now, but uh, they can't all fit. Let's put it that way. Yeah, Dwim has the option of going front uh, melee row to activate, to r reset the scenario to chapter two, so that when he does play another druid, you'll get another Mardrome in uh, use out of that. That could give some flexibility to which row that the uh, the getting it, or the Dwim Viandra needs to be played in. Uh, it is Bukowski's turn. We're getting down to the end of this round. Um, False Siri here is the option from Bukowski. This is the last turn, I think, if you to, to play a Buhurt on this False Siri. Now this False Siri will come back to Bukowski on the final turn of Magpie. This is why Bukowski waited so long to play this False Siri, which normally is an engine that gets one point per turn, but this timing will put the, uh, will clog Magpie's board all the way until the very last turn, and he won't be able to play his last card uh, because the false series won't come back to Bukowski's side until after Magpie passes. Yeah, things are looking a little bit sticky for the Ermion and as well the Axel there in case it wanted to go range throw as well as the false series now is sandwiched in between these two crow tokens as well. And here we go, uh, Vilgefort is going to hit the tallest unit. Ideally, our Todd can still create something and coup exists. Couple of options there for Ku, but Otkel here, ranged row locked as well. Oh, no, no. <laughs> has to come down because uh, the Otkel is just the most valuable card that can be put to the ranged row. And Bukowski's long round strategy might be working out here. Yeah, and we see already the first card burned. For the board completely full for Magpie. Uh, Bear Witcher Abdev not getting played here and going straight to the graveyard. Good news for Magpie is he does have these two Crow Clan Druids that can uh, make space on his board by banishing some of these crows on the range row. Exactly. Okay, and Siri continuing to tick here. Bear Witcher full health. Now it is Bukowski's turn. Goes ahead and plays out the R Todd. That's right, and we will see a Crow Mother for uh, a modest Terra Nova. Not the best that you can see in this matchup, I think, but Bukowski, you know, with a narrow lead here and Magpie really, really struggling with space. That's right. Can you check for me? Did Bukowski actually at any point create a alchemy card that would perhaps be in the graveyard? Uh, there currently? is no, not. There is not. So, um, because now with those Crow tokens, otherwise you might even be able to self Crow Clan Druid uh, later on if you wanted to copy it, for example. But there are other targets. There's another Crow Mother that this coup can hit. And uh, here comes the Duem, and it does go range throw, resetting that order for the Truffle, but has to wait one more turn before the order ability is reactivated as that token got destroyed by the Crow Clan Druid. Uh, fairly close in terms of point gap, big removal still here for Velgefort, but Magpie has an alchemy card with the leader, has an alchemy card with the Ermion, I believe, as well. So If he um, has space to play it, that exactly, is. Exactly, but one order ability left on this Crow Clan Druid, so at least one more card we're going to be seeing there on the range throw. Yeah, Magpie deciding what he wants to do here. A lot of different options for him, honestly. He's going to use the Golden Froth to actually preemptively activate the False Siri, giving up maybe like four points, but l making an extra space for himself earlier in the round before the round ends. That's a really cool move. 
that is really cool to see. And look at this token that used to be two points of power now sitting there at 23 as Ermion finally coming down there on the range stroll <laughs> and tutoring out an alchemy card, boosting all of these infusions and the double crow clan preacher as well. Vilgefortz has made his last turn, but Magpie still has this Axel and Mardrum to be played out. Vilgefortz destroys a 31 point crow, but it is not enough. Uh, good effort by Bukowski here, going for this long round board clog strategy, but Alchemy prevails just having too many points and really creative ways for Magpie to clean up space for his own board, holding those Crow Clan Druids uh, order ability, two of them, to clean up, to, to make two spaces, as well as just giving some extra points to this false Siri to proc her, to send her back over to the Nilfgaard uh, side where she belongs. Exactly. No, that was really fun to see. Very interesting strategy coming down here. Uh, as we said, we were a little bit scared about Skellige in the long round can be really, really powerful. Nilfgaard, on the other hand, yeah, tried some Nilfgaard shenanigans for sure, but it looks like the rogue log just wasn't quite enough with the replayed Crow Clan Druids. Uh, even though there were no creatures in that graveyard, Magpie really beautifully did uh, counteract the Nilfgaard strategy. Uh, by utilizing a little bit of self-burn there. Damn, that was my favorite game yet. I, I thought really, game. really uh, creative strategies and good attempts and well played by both sides. Uh, can't wait to see what else this weekend has in store for us, Seely. But now Magpie takes a lead in this first quarterfinals, two to one over Bukowski. He's got one left, one deck left to win with. That is the Priestess uh, Pincer Maneuver deck. Devotion with Siege as well. Really cool deck as well. And Can't wait to see it in action. Yeah, exactly, and we will be seeing it from Blue Coin now, uh, of course, as opposed to the more smorky version of it, which would be Red Coin. Um, Bukowski, on the other hand, of course, really, really will be valuing round control in this matchup against the, the Priestesses. So we'll be playing uh, whatever he thinks can can deal with that best and, and enable round control. No, you, you make a really good point. Uh, pretty much uh, every time priest, every time you play against Priestesses, you're hoping to take control of the rounds, win round one, and then either go for a long round three where you have better engine value than them, or go for like a hard round two push where they're maybe forced to play their Vernon Roach prematurely when their deck isn't thinned enough and you're, they're not sure if they're going to get that priestess onager combo, priestess chardom combo, and maybe they also haven't had enough chances to shuffle those priestesses and get that many charges on them quite yet. But um, I feel like it's such an uphill battle to defeat priestesses when they're able to control the rounds and they're able to set up all this carryover and the perfect hyper thin for that round three situation. No, I agree with you. It will be really tough because the list has a lot of power, but if you can bleed out the priestess combo, you're quite happy now. Can Nilfgaard Assimilate do that. We are going to have to see because uh, Assimilate here on Red Coin versus Magpie's Blue Coin double priest is here in hand can immediately be mulliganed away for some nice points. Uh, yeah, but Magpie actually has too many things he wants to mulligan because he also has the Huber as well as the Redanian Secret Service in his hand that he wants to get rid of too. Now, luckily, you do have your pincer charges to the rescue. Ideally, we might want to uh, boost those priestesses later, but those can be used as well to clean up the hand a little bit. Bukowski, on the other hand, uh, does have that assimilate leader, something that Magpie needs to be a little bit careful of, but a, a pretty, pretty bronze-heavy hand here. I'm wondering uh, if, if this bronze hand really is enough to gain around control over Magpie's siege list. Yeah, that's true. Um, it's gonna be a pretty tough uh, round one for Bukowski here as uh, Nilfgaard and Slave has traditionally no answers to this Muta generator uh, that Magpie has opened with. Uh, so if Bukowski does try to fight for this round, Magpie could be accumulating a, a lot, like 35-ish points of carryover or something uh, crazy in, in, um, in a future round with this Muta generator. Yeah, exactly. Very good point there. Perhaps Bukowski is looking to play out this Galvit and then see what happens later. We saw Bukowski felt comfortable enough to play a long round against um, priestesses, but but with a siege that is very scary in terms of your assimilate engine actually being able to stick on the board. And uh, yeah, one out of the way, Onager currently. 
uh, has been played from Magpie's side of the board. Another one left in deck for now. And no Siege Masters yet and no Amphibious Assault yet. Yeah, Magpie definitely has to... Um, yeah, use some of these later charges to, to clean up the hand, really. It's actually maybe a good thing that no Siege Master's in hand, because looking at the deck right now for Magpie, there's actually exactly five, or no, maybe six, five provision cards in his deck. So he's barely got enough five provision cards in there to receive all the buffs from the Muta Generator. All right, so Muta Generator giving more to Magpie in that case. Now, you know what I really like that just happened? Bukowski playing that Magni, tutoring out the Taurus as well into the hand, which again is something that can be really nicely utilized in round one to catch up in terms of points. And that was not found by Bukowski earlier, but through this Magni uh, that was drawn into, of course, because Calbeat was played and set it up to be at the top. Yeah, exactly. That's why he has that one copy of Magnum Division in the deck. It's for this purpose. Um, now, what does he want to copy with the Taurus is the question. He has uh, a lot of different options here. You can take uh, a Hubert if you think you can get enough order clicks yourself. Uh, you could take an Istrid or a Margarita to lock, you know, to lock your, one of your opponent's engines. That could be huge. Or just maybe like a reinforced ballista for, uh, for, for an engine of your own. You know what card is going to be really big in this matchup as well? It's the Vilgefords, especially with the Thaler. I don't think you can press Thaler, right? Because then the Vilgefords can come down and swoop down one of your priestesses later on when the deck is perfectly thin. You have to be really careful with what you, how much you actually thin uh, with this Northern Realms list when you're dealing with Vilgefords. So Vilgefords is a card that Bukowski, I think, wants to really hold on to here in this matchup and, and decide when to time. That's true. Magpie has to like hold the Thaler. He can't prematurely commit which way he's going to go with Taller. And Magpie actually gets the Radovid Judgment out of his deck in round one, getting him extra tempo and thinning, uh, but at the cost of maybe a couple of points on his order. That's right, and takes the pass here, doesn't get another leader charge from the Radovid, uh, and does not press the order on the Judgment. There's uh, double Radovid power. Yeah, you know, you know what's interesting? Bukowski actually also copied Radovid Judgment as his, I, I guess his uh, Nilfgaard deck is actually a devotion deck of his own, so he can use the Radovid Judgment as well. That is a really, really fun point. Um, but yeah, we did see the Radovid Judgment there peek out of Bukowski's hand and it does go right back in there. So we're gonna have to see, we get to see Radovid action on both sides, which is honestly, that's really fun. <laughs> All right, and so Magpie is gonna do what most Siege players do after winning round one, jam the Siege, take control of the board and threaten to wipe your opponent's side. But now, Shinmarie, you would probably want to have those Siege Masters in hand, though. And they are not here. You are playing a lot of Siege Engines, so you'd be looking to thin those out quite nicely. Uh, but currently, there is no access to them. One leader charge left, of course. That is very true. There's only one leader charge left, and this is a partly a result of Bukowski's well-timed pass, where uh, Magpie wasn't able to click his Radovid to get an extra leader charge. And yeah, both both Siege Masters still stuck in deck. This this and and the uh, Amphibious Assault also still in the deck. Istrid too, a key card here. Magpie could be in trouble if he doesn't find all of his thinning. Then the Vernon Roach is going to be uh, inconsistent. Yeah, I'm trying to think about where this uh, leader charge from Bukowski is, where 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 that would go uh, and fall down on. Perhaps uh, Eastred would be like a nice card to to kind of even bait it out on, because I don't know if you do want to take your leader charge on that, but rather like a siege engine of some sort, uh, or yeah. But but here comes Siri for now. We're gonna have to see what um, Bukowski is going to use that leader charge on, replaying that joust for engine removal because this third chapter of the siege scenario does benefit from having more siege engines on the board. If you can remove them, the better. And now this uh, range row Carabalista does not get to utilize that order just yet. Yeah, exactly. And you don't, as Magpie, you can't play another siege engine here. Otherwise, you're going to waste that uh, bombardment that comes from the scenario. So it kind of forces Magpie to play an early 
Griffin Witcher, uh, so he doesn't want to take the Griffin Witcher mentor as it doesn't have, even have adrenaline yet. Exactly. The adrenaline tag makes things a little bit tricky for Magpie here. Normally, you would see that Care Saren hit the Griffin Witcher mentor instead, but I mean, another engine threat is definitely not so bad to have on the board. As we can see, Bukowski is being quite resourceful here. None of these big golds have come out yet, and they sure won't until they really, really have to. Um, yeah, there is Skellen, of course, that has a little bit of uh, removal, but ideally you want to play Skellen to trigger some of the assimilate engines that you would have set up on the board yet. So that would feel maybe a little bit too sad uh, playing out a Skellen super early, but it does have some removal value. We're going to have to see how Bukowski continues. It seems like uh, Bukowski wants to keep a fairly uninteractive board right now into the siege because as we saw, it's so awkward. This Karasaren is also telling that things are right now quite awkward for Magpie. But here is a torturer putting spying onto this Karabalista. Yeah, Bukowski seemed like he was in a tough position there, really roping all the way until the end of, uh, before playing this Mage Torturer. You don't love to see, you know, you don't love to sacrifice your Mage Torturer to this Bombardment. and you know that's going to kill her immediately. You want to get engine value out of her, and you're not cop you're not putting spying on something amazing when it's just the Carol Ballista. But with this card having been, been played, the Siege Tower, uh, this enables the Adrenaline on the Witcher Mentor. So that is now something that Magpie can utilize, uh, which, which makes things a little bit less awkward now, but had to wait a while for the Adrenaline. Bukowski needs to make another choice here. What is going to be played out first? Looks like we're at a point where some of these gold cards are looking a little bit more likely to come down. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But there's also, what is it, three damage at least coming from Magpie with the Griffin Witcher as well as the Carol Ballista. You might see that combined with like an Onager and you might be threatening like five damage and Bukowski's engines uh, could have an issue sticking here. He's going to go with the Brothens into Duchess Informant copying a Carol Ballista of his own. So a couple of threats for Bukowski now, catching up a bit. And uh, if this round does drag on, this false Siri will eventually come back over if no damage is, uh, goes, to goes on her. Yeah, but it takes its time as of course the Joust was being replayed instead of the classic Boo Hoot mm -hmm. that Siri usually likes to utilize, or false Siri rather. Um, but yeah, here, it's starting to chip away at this Carabalista on the range draw uh, is what Magpie is doing here and also a locking the Brothens, one assimilate engine down, really nice utilization of the Margarita lock and also not too committal. Now we see Hubert there at one uh, charge so does come, come out here as well. Um, not a card that Magpie then would draw into later, so nice to have it out and then at this point. But the Siege Masters, Shinra, you really have to make sure you reserve a Siege card in your hand so that you are able to play them out in round three and you, you really want to draw them. But you also want to play your Amphibious Assault now. Uh, that leader charge, the last leader charge becomes very, very vital for Magpie here. Yeah, and um, your priestesses aren't very shuffled so far. Both priestesses in Magpie's deck only at three charges at the moment, so you'd really love to use your pincer maneuver on one of those as well. Exactly. So it's a little bit overloaded here, <laughs> as Magpie only uh, wants to do like five things with this one leader charge. <laughs> exactly. We're going to have to see what will be prioritized. Uh, definitely, I think the players are going to take their time because these are some tough decisions, but this is usually also when we kind of make the decisions that make or break the game. Uh, so really important now for the players really to focus. But here we see okay. a mentor and a priestess is drawn uh, from Magpie, uh, which is, um, yeah. Yeah, those are two good cards Very to get, nice. right? Uh, he does, Magpie does put back the Onager, so he puts back the only siege engine that he has in hand that can play, that can like thin this Siege Master. Uh, maybe an indication that he may be getting ready to pass soon. Yeah, that's right. Siri is ticking, so that is something Magpie has to take into account as well. No more Siege and not that many engines either uh, that are getting more value. 
and um, ideally you would have a bit of a tempo gap to Bukowski so that Bukowski would be forced to play something a little bit more valuable than like an emissary and a diplomacy here. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it is going to have to come down. But with this Siri s switching sides, things are a little bit easier potentially for well, Bukowski. But now it's still ticking and it will need to take its time. So this pass it's, from Magpie here is quite nice. It's really well timed because it's not quite fast enough for the false theory to come back to your side. When she does come back to your side, it's like a swing of 15, 16 points. Um, but if Bukowski just wants to play one card here, Siri will end up at seven. And that's not enough to trigger her uh, her grace eight. So, and Bukowski also has to be maybe a little bit worried that this Griffin Witcher might end up hitting the false theory with its uh, adrenaline three ability as it's random and you can't really control it. Yep, and here is the Diplomacy creates a little death blow uh, synergy here with the spies as well, and uh, actually decides to oh, leave the Siri and right away. That is a problem! Coming, and then. The false Siri yeah. went. Bukowski made a huge misplay there, taking the Enslaved Six on his own false Siri before her uh, grace triggered. So. When he passed, the false theory grew to eight for the first time on his side of the board, and Bukowski, maybe a miscalculation there, and this is a, what a way to end the series. What a way, I think Magpie here, as we look at the winner screen, Magpie is also maybe not feeling that great about, because when you win, you really want to like, feel like, yeah, that was a skill-based uh, game, but of course, it's really high-pressure situation, uh, and, it, and it's easy to make sort of fast decisions uh, that end up uh, perhaps backfiring on you, and unfortunately for Bukowski, that was a huge uh, swing that did not go Bukowski's way. Yeah, Magpie not looking particularly too happy about the way he ended up winning that. You're right. You want to win because you did something amazing, not because your opponent misplayed like that. But either way, a win is a win. Magpie will move on to the semifinals with a 3-1 victory over Bukowski. Exactly. Uh, Magpie has played very well and consistently throughout the series and we can't wait to hear what Magpie has to say as we'll let you hear from him. Perhaps he is keen on sharing some thoughts here as we roll it over to an interview with Magpie. Magpie, hello, how are you doing my friend? That was a uh, quite easy ending there. I don't feel like you're a bit too happy about that because it's always good to win when you know your opponent is doing well and not when they make a little misplay. Quite a big misplay because it's World Masters. What's up? Yeah, first I want to say that uh, he played uh, better than I expected until the very last play. <laughs> uh, but yeah, what can I say? But I think it's uh, that matchup I would still won. Yeah. Uh, you even, even if you didn't misplay, so yeah, it didn't really matter. Yeah, I really liked mm -hmm. uh, in the previous game your Nilf card uh, play with the full Siri actually making space on your board, which was already filled with units. Uh, that's some uh, high IQ gameplay. Um, but I feel like you were kind of a favorite in this in this matchup, at least in, in my divination challenge. How do you feel about that? Yeah. So as I said to Shinmiri before the before the games, it's uh, I'm favorite. I feel like. Uh, uh, my favorites was like 3-0, 3-1 in that in the series. Um, I feel like the second game uh, I could have played better, but yeah, uh, I need to see like from the both perspective. Yeah, yeah, makes total sense. So you're going to the semifinals. Uh, congratulations! Uh, you're moving on to day two. Um, I mean, for me. You've been part of Gwent for such a long time. I feel like is you, you're in your rightful place. Um, how do you feel about this being the last tournament? Because that's, that's that's kind of something important that I wanted to take from you, who I consider a Gwent veteran. I mean, something begins, something ends. Yeah. Uh, so it's not like uh, uh, Gwent is a game that will uh, last like a hundred years. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, every game has an end. Uh, so yeah, it's great to be a part of it, uh, to uh, to be a participant of the last tournament. Unfortunately, 
I wasn't able to come to Poland, uh, but I really wanted. Uh, but yeah, I still think that uh, we will have a chance to meet each other, like at some events. I hope so. I hope uh, so, because I haven't seen yeah, you in quite some time, but it would be nice to, to meet up uh, once again. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm like I'm a little bit sad, but it's OK. <laughs> Congratulations, man. You earned it. Um, it was awesome, awesome to watch it. Of, of course, uh, you always want to win against someone who is playing 100% and not making mistakes. But um, this is also stress. You know, this is uh, we're playing on the on the highest possible field. World Masters is the culmination of the whole season, and I like I said, you rightfully earned it. So congratulations, and we'll see you in day two. Yeah, thanks. Let's throw it over to Sh uh, not Shinmiri to uh, Specimen for the analysis. Yeah, thank you so much, Bojo, and really, really excited to be here. We've got so much to get through. We saw four games in that series. We're going to take a look at the key moments from each. Cast your mind all the back, way back to the first game. Bukowski is playing Syndicate, and Magpie is on the White Frost here. And Shinmiri asked the question, was Bukowski able to get out of round one? What ends up happening here is Bukowski ends up losing round one. On, on even cards and then in the final round on round three just lost by a couple of points Bukowski's objective in this first series is to control the board and starts off by doing a great job by poisoning this Nithra twice removing it from the board but at this moment Bukowski has six coins in the bank and does have a candle on the board is going to be able to spend with the candle without using any leader charges and what ends up happening is Magpie ends up playing as I fast forward a little bit more Ends up playing this Eridan, getting ahead by just a single point. Whereas if Bukowski was able to spend with the Conjurer's Candle, they would have ended up perhaps being able to get out of this round on even cards. And then of course the game could have ended very differently. But I also want to take a quick look at the final mulligan on game one for each of these players. Because it was a huge, huge moment. Both players... Well, certainly the Syndicate player, Bukowski, Mr. Keycard, we see the final mulligan, a really naff-looking hand for Magpie and a naff-looking hand as well for Bukowski, but the difference was the final mulligan. The Oberon finds its way into the hand of Magpie, and it's the fist tech for Bukowski, missing it out on the Madame. Bukowski also had Royal Decree in deck as well, so got very, very unlucky. And then on the other side, Magpie also had this Gels in hand as well. So uh, that was a really key moment. Magpie ended up taking that one. Um, but perhaps Bukowski in that round one could have done a bit better. And also, I think it's fair to say that Bukowski just got, uh, could have just got a little bit more lucky. Moving on to then game two. So Magpie started the series off 1-0. This was the game in which Bukowski was able to get a victory. And we see this round two push from Bukowski. It was the Mutagenerator versus the Ale of Ancestors. Both of these cards played for an obscene amount of points. But Bukowski just had this moment here a little bit later on where they decided things weren't quite going right. There was maybe a bit of a rope moment with the Shoop getting rid of the wrong artifact. But we just see this absolutely massive Erlen from Bukowski. They set, smelled the blood in the water. The Erlen played for 48 points and Magpie wasn't quite able to catch up. So the Muta Generator came out on top over the uh, Ale of Ancestors. And that one, that put the series at 1-1. Then moving on to game three. I was fascinated by the opening line from Bukowski because we see my favorite play in Gwent. It's the tempo pass. Bukowski does it uh, with Torres here, puts a bunch of points down on the board. It's a very common thing for players to do with Nilfgaard because Nilfgaard is historically very, very strong in the long round. So when, when you see a tempo pass like this, the, the Nilfgaard player has something in mind and we weren't quite sure what that was. But as it turned out, Bukowski's plan was to clog the board and make it really, really difficult for Magpie to be able to play anything. However, Magpie had a bunch of ways of still being able to remove cards from his side of the board. Uh, for example, we saw uh, Magpie buff up this false Siri here, putting it back on the side of Bukowski, and also these Crow uh, Clan Druids here, being able to remove the Crows to fit up even more space, and therefore Magpie was still able to come out on top, and Bukowski's tempo pass line therefore didn't work. But let's be honest, the moment that we've all been waiting for, what on earth happened? in this final game. I think as Magpie alluded to in their interview, they were in a really, really strong position anyway. 
But what a heartbreaking way for Bukowski to finish their professional Gwent career in Gwent Masters. Let's just take another quick look at this moment. The false theory with Grace 8. The first time it reaches 8 points, it's going to be switching sides. Bukowski decides to use the enslaved leader ability, I do believe. I've not even had the chance to watch this back just yet. I couldn't believe what I was watching. As we see, the diplomacy comes through from Bukowski. Not the most important decision in this one, but it's what happens after. As you can see, the rope is running down. We see the Griffin Witcher ping, uh, and then the leader charge comes through on the false theory. She grows twice, going back to Magpie's side of the board. I could not believe what I was watching. I think Magpie was in a great position anyway, but just a fascinating series. And I'm going to send you now back on over to the casters to show you an updated version of the bracket and I look forward to seeing you after the next series to break down some more Gwent gameplay. Wow, what a spine chilling moment from that last game. Uh, oh, crazy way to end it and we have Magpie moving on to the semi-finals 3-1 over Bukowski. Yeah, let's take a look as well at the prize pool now in terms of how these coins have been distributed. I mean, Magpie got the 3-1 result there as he had uh, kind of predicted, didn't he say that? Yeah, he said he thought he would win 3-1 or 3-0 in this matchup and he gets 75% uh, percent of the match stake for the quarterfinals. Uh, another $1,500 added to his starting uh, amount of 1,000. So Magpie's up to 2.5K and plenty of opportunity to earn much more tomorrow. That's right. And we do have a lot more very exciting nail biters, I'm sure. Series coming up later. But before we move on to our next series, which will be cast by the wonderful Ghost Arya and Lionheart. I heard a little bird told me that there is another surprise, right? Yeah, we have another special guest uh, for you guys. This one, I believe, is a former World Masters champion himself. So let's send it over uh, to Ryan or Berja to see who he, they Ryan have in store. Ryan is taking this one, yeah. Well, yes, hello everybody. I'm super excited because I am joined by World Masters Season 3 champion cybers aka spybee aka any other nicknames you wanna you wanna share xxx dark kevin xxxd there you go don't forget that one <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time and joining me here yeah, thanks for having me it's been a while since we've seen you online um and how does it feel then to finally be you know in contact and surrounded by so many gwen players and gwen community members now especially yeah. in the watch party how's the atmosphere in the watch party yeah, it's it's honestly awesome like there's so many people who are Obviously, have a lot of uh, Polish people, but also from Germany. Some people made it all the way from Portugal, Italy, and wow. even like America, which is crazy to me, having like 14-hour flights. It's uh, it's really nice to see everybody uh, one last time, or hopefully not one last time. But yeah, it's it's awesome. That's so cool to hear. Now, I wanted to get your uh, intel and a uh, little bit um, of your knowledge because you've been in this position before. You've yeah. won your series on Saturday, on day one, and then you had some time to prepare or rest for day two. So I know mm -hmm. every player is a bit different. Some don't want to spend too much time grinding. Uh, some players, you know, just look at the deck lists and just inhale all of the information they can get. How do you handle a situation like this where you have to be cool, calm and collective for day two, but also mm -hmm. maybe not too cool? Yeah, I mean, last time uh, for me, I played. I, I think I played the last game, mm. so I think I was just done afterwards and went to bed. But I could imagine that, especially today, it's Payabo is the last one. I, probably he's gonna jam until 4am <laughs> if he if he can uh, make it. And I would think that other people would just watch the games and maybe chill out a bit. But I also remember after my um, half final, I immediately during the interview with uh, with you or with Burja, I immediately texted my my teammates that we have to prep right now. So uh, yeah, it, it's kind of stressful, but I I can see people chill out a bit. It, it's a rough first day. Mm -hmm. Well, so thank thank you so much for that insight. Um, I think. I'm gonna let you go back to the watch party, but is there anything that you would like to share with the community before I let you go? Um, I mean, just just enjoy the show. It's honestly gonna be awesome. And um, yeah, sh shout out to... Oh. I do have one last question, actually. Okay. Just came to sure. me right now. 
Who's your divination winner? Who's going to take this whole tournament? I mean, I would love to say it's uh, Grabish. Oh, but, rip. But uh, unfortunately, <laughs> he, uh, yeah, we don't talk about that. Yeah, we Shout don't. out Grabish. Shout out Grabish. But yeah, I'm obviously rooting for my teammate Payabol. All right, there you have it. That's the knowledge that I could gain for you today. Thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, and uh, I'll make sure to meet you later in the watch party again. Looking forward to it. And now, before, uh, before we get to meet our lovely second pair of casters, we're going to be showing you the introduction videos to our next pair of players. After that, we, uh, we're going to show you the bracket. And then, then it's time for our second pair of casters. So take it away with the interview videos. Hello everyone, my name is Kabler, a green player from China, and now a senior student studying computer science. Uh, about a year ago, I was just a toxic NIF guard player who plays casually just for fun. Uh, but gradually I found it interesting to compete with top players. So here I am now in the master. My favorite green moments always be in a golden Naked pirate mirror. Nothing can compare with the pleasure to take the last say and play Golden Acre into major compounds and the location. Uh, and then Swab Lobe is a finisher of over 40 points. Seventer is a great player. He always brings some creative decks into this game. And now I'm playing against him. Uh, I hope it would be a gorgeous match. Привет, я Саманта. Начал играть в Вин после хомкаминга. Примерно полтора года назад начал интересоваться киберспортом. Есть два любимые момента. Первый из которых случился на четвертом опене. Уже был сыграл размашистый удар в себя и тем самым вражеское кель сложилось. И второй. Тайлбот сыграл рандом на контрелу, и это помогло ему выиграть игру. Против Китбурга не могу сказать ничего, я не знаю, что он друг Габайна, и у него очень неприятный война. Hello everyone and welcome to the second quarterfinals of Gwent World Masters. It is surreal to be here in person finally. I am Lionheart and I am delighted to be joined by Ghost Arya. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. It is truly a delight to be here. It's amazing. And what have we just seen? Thank you so much to Celia and Shin for the amazing first series. That was truly something. <laughs> it was special. <laughs> it was special indeed. So we are here live from Warsaw. Uh, some of our friends from the community are here as well. But you guys, a lot of you are watching from home. So we would like to take a moment to remind you that if you're watching from home, that you have your snacks, you're all cozy, you know, wrapped up. But you're also claiming those Twitch drops. That, that is, is really right. important. It is. The Beholder title can be yours after just four hours of watching on Twitch. But it's really important that you remember to redeem that reward, right? Yeah, because if you don't click it, you will miss out on this wonderful card back. You need eight hours to get it. It is kind of the last one to the collection, right? It is, and it might just be my new favorite. And yes, I can be accused of saying that after every single one, but it is absolutely gorgeous. So make sure that you get it. Of course, it is eight concurrent hours of watching. You don't have to watch eight hours back to back. We don't have to make sure we get three twos with long series. You're okay. You do not need to panic at all. It's okay. But we will be here tomorrow as well. So don't worry about it. Just remember to claim the first drop. Whew, so it's a first series and we are here with a second one. We are indeed. You guys were at home 
and thinking about who's gonna win, and we know how that went, right? We do. The divinations. We know exactly who's here, but we do not know who you have picked, and this one is mighty close. <laughs> you guys couldn't pick either, clearly. So it's just 2%, 52% for San Mante and 48 for Catburger. Wow, that's gonna be a nail batter. At least you guys think it's gonna be that way. And here I was hoping that that would give me some sort of hint as to how this was gonna go. Apparently not. It really is a toss up between these two players. It's super close, according to you. It's the first set of divinations this way round though, right? We've never seen the players use the decks a whole week in advance before, so maybe that's played a part? Maybe, because you guys could play with the decks, you could have a look at them. You also have seen all of these players so far played last weekend as well. So yeah. we were kind of thinking, oh, maybe they were able to pick their favorite, but clearly they're so good, both of them, you know? <laughs> clearly. Well, here we are talking about these decks. I would love to see these deck lists. And I believe we are gonna start off with Cat Burger and his first list. It is the Imposter Nilfgaard. Oh, wow, oh, wow. I think some of us might be getting flashbacks, you know, to triple ball, double ball, all the balls. But don't worry, this time it's just single masquerade ball. This Nilfgaard engine deck has it all. You know, it has the poison package, the removal, and if it's missing some control, oh, don't you worry, Nilfgaard has locks all day, all night. Locks for days. Yes, definitely. Uh, if Nilfgaard's not happy with their own cards, they can always steal your best cards and play your cards better than you do. And this deck is able to do that with all the spying and coup as well, to make sure that uh, you really don't get to play your deck but Nilfgaard always does. This uh, Nilfgaard definitely likes uh, round control, so I bet Catburger will be keen to win the round one. Mm -hmm. After that, Catburger is bringing the Arca Swarm. He is the second list. It's one of my favorites. It's, some people don't like it, but I absolutely love this Arca Swarm list. It is templated to be played on blue coin going first. That Urn of Shadow is absolutely crucial to the way this list works. But a key card you have to highlight in this list, it's Ida. This card is phenomenal. Snacky Boy, as I like to call him, it's the new official name, hashtag Snacky Boy, hashtag World Masters. It is all about getting this card, not just once, but multiple times with that Arrakis Queen. If you can do that, you can see the ability. Every single time the opponent plays a unit, it'll damage it, but it, you will also gain a charge. The damage is valuable because it helps towards that play, both with the Acid Spit and also later on with the Glusty. The drone spawn, it's a rack of swarm, you know? That's the way the synergy goes. I love this list. I was initially a bit skeptical about the acid spit inclusion when we were lucky enough to cast last weekend. Mm -hmm. I was wrong. It was amazing. Absolutely loved it. And a little bit of graveyard hate in there with the Xavier Lemons too. A really interesting list. Once again, one that tends to prefer round control. Because of the Witch's Sabbath, it doesn't want to have that bled out of it if it can. All the idders you make, they come back again if you play your cards right. The next list, it's Blood Money Syndicate. It's bringing the bounty back. Yes. Bounty and poison is what Syndicate likes to see in this deck indeed. And uh, I think the card we should highlight here is actually Golden Necker. You Makes guys sense. probably have seen it before, played <laughs> I, I it, think you that know, might be right. faced it, all of it. However, with the recent community balance changes, Golden Necker is actually 10 provisions. And you might think, oh, that's a, that's a nerf, you know, mm -hmm. it's more expensive. But what it actually does is now Golden Necker is the most expensive card in the deck. That means addi addition like Mata uh, creates a great tutor for your key card in a deck like this one. And why is Golden Necker so important? Well. It plays all the cards for you, giving you amazing tempo. So Golden Necker will play the top unit, the top artifact and the top special, which means that your opponent might be thinking that everything's going well for them, but in a second later, it looks very different. Yeah. And we also kind of see that uh, this deck is making a return, to, at least to... Um, professional scene. Yeah, it's been away for a little while, right? I think it's a little breath of fresh air after all the vice that we've seen with Syndicate. No vice for Cat Burger. No, well, we'll see. Well, what maybe. The <laughs> well, no, definitely no, no, definitely no vice. True. There's definitely no vice here. And, uh, last but not least, the Guerrilla Tactics. 
Well, this is some people's vice. I do love me some Scoia'tael, and I know you do as well. This is a very aggressive red coin list. It is the control among the... Well, I guess there's a little control everywhere else from Catburger, but this one, for me, is the hardest of them all. There's a heat wave, there's a curse of corruption. Every time something hits the board, well, it's not staying there for very long with a list like this. It's all about that removal, building up lots and lots of armor at the same time on your side of the board, using cards like Armorer's Workshop, something I never thought I would say at a World Masters, so that your Dennis Cranmer can come down for that final, potentially short round slam. It's a really, really interesting deck, and there is a card I'd like to talk about in here that I never thought I'd see in the open decklist format, it's Shiru as well. Now, Shiru has been a staple of this particular list. Previously, the idea of this in an open deck list many years ago would have been crazy because you would always try to play around it. There's so much more complexity in modern Gwent now that there are ways to get this card in the list. It can play at three, it can play at five, six, eight, nine. It's, it's incredible. You're always looking for good value and engine removal with a card like this, and I think it's an interesting lineup from Cat Burger. That is his lists. I think we should go and see Sam Vanters. Starting off with Sam Vanters' very first deck, it's Urson Ritual. It is indeed some self wound Skellige. Well, this deck brings everything to the action, I mm -hmm. feel like. So that, there are cards that, you know, they don't mind when it hurts. And those are Nut, Sigwald, Dracotoda, and even Orgreed. Yeah. They are all here and ready to party for days. You could say that, you know, Nut is an amazing target to make sure that you're constantly removing things that your opponent plays. Yes. And, or, and painting with something like Dracotoda means that you're not only removing, but you're also gaining points. The second kind of couple in this uh, deck <laughs> I would like to talk about is Swalblood and uh, Totem. Yes. We all know Swalblood goes boom, boom, kaboom. Well, it's his Totem, right? So it makes sense that they work together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're chilling together. I'm not sure about you, but uh, Swalblood Math... Oh, I refuse. Is, yeah. Swalblood Math, it will be a Swalblood number of points. And however many it is, we will find out together. It's a really interesting deck list. And you guys can do the math for us and then let us know how it went, how quickly you managed to get there. But even, even so, if Sam Vanter's feeling like he needs a little more control, then there is always Care Trolder with Dwim. Yeah. That, that is your instant answer to whatever you don't like your opponent has. And I'm really curious to see how Skelliget will perform especially against some of the Cat Burgers decks. I know that uh, he was quite worried that, oh, he was, we were worried when we were mm -hmm. thinking about it, how that will work against the Arca Swarm. Yes. We'll see if they ever meet. We will. Well, the next deck that someone is bringing, oh, I don't think anybody's surprised <laughs> that it's Pinta Manuva. No, it is Pinta Manuva, but it isn't the Totem Temple shenaniganery. I think that's a word, and if it's not, it is now. You made that, it up. You, I, I, it's fine, I do that all the time. It is not that list, but it is one you'll probably recognize, and you'll love it just as much if you've been playing on Gwent Ladder. It is, of course, Renfrey Traveling Priestesses. The Traveling Priestess, she has been traveling, she's been traveling, and she is indeed back. This list thins immaculately. You can see the way this card works. The more it's shuffled into the deck, the more charges it gets, the more charges it gets the more points it can give from those orders. Crucial that it, of course, is zealed so that it can play, which means it needs to be inspired. That means buffed in the deck when it's played, but this list does that masterfully well. You pair all of your original leader charges with it, get a few more, as you do with your Radovids, and you keep on playing. This list will thin perfectly to three cards, typically. You will then hope for Renfri to find the just the right curse and blessing combo to thin through your lowest value card. And of course, Vernon Roche will come in to save the day and grab the last two. Those traveling priestess charges, don't you worry. They're not just worth their own points. The pairings with the Onias, and of course, also that Tridem Infantry, double or even triple the power of this list. Again, this one for me really likes to be in control of its rounds. If its combos bled, it doesn't have much left. So it's very, very important that it tries to do that. And I can see Sam Van Ter. This is the list that he really needs to win with if he's going to win the series. It's a strange thing to say, but it's the one he's going to need the most effort to get through, I think. He too, though, has also bought Arrakis Swarm. 
Yeah, in, he has, and it is slightly different than the one that Catburger is bringing. Well, if I say slightly, I might be exaggerating <laughs> here, because it's exactly one car that's different. That is a huge difference. That is That, that could be significant. Actually, a joke, you might be right, that could be series winning. Sam Winter has decided to bring Andrega Queen instead of Xavier, mm -hmm. and that could make the difference, well, we'll see. Uh, however, you've heard about this deck, but I want to highlight one really important car here, and that is the Kikimo Stalker. Kikimo Stalker is not, it's fairly new, you could say, but it's one of the key cards in this deck. Maybe some of you returning players are now looking and saying, oh, why is this new keyboard? That is the Predator. Predators can only attack what is effectively weaker than them. Mm -hmm. So Kikimo Stalker is really great with the acid spit and just making sure everything is tiny and going all the way down to one point exactly so that Glusty can then have a feast. Glusty cleans up indeed. Indeed, yeah. So that is the Araka Swarm. Also likes to go on blue coin because, and that's kind of told by the stratagem because when you're playing Urn of Shadows, you definitely want to see it as early as possible. And again, my favorite, last but not least, Guerrilla Tactics. Yes, it is again a Scoia'tael list, and these are also remarkably similar. These players are, did not prep together, but they do have two lists that are very similar. Once again, slightly different is an exaggeration. It's a solitary card, I believe. Sam Vanter has brought a verification in with this list. Now, he is obviously a little bit more concerned about enemy locations or scenarios, all of those artifacts, so he's got two different ways of dealing with it. It can be dealt with proactively as well. The Guerrilla Tactics list really does like to be aggressive. It is a very control-heavy set of cards that go in there, not just your lock, not just your frenzied Dow, but all of those powerhouse tool removals that we've talked about before. The Milva in there as well, improving your offensive removal with your leader charges as well. So it can really, really ramp up the points from that super quick and help you deal with those engines as quickly as you like. Those are our deck lists. We have two players and this is going to be a fascinating series. It is, we could see some mirrors. We could, I, I'm really we excited, could. genuinely, because I love mirrors, because yeah. just, they, they just feel like, it's a little bit of like Spider-Man mean, like I've got this, no, I've got this. <laughs> do you have this? Do you have this? Maybe. We don't know. But, but we do know the bands are in. <laughs> yeah, so Cat Burger, is bringing Nilgar Monta Syndicate Scoyatel and San Van Ter is bringing Skelligan Nordwemps Mordant and not the Scoyatel. It doesn't look like it. So you, yes, you can see Cat Burger, no Nilfgaard. So yep. don't worry about Masquerade Ball at all. No, oh, no. You oh, know, I, the horror. I was looking forward to the Shangigans a little bit. I see, I see. And yet you mentioned San Van Ter as well. So there will definitely not be a Scoia'tael mirror because only one player has it. I was kind of expecting a double Scoia'tael ban here, if I'm being honest. The aggression that that can have into some of these engine lists, really, really interesting that that has now gone through. Sam Banter clearly more worried about Nilfgaard, which we've been there, right? We've been there. We all worry about Nilfgaard sometimes. <laughs> <And> <laughs> to the sun. <laughs> well, oh yeah, look at you, traitor. I can't believe I'm, re I'm repping a Nilfgaard pin. Who thought it'd happen, eh? Catburger didn't really get to play the Squirtle deck last weekend. True. It was banned two times. So I'm curious to see how he performs with it. So now we know the band. We do. We know our players. Mm -hmm. We know the coin. Uh, we did, yeah, of course, yeah, you got Catburger is going first here uh, in this series, and it's going to be a really fascinating series. We mentioned that mirrors are going to be unlikely uh, because, well, Squirtle can't now do that. And the Araka Swarm list, I would be absolutely stunned if either player took it on red coin by choice. The only reason you'd consider it potentially is for Catburger to avoid that Skelliger list. I'm thinking Svalblood may just like dealing with those uh, little units, those little swarms. You're not going to have too many tokens around because, of course, it damages everything. So it'll get rid of your own too. Yeah, but it just feels like, you know, it could be very tasty. Not mm. for Glusty, but for Svalblood. In yes, that, well, in that lots matchup. of things are tasty for him, <laughs> that's for sure. And wow, we are already here. These players are ready and raring to go as we do see that matchup straight out of the gate. Catburger, he wasn't 100% sure when we got to chat with him if he was going to try and counter -cue a little here. He was hoping to use his Nilfgaard. It ended up banned. It is a Racker Swarm on blue coin. And scan again on red. Okay. Yeah, here we go. Uh, well, Cat Burger, when we were chatting with him, also said that he doesn't feel 
too strongly about this series, actually. Mm. And neither of them felt that they Neither of them favorite. felt favoured, right? Yeah. They both felt like it was really a coin flip as we see the opening lineups here. Now, the defender is already in place for Catburger, which is fantastic. He's got access to his Ida as well. He'll be very, very happy with that. And he may have to use this Arcane Tome here instead. Always risky giving it to your opponent in order to grab the Arrakis Queen that he's looking for, but he does have access, and that is absolutely crucial. It's exactly what he does here. It makes sense, because you want to make sure that you get those Idas on Idas on Idas as quickly as you can. Yes. And uh, maybe, and we'll see if it's worth it, risking the Arcane Tome going to some Vanta there. Well, it looks like it. We'll see if it ends up, uh, if it ends up panning out for them. We will find out because you have to develop the board of San Vanter to have that removal. So, so far, everything's going the way Catburger would like. Will it stay that way? Well, it's all about those next rounds now. Is San Vanter gonna find a way to get through and remove this, or is he just gonna drop a little bit of point value and get out of here? It's, it's, a, it's a risky one to push into this and overcommit, but he does have a decent looking hand his side as well, especially because that arcane tome now exists. It, that's true. However, I was looking at the hand. I was like, hmm, it's a little difficult unless you you return the arcane tome. And I was thinking if there's something that Catburger wants from it. So if we could see it flip back and forth. I, I, it always makes me nervous when you see it flip back and forth. And Sam Van Ter here has taken advantage of it. The Aneeromancy, of course, will come back to him too. And it's a beautiful target. That's Sigvold here. He's like, no worries, Itta. You can ping me. Ping me all you like, my friend, because I will just absorb that damage. A really nice little counter. Sam Bantan knows the importance here of uh, not giving everything away right now. And it's not just the Sigwald that's happy to take the damage. It's also the Drakkar that is, I would say, an underrated bronze. True, I agree, yeah. Because it can just get points and points, especially with the Mandrams in hand. But let's have a look what's happening over in this um, insect full of Forest. Yeah. There, there are insects everywhere here. As we can see, he doesn't choose to click it again, and I honestly don't blame him. Giving your opponent access to even more is a risk, but I am not surprised here. It's only a 12-point game, but with the availability of this Sigvold, there is a lot happening, but it's gone instantly. You can see that reset has come in. Catburger now massive amount ahead. Uh, Sam Vanter, I saw his eyes briefly mm. flicker as he watched all of those green points vanish. That is a big gap that someone to would have to get now. It's 31 points when I'm looking at it now. Yeah. With bleeding and vital vitality. Lots of things bounce either happening. way. But is, when would uh, Catburger like to leave here? Oh, Catburger's very happy already. He does have access, of course. Uh, he can play the, the even the extra carryover if he has to with that hive mind, but you would ideally not spawn too many of them too early. The risk, of course, that you can end up blocking your perfect Witch's Sabbath later. It is the one thing that isn't going Catburger's way. He doesn't have access to it, but... Catburger doesn't need to worry about it. As right Samantha says, you know what? I am out. I need to leave and see what round two brings. Now, this matchup's gonna be really, really spicy in terms of whether he bleeds or not. Obviously, he has his Aneuromancy here. He's happy, he's found the Acid Spit as well. He will probably, I would expect Catburger here will go for a soft push to feel out what's available to see if he can then go for that 2-0 a little bit later. If he straight out plays this Witch's Sabbath, which is a possibility, he really is going in hard for this because he needs to get everything out of his opponent. But a lot of those big cards are missing on the other side. No sign of the Draco Turtle at all here all on all the other great. side. No, yeah, yep. or Svalblood. Or Swamblood, yeah. Yeah, the, the big hitters. I'm not really sure how Sam Vanta will therefore defend the bleed. Of course, we have the luxury of seeing that though. Catburger looking like he's setting up the carryover. And we'll see if Sam Vanta will manage to bluff and pretend like I have stuff to survive this. Indeed. And maybe therefore scare Catburger away. Maybe. If he got, because obviously he does have the Aneuromancy. Care Trolled, as you mentioned earlier, paired into something like a Draco Turtle. A defender is no match here whatsoever. Instead, though, we're just seeing a little bit of time slowly. I love this ping as well. Removing the potential risky damage value and switching over the engine. He doesn't have to think about it now. Definitely makes sense. But what I was thinking is that both the locations that Sam Vanton now has, 
have resilience, which is something that kind of lets you play them all in round two. And you're like, okay, I can have them on board. I know they're staying till round three. So those could be the potential sources of points for San Banta, right? They could be. If he can make it through this round, that's definitely a possibility. The risk, of course, I think Kertrold may survive approximately 0.3 seconds before it gets delete waved out of existence. It would certainly be my target in this matchup. It, I'm not sure if I wouldn't be keeping something for Swarblood later. I think you get most of his value straight away, maybe, maybe. but we'll see. Katberger now is making a decision as he looks at how far does he want to go is kind of going to depend on when he's forced out. The longer this goes, the better he is going to be, or the more happy he will be, I would imagine, because of the cards he's going to return and get rid of. And we just see another ping uh, getting rid of the engine next to the totem, denying someone to even more points. Kaburger is happy to commit these because yeah. he, ha he hasn't played Hive Mind yet, I believe, and there's still plenty cards for him to, that are his big plays. Yeah. Sabbath hasn't been played. So that's all waiting to be seen. It is. Now the Incubus that he has in hand, no really good targets for him with this Incubus, honestly. So at the moment, it's kind of just sat there. He's just bringing back an Indrager, but the warrior doesn't, it's being summoned. It's not being spawned or usable, so he can't play it. It's not necessarily going to be worth the value. We do see that Care Troll has come down. The Great Sword is a great choice. Will we see it deleted? We'll see. So both of the locations are down now and Sam Banter is not looking very happy about how this round is going for him. So far, but he no. is still in reach. Yes. The, the point gap's not too big for someone to not to catch up again. And like you, it took longer than it you did. said. Uh, yeah, you know, you know what? Actually, that wasn't that fast. Katberger was thinking about it and decided that the location needs to go. Now that's a really interesting moment and an interesting choice here as all oh, now that's a really, I was about to say, it gives Katberger a really difficult situation. Katberger was in a spot there where Heatwave was zero tempo, and I'm not surprised to see this at all. Heatwave was going to be zero tempo. I was worried he was going to be locked in. San Vanter has kind of given his hand up a little bit by playing a dead Dwim Viandra for almost no tempo there has really given away that his hand might not be the best, and Katberger has absolutely gone in, instantly responding with the Witch's Sabbath to try and set up his game plan. Yeah, suddenly Katberger is more confident in going into this round, because potentially he could too low here mm -hmm. if everything goes well. So we see the Defender and the Idus, the good boys. We do, yeah, uh, snacky coming boys. Back, the snacky good boys coming mm -hmm. back. Uh, that means Sigvald is back from San Vanta. Well, that's the risk reward, right? Yeah, because we also know that Nut is in the hand. It is, and however, the self wound is now automatically activated here. No leader required in this situation for San Vanta because those idders actually are doing work for San Vanta effectively in this situation. Katberger pushing, trying to get as much value as possible, and has given one of his biggest game plans in but he doesn't have anything like the Glusty for the really huge payoff later. So I am curious if this is going to be worth it. He's going to try and kill this Knut here. We do know San Vanta has a way to bring him right back, though. Yeah, that Knut will not stay in the graveyard for long, I imagine. Because uh, that's the kind, that's the thing Skellige does. You know, you always think you got rid of something and then it comes back and then it comes back and it's always there. Bring it back again, you know? Yeah. I'm not sure what they're bringing back, but they keep doing it. <laughs> well, I'm pretty sure if he does it this time round, it will definitely be for the Knut. The charges that were stored up here on that Kikimor Stalker, exactly the reason you mentioned it earlier, it's such a key card for this list, that it allows you that removal, even if you're not going for the Glusty, for the Acid Spit, being able to just hold those charges, provided, of course, you are taller than the unit, you have Predator enabled, it can be really, really valuable. But we can see San Vanter here right now, and I think he's weighing up. Is he going to have to a Neuromancy, or where is he going with this right now? And we're seeing a pick on the Sigwald from the Totem, mm -hmm. and a rope. I don't, they, they are so intense in matchups <laughs> like this, nervous. where I'm like, please play. But it is the nude in the end, and San Vanter decides to commit it. He does. How will Cat Burger answer here? Because 
He has two bronzes left. He does have two bronzes left, and neither of them really help him a huge amount here because he could, let's say he decides to drop the Vram Warrior. No, he doesn't, and I like this pass. He's given himself enough of a gap. He knows there is a risk here that this Sigvold is a single play away, effectively, from trapping him in. He gave a lot to get here, but the question for me is, did he get enough back in order to win? On his side, he does still have access to a few things, the Glusty, but in a shorter round, it's not always the best. With full leader and a potential Vran Warrior, maybe it will be. And we're seeing the MP Pella coming yeah, down. Yeah, MV Pella coming in. And we're probably going to see some uh, leader charges to catch up because Sam Venter doesn't want to commit another card. Which makes perfect sense. And those two leader charges were effectively free for him as they had already, they would have been used on the canoe previously. It's not as dangerous. He'd done the math perfectly and he gets out holding his card. Now that Dwin Viandra won't be much use, but I would say the Aneromancy and the Svalblood definitely will. And Svalblood finally makes an appearance. Uh, verification in hand. I'm just looking if verification will not be used offensively. This no. could just be extra points Ooh. for Sam Vanter if no. it stays. Two Vran Warriors dropping on the board here, uh, or rather into Cat Burger's hand. He's currently holding onto the Incubus as well. In terms of units for his own side, that Kiki Moore Stalker could well be what he ends up fishing for, but we will see. We know there's not a huge amount of direct removal outside of the heat wave here but is he gonna go it is of course it's the turtle it has to be the turtle you know the beautiful premium and the possibilities with swap uh, those points yeah so that means heat wave is out of the question though it is that's Vanter. right we now know exactly what both players have to offer but that draco turtle's really awkward it's a, a really bad target for Catburger on this side because he can't acid spit it right now because of course the last thing he wants is the acid spit spreading to that. It will actually give value. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have enough damage here to take the turtle out. So that's what we're gonna see. And I like the row stacking next to it from Sanvanta as a result because it removes a little bit of that risk. And the turtle and totem are an amazing combo. Yeah. I'm curious if we're just gonna see as many points as possible, but Sam Vanta decides to keep it, waiting possibly for uh, the Swalbot tricks, uh, ticks later. Yes, quite possibly. It makes sense. Uh, he's just, uh, and the risk he's looking at right now, he's trying to think, if I take any of the armor, I could put it into reach that it never gets armor again. I have no way to give it more armor, and as a result, I don't want to play that game with you. I'm going to leave you alone. Makes sense. Just playing it safe, feeling the waters. Wolf's gonna get here. And here it comes. This is gonna be at least one point. And Svalblood here drops down. Really nice timing on the Svalblood. Able to delete one of those Ran Warriors, which will feel great for him. I don't, I wouldn't be surprised to see it return straight away here, though, from Catburger, potentially uh, bringing it back with the Incubus. Because if he can get the extra value, double or again, even triple Glusty's value with all of those consumed units, we will see. But what you definitely don't want to see Cat as Cat Burger is spawning more units that could potentially die to Swalbot. True. So that makes sense as well. And well, this is going to be so close oh here. Oh my, oh my. So you were right. It was definitely at least one point. And it was at least and one point. And I think point. it will be at least another one for Swalbot right here. I mean, that makes sense. Sam Banta decides to use the leader. And again. And, and again, and again. And kaboom, boom. The Swalbot does what it does best, and that is points. This is a huge number of points with only one of these Ram Warriors on the board, no one point units on the enemy side, and all of the damage from these spawns actually giving the opponent points. I think Catburger may struggle here, but the math doesn't check out. And wow. It was more than one point, I think. <laughs> I think it's Safe fair to, to say. say, yeah, I think it was. In that second round, the bleed there, Catburger was desperately trying to find a way to get enough value. If he can just stick a couple of those Ram Warriors, he might have had a chance. As soon as we saw the acid spit, it was really awkward. It ended up costing him more and more points. Sam Van Ter decides he did a really good job of resisting that bleed, I think. Yeah, he did. I think actually playing and showing your hand to the opponent saying I actually don't have much by playing the Dwim yeah. was really interesting because then Catburger committed a lot in the round two and maybe he wouldn't have maybe. if uh, 
you know, someone who didn't show his hand yeah. like that. I think ideally it's a really awkward matchup. One of the, well, it's the worst matchup in this series for Katberger playing into that. He was always worried about it, but it's now gone. Mm -hmm. That Skellige list is now not a risk. It is through, it is 1-0 Sandvanta, and Katberger will of course now flip to the other coin. What will that mean? Well. I think we might get to see some square tell. Oh, I was thinking we might get to see a mirror, but we'll see. Maybe someone who will try and take the his monsters on blue, which could be, you know. I mean, yeah, I could see, I could see that, and then I well, then Catburger has the square tell, so I think Catburger may try to use that to uh, defend against such a list because the monsters, I think it will be exclusively blue coin. Mm -hmm. I might be wrong. I might be wrong. It's happened at least once in the past, of course, that I have been wrong, but an incredible first series. They're gonna now obviously take their time and try to refresh. It's not a series that if you're Cat Burger, you're surprised that that matchup didn't go your way. No, I think Cat Burger knew that this will be the difficult matchup. Like we said, it, there were a lot of interactions that you don't really want to see, <laughs> like your idas working against you. Yeah. A lot of things just dying before you could make use out of them. Mm -hmm. but that wasn't ideal for Cat Burger at all. No. And I can't wait to see what the second matchup gonna be. I know. You know, when we're waiting for these players to get ready, whatever we cast, mm -hmm. in my head, they're picking the cosmetics. Of course, I, I think I that know, and it's not true, but yeah. in my head, I'm like, oh, do I want to be Siri? Do I want to be Jennifer? I, d I think it might not be that decision that's keeping them up. I think it will now be a choice of, right, I'm 1-0 down, how do I recover from this position? And which of my decks, not just am I taking, but is my opponent taking, because it's really... One of my favorite things about Conquest, best of five Gwen, is that that, that coin argument. Oh, okay, we do see the game too. I was half right. We do see Squirtel from Catburger. And we're seeing Northern Realms from Sandanta. That's right. Okay, let's have a look at these uh, mulligans. Yes, yeah, and take a look at the hand state for each player. So far, Sandvanta getting rid of the brick, found Renfri organically, and even has her gang to boot. And even the other thinning, which is really good for him. Oh, oh and a free set of charges as well. Yeah. Oh, he does, okay, draws into a brick, but that's okay because you've got so many here. Oh. <gasps> I love this opening. We see the Radovid. It's a chat. It's basically asking, "Do you have a Dow, my friend?" And the answer, of course, is yes, I do. One whole leader charge less in this list. That is a big amount of points potentially. Definitely, because as we know, Northern Realms can be a bit annoying with how much they fix their hand and yes. have exactly what they need. So Cabergros, pretty sure that he doesn't want to see that round. I think that's that's fair, as we see both. He's managed to get their both thinnings on the Siege Masters, which is really nice. Going well for him so far on Blue Coin. As we mentioned when we were talking about the decks, round control is very important for this one. Will it end up being enough? Well, once again, a perfect Milver removal. The uh, less seen Catwitcher Saboteur prior to this list's existence. It was my least favorite Catwitcher. But you know what? It's doing a good job here. It works really well, because like you've said before, this is a movement leader but not really movement yeah. but cat witcher saboteur gives you the precise control of how much things move how much they get damage and what can milva kill off yeah very much so and you see there the onia being shuffled away uh bringing the engine in you might think well that's such a good card well as we mentioned when we were going through these lists that's kind of your final say combo right you don't really want to play both on no. uh too early because you're waiting wow. for the traveling priestess to develop. This is going really well for Catburger here so far. Everything that spawns ends up disappearing and he's able to just about keep himself in range here. The bleeding, of course, he's not going anywhere, Catburger, right now. His hand looking pretty nice, constantly keeping himself ahead and forcing Sanvanta to remain here. Is he going to end up getting the... Uh, the, the Sunset Wanderers, that's going to be interesting in this round if he can find those points. That's why I was just thinking, because uh, being Sun Panther, you want to get the maximum amount of points possible on the Sunset Wanderers, which can sometimes limit you in which cards you play, because <laughs> if you play too much of the card down before Sunset Wanderers, then uh, you don't get as many points. So you kind of need to keep another thing in mind when deciding what you play next. Very much so. As we see, he is deciding here, and that's the leader once again coming in to bring yet another end Engine, probably another Onia disappearing, maybe Vernon Roche. Uh, and, and it is Roche, of course, that was the big part of the combo. He plays the next one, but 
gets all of the value out of it now, very sensibly here, trying to give himself as much room as possible, as he is expecting probably to lose this to the already highlighted offering. I don't know if you saw that, it was instant. I am ready to do this <laughs> before you even finish clicking it. So yeah, someone who was probably very happy that they spent all the uh, charges on that. Yeah. And Catburger is now deciding what to boost in the deck. Uh, which doesn't really, it's not a big part of this deck, but it can be a points. nice yeah. extra carryover later on, right? And once again, he's ahead and decides, this is a huge decision from Sam Vanta here. He says, I, I'm going to take the loss on even, and I'm going to say that Sunset Wanderers will actually survive. No, he, did, he was not even, he was ahead. My yeah. bad. Red is continuing. And offering didn't go to Shear, which I was actually thinking that could have been the target. It's... Catburger decides to go yeah. in certain matchups, but it wasn't it. In that case, a perfect pass from Sam Vanta there as he gets the extra point on the Sunset Wanderers. Doesn't keep the round control though, and it can be really awkward for this deck. We did watch Catburger though. He won his round one last time and the bleed didn't go his way. How will it look this time? Let's have a look at the hand. So, uh, Catburger uh, has nearly brick Simlos. It can still be mulliganed away. Because yeah. uh, that's your ideal oh. target, right? The, uh, the armor. It is. So, you want to make sure that that's in the deck waiting for round three. Uh, how about Oh, Sam that's Banter? a huge pull. Ooh. He manages to find the Dennis here, which gives him the opportunity to really go in on this side. Uh, and at Sam Vanta's side, well, he kind of just has access to everything he wants already, right? Because he's he's got the snowdrop, he still has a lead to charge, and even Renfrey's in the show as well. And Roommage giving you access to all the Renfrey options you could possibly need. Almost, almost all of them. All. Yeah, yeah. So Samwanta is looking quite happy here with the things that he can play right now, like the Roommage. Yeah. Or maybe fix the hand a little with snowdrop, stuff like that. And he does play the room mage here, giving himself that little bit of extra. Is he going to fish for... Okay, goes for Nilfgaard here. Interesting choice. <sighs> okay. And it's the, he does... I was thinking, is it going to be the Obsidian Mirror? Of course it is the Obsidian Mirror. That card, it is either absolutely useless for you or incredible. And in this instance, he manages to get some fantastic engines from the other side of the board. Look at the side from Catburger, he is not happy here. Mm -hmm. Obsidian Mirror can be amazing and someone to, I'm not sure if they were looking for it or not, but it worked out really well. And we're seeing this is big. Simless, which is a massive commitment from yeah. Catburger. The way uh, this armor's workshop works, that it gives, it boosts and gives armor to three adjacent units. I'm saying that just in case because of this deck, honestly, has appeared like two months ago, <laughs> and before that, nobody's playing this special card. Very true, very true. A huge gap now and a big choice. We also see the leader coming in there from Catburger offensively in order, but he leaves. Wow, that is a big choice here. He ends up pushing and leaving the Milva on the board in this spot here, knowing or hoping that he is okay to perhaps use it a little bit later. And we'll see if Milva survived this float. It is likely that she, she could. I think she. I, I think in this list, obviously it's open deck list, they're aware of what's happening, so the likelihood is, or the serious likelihood is, that of course you will survive, uh, or she will survive here. Getting rid of the Dwarven Chariot on the opponent's side, the Sandbanta had it. It was necessary because the constant pinging engines of this Dwarf Berserker makes life awkward. And we see Shiro come down. So I was just thinking, what is it that Kaboka still wants Wait. to play? Okay, so he's just, he played the Shiro. I was expecting Shiro and a leader charge to burn away potentially the Snowdrop, but doesn't go down that route. He just says, I've got points. You have no way to deal with this. So I'm just going to make you think here. I'm going to give you the opportunity. I probably would have burnt there uh, from Catburger. It's an interesting choice. The amount of like pressure mm. from these cards being on board, it's Milva, it's Shiro, and it's just like, what is he going to do with that? Yeah. What's going to happen next? So Samantha plays more, boosts the uh, Snowdrop, makes sense. Sansa Wonder is winking now 12 points and will grow even more. What will Catburger do here? And he plays the Curse of Corruption to remove it instead and finally is able to jump Milva back into the board. Very nice. Obviously, he's got a lot of tall removal, which is why he's hoping for a nicer lineup. He's hoping to get rid of more engines in one go. The Heat Wave is still available for tall removal as well, which may end up having to go on this Sunset Wanderer because of the number of points it will provide. I'm also thinking if Catburger at some point is... Uh, 
it's not really happy to leave because obviously the armor is on the board yes. and you want to make use of the armor and potentially not letting Nordorams develop all the traveling priestesses that still have been traveling and haven't returned yet. Exactly. Well, one of the big things against this, you want to push it and you really want to see that combo. You want to bully your opponent in this round two into giving you the Vernon Roche, into getting that. You can see it hasn't thinned the way it normally would have done, right? Normally it's down to just those three cards and it's got its guarantee. And it's not quite there yet, but we're seeing Renfrey come down. We'll see what uh, someone ends up picking. Yes, and he's taken Curse of Wrath, which is damage six, used it instantly, and of course, set the lowest power allied unit to 10. As you watched, both of those things happen simultaneously for a huge point swing in favor of San Van Ter there. Yeah, with the Sansa Wanderers now down as well. Yes. It is suddenly looking very different than it was for Kepberger one was a huge turn. Ago. turn. That was a massive, yeah. And that was 28 points in a single turn there, if I'm not mistaken. Kepberger at this point. He takes the heat wave on the 13. He's still holding off right now. Hasn't used the Dennis Crown, but hasn't used the Mahakam Pass. Might be thinking to himself, well, I'll do my best to, uh, to develop it in the third round, but is it gonna be enough? It's really difficult to do that in round three. So Kaburger instead commits the location tempering and Dennis. He does. Is Ooh. he gonna have enough points right now to force both cards out? I'm sure he does. I don't know how many charges are there. Let's see, the priestesses have five and five respectively, but they could be missed right now. Yeah. He gets the combo. <gasps> and oh, miss. that push. So normally, that all of these cards will work great together, but without the priestess, it just falls apart. It doesn't, and I'm perfect. A textbook bleed there, as it is now 1-1. One, one. Catburger wow. gets the list through. That is amazing. So that was the power of the Gorilla Tactics deck that just have so much control and points at the same time. Yeah. And the flexibility of saying, well, I'll just do it now. And it worked out. It did. And that's the thing, right? It works. He knew the match that these players obviously have played so much Gwent, but they've also prepped these matchups very well. Winning round one was so important there. As soon as he did, it was all about pushing that combo. If San Vanter does happen to find the Priestess and also the Onia, we will be talking a different story, but that's why you bleed, right? To prevent the chance. If we had found the Travelling Priestess, we still would have been there watching those things go, <laughs> click, go, click, go, click, go, click, go, click, go. Click, click, click. But yeah, uh, it is a different story now, and, uh, and it's 1-1, one, one. wow. Well, we don't get three zeros, you know that. <laughs> no. We never get a three zero. So Can't be us, no. We're, we're helping you get those drops. That's the way we look at it, right? Of course, we're here for you, right? And well, so Scoyatel is out because uh, Scoyatel for San Manta has been banned and yes. Kepberger just made it through with that. He did, but at least you got to see Scoyatel. We now flip the coins and we go back again. So Catburger now returns onto blue coin, which I expect means we will get to see that Arrakis swarm list again, right? Yep, that could be what happens here. I'm really curious to see if... I think so. Yeah, because it's one of the ones that really makes sense on blue coin. You want to be able to set up those idas. You want yes. to have multiple of them. So we could be seeing that. And you were saying that these players had time to practice and scrim, obviously. Yes. Uh, and it's been longer than ever before because of the week of prep between the group stage and the playoff stage. So that's truly unique. And I wonder Very. if... You know, and when we're talking to the winners later, mm. I wonder if they'll mention it and I wonder how it felt for them, actually. Maybe. I mean, it's something we can certainly, uh, you know, I'd love to know about. Mm. On So now Sam Vanta, this is an interesting spot for him. He is now flipping. We might see his NR again, right? Because he's just tried to bring the Northern Realms through on blue coin. Mm. It hasn't worked. He's on red coin, but both of his lists here for me prefer going that way. And I knew they'd do this to me. Both of them were adamant we wouldn't say a mirror of this. And yet here we are. Catburger Sam Vanta in an Arrakis Swarm mirror. Well, at least we will get to see if that one card difference makes a difference. Well, the card you mentioned, it is actually Xavier for Catburger. And in this mirror, Xavier is huge. It's all yeah. about developing your graveyard. It's all about trying to get the worst back from your opponent here. Catburger not only has the blue coin, but also has the ability in hand to resolve it. Both players do play Parasite though, so how long will they last? And which of these will get the heat wave? This is gonna be, oh boy, it's a mirror, mirror, mirror. I was wrong, it officially happened. 
Well, I'll, I'll write this one down and you, I'll remind you I'm later. I'm sure you will. So we see Defender down. What a surprising move mm -hmm. for this kind of deck. And the question is, you know, Sam Winter, will he play it the same one? We will just go see True Mirror and the same thing's happening. But instead, okay. it's a heat wave. Yeah. And Sam Winter is saying, you know what? I don't want you to be able to hide things behind that defense. And that makes sense, but Kapberger looked pretty happy with that being the case. And instead, Sam Vanter drops his. Are we going to see Kapberger heatwave that? Is he going to take it or it? Oh, I'm very curious here now because this is tempting. Instead, he just weakens it and doesn't take the heatwave bait there. He feels that he's okay, he doesn't need to delete it. And we are going to see, I'm sure, a defender from Sam Vanter now. No, no we he don't. just protects. Interesting choice here, and I understand why you would keep the heat wave because it's one of the threats that's kind of hanging over someone. And Kepberger goes that. Okay, that is an interesting opening. He is not losing on even right now. He's seen that Sam Vanter is trying to develop points early in this round. Instead, he's put a solitary idder into his graveyard and said, "You know what? I don't need multiple of them there. I will play this differently. Every deck has more than one line, right?" Yeah, and then it's up to the players to adapt to what's happening on the board currently and be able to flexibly change the strategy. Mm, and uh, Sam Vanter doesn't have the strategy, which is the massive difference here, because he can't <gasps> develop that oh! quickly and it ends up being a tie. <laughs> oh, this is going to be fun. They both say, you know what? Round three's overrated. Let's just have a round two. You know what? You jinxed it. I did. You were saying, oh, no short games for us. And here we are in a tie. This is going to be hilarious. This is going to be a fantastic, fantastic round two. Because honestly, this this is a set of lines. But, Sam Vanta right now actually has the better looking hand too. Hmm. And I'm just looking at it because... Who goes first in the tie then? So when you tie, the player who went second in round one will go first into round two. So now San Vanta effectively has flipped himself. Mm -hmm. He now is going first into this round as we see the mulligan stages are through. A Neuromancy on both sides, meaning that there is still access but a heat wave still for Catburger as we do see that a Nero now coming straight in. I'm a little surprised that we didn't see Squirrel coming down to make sure that Catburger doesn't have access to the Ida? I mean, it, it's a possibility. Uh, instead, but there's plenty it's a hive mind. Yeah, yeah, instead goes for the hive mind, trying to develop that. Is that... I saw a quick heat wave hover there. That would be an interesting choice. The backwards and forwards now Catburger does. Well, let's find out. What is he removing? Because the graveyards aren't developed yet. Mm -hmm. And I think... He's taken Hive Mind out. A Nero, well, there's no use getting rid of that. This is effectively the final round. And the Ida right now, oh, it's not worth removing because you've each only got one thing in the graveyard anyway, neither of them necessarily fishing for Sabbath as it stands. So, yeah, it, you wouldn't be really bringing much back and Xavier can just keep on going. So we see in the Defender removed now. Uh, uh, so the defender was heat waved. Catburger actually did get rid of that Aneromancy instead of the Ida on his opponent's side with that Xavier. I'm not sure if that was intentional or a misclick. Yeah, uh, Catburger. There's no benefit to that right now for him. He's playing for round three. <laughs> on, the, well, on the plus side, though, you do need a unit in your opponent's graveyard in order to bring anything back for yourself. So right now, perhaps just leaving his options open. Okay, and uh, Xavier's is still alive. And I'm looking at Sam Vanta's hand and seeing if there's any way for him to remove it, actually. He has got several ways over time. He could, for instance, have removed it right then with charges. A lot of people would have been decided to do that, thinking, you know what, we're really worried. We should kill this Xavier. The Ida has now gone. But from Sam Vanta's side, he's thinking, you know what, I don't need to do that. You will eventually get through it. And if I, these charges are going to be more valuable, but... Well, you mentioned Kiki Moore Stalker has the Predator tag, right? Well, it's not a big Predator right now with the one health left. Exactly. So it needs to get better quickly. Yes, it needs some friends. It needs to find a way to improve itself. This, this is going to be a tight, tight game here because it's not going to be played the way you would expect. And that's the beauty of mirrors because you, especially nearly exact mirrors, because you're trying to play a little differently to... Uh, read what's happening in a strategy that maybe you didn't quite plan for. But like you said, these players would have tried, would have tried these exact matchups before because they knew what they were facing. Yes. 
instead we see the second uh, kicking more stalker coming down, Samvanta just developing the engines, hoping that they will stick. Yeah, really hoping there you saw a leader charge come in as well, desperate to avoid the possibility of this going down to one power. Once these hit one power, they tend to, well, realistically not have a great deal of fight in them unless you can reboost them, and that is tough. And we see another one being lowered down to just two points from Katberger, also just taking it slow, seeing what's in Samvanta's hand and being like, well, what, what can you bring? Yeah, what can you still do here? Katberger resisting the temptation to try and develop their own engines, just slowly, slowly, slowly taking the time. One thing we haven't discussed so far in this, both players have Glusty and it's almost like pistols at dawn here. Who will Glusty first? And it, look, he who Glusty's first may well Glusty the best in this situation. Glusty's With, last. Yeah, well, yeah <laughs> exactly. Because the second one may just not find the value it's looking for. Yeah, that is definitely another moment in this mirror that is, at least for me, a nail biter. And I keep looking at that squirrel that someone has, yeah. like, what's happening with that squirrel? Are we ever going to see it played? Well, I think that squirrel's waiting desperately. And I think it's waiting to try and deal with a potential hive mind. Mm. Because the, the spawn value of that is huge. Just saw massive, massive moment there. Using the parasite himself in order to fix these stalkers. I heard the rope timer hit. Wow, it, it, that was really to the second. That was really close, but those stalkers are suddenly looking much better with those greens numbers. Uh, Cat Burger, well, I'm not sure how many more specials do they have and if that arcane tone could be useful for them, but instead we see... They are very. Uh, we see the hive mind being played. We do, and the hive mind goes straight into his own stalker here with enough charges to drop it right back down to one again. Using the arcane tome in order to buff and push it up kind of highlighted there might be a chance that it wouldn't, that your opponent has no other choices. Giving the arcane tome back, you have to finish that off there. You can't leave it at one and get greedy because you know your opponent has ways of dealing with this, right? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and, and now we finally see the squirrel. Yeah. Let's check what was removed. It was It indeed. was the hive mind, yeah. It was the hive mind. It was. And once again, though, we see this bounce, the hideous feast, hitting one stalker and buffing another, potentially, I would assume, uh, in order to uh, continually grab that strength and make sure they are the predator. They are the king of the jungle? Shed? Whichever it is. Forest? Sure. I'm not sure. Swamp? Yeah, the Maybe? king of something. And now he's going to try and potentially, is he going to use every leader charge here to kill this off? Or is he just going to let it hit one? Now, see, let it be on one and the arcane tome is back. <laughs> I wonder how many more rounds it's going to do because it's been a while. It is literally looking... a past tome at this point. Yeah. So, Cat Burger, one more kicking more stalker. Uh, Glusty, Spores, that, those are some big cards that need to be on the board quickly. They do, and which is Sabbath here providing zero use, honestly. You'd be giving your opponent back a Kiki Moore Stalker, which may be the decision, may take that. He goes, oh, he gets a unit instead. Is he going to consume? What is he gonna bring here? Just another Stalker, pairing it beautifully. I like this with the reset, taking control all of a sudden, and we might see a full leader now from Cat Burger. This one didn't, isn't going to come down to who has more idders, but potentially who has more stalkers. And so far, that is looking very distinctly like the answer to that is Cat Burger. Yeah, Cat Burger has been able to keep the stalkers alive and actually remove some of the stuff that Samantha has. <laughs> I'm also thinking, when do you drop the Glusty? And this, well, this is the brave point. When you choose to drop that Glusty, we can see the problem for Catburger is he knows the spore still exists potentially for his opponent. And we know Sandvanta has it, so Glusty can clean up for one, get reset, but the other Glusty has very little left. It really is a tense moment when we're going to see that happen, and wow. I was, because that is a great way for Sandvanta. That was a surprise there. <laughs> was it? Yeah, yeah, the surprise from Cat Burger. Oh, I can see the eyebrows go, Ooh. That was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is the board nearly cleared for both of them. But uh, Sandvanta was okay to do that, has the point, has more control over what's happening. 
Catburger playing those Kiki Moore stalkers, but no great target for them anymore. Not so far. He does still have a Neuromancy though, with a decent set of choices. Uh, he could still decide that he is going to bring back the Sabbath, for instance, but it's a bit late in the day. Has the Arrakis Queen and some Consume, which will help eat insects and spawn as well, potentially. So there are still options for Cat Burger from that. He will want a Glusty very last. Well, uh, I think, yeah, because so far that would have been a very sad Glusty. Yeah. What are we? So Sam Manta only has the Endraga Queen and Spores. Spores are not useful. Well, the, the spores right now, it's, it's a two-point card, but those two points could have potentially caused a problem. Uh, they could have ended up there. Decides to consume the Glusty. Now, that's an interesting choice because you're constantly going to spawn one power units for your opponent here, mm. which, when you're facing the Glusty, is, you're, it's an interesting line. He's ahead by a lot of points right now. Can Catburger find a way with this Aneromancy to get just enough back. The Sabbath is only bringing, I think, one, two units for the opponent here for San Vanta, so it would, as a result, bring an Ida and a Kiki Moore Stalker for Catburger. It could end up being his best play. And San Vanta could have also been thinking, well, I need to spore something, and that something could have been uh, glusty, even with that one uh, drone on the board, but. Oh, of course, the, the, the Arrakis Queen, I'm used to this not being here in round one. The reason she is going to do so much work is her order ability, right? Yeah, because she will spawn again. Uh, and will so if, close. Oh my god. Because then that gets spored and someone to ends up with 45, 46 points. He does, but we see there are a lot of spawns here and there are going to be pings as well that I'm assuming will be used over on the other side of the board where possible to bring that squirrel down into line here as well. Oh, this is going to be interesting both on the other side. And I think it is safe to say Catburger is going to go 2-1 ahead here, but I, we will I know, see. I you know, we said no small blood map, but I think in general, the last minute math, and we will leave it to the players to do that. And we see Ooh. a massive swing and Catburger wins this. Catburger does. The blue coin player here is always favored. Both of them though, took some very interesting lines as Catburger is now 2-1 up with just one list to get through. Oh wow, which one is it for Cat Burger? That's Cat Burger nice. still has just Blood Money Syndicate and he is about to flip onto its coin of choice, in my opinion. He is flipping onto Red Coin. So he will be very, very happy here that he has that right now. And therefore, San Vanta could try and take the monsters' list again on blue. Yeah. Because like you said, that's its coin of choice. It's Not a, sure yeah. it's a, again, because now we're in a very interesting situation. Uh, Catburger only has one deck to go, and Sam Hunter knows exactly which yes. deck it is. So that gives you a little more control, actually, as the player that's losing currently. Because you can plan against a certain deck instead of just blindly picking. Yeah, exactly. You don't have to play games with your opponent anymore. The problem for Sam Vanta here is he does have a choice, but it's not which is best, it's which is worst, almost, on the, co the opposite coin. Ideally, he would love to have blue coin twice here, so it's going to be what has the best chance of beating this on its bad coin. I do. I think we'll actually see Northern Realms right now, because I think that Arrakis list next, if he can make it to a game five, might be his best chance. But we, of course, are just speculating. Catburger, 2-1 up here. I, that Arrakis mirror was fantastic, because it was absolutely different to every game I've ever played with it. It wasn't really what you expect, <laughs> right? It was just... But it, it did come down to whose Glusty's bigger. Oh, well. And the, well no, actually, no, I'm wrong, because the, no. the big Glusty lost. <laughs> you know what? So, no, we'll don't skip, make but me we'll say see. You know what I mean. <laughs> Let's just move on. Let's just move on. Hashtag World Masters. So, we're about to head in, hopefully, to a game four with Cat Burger just having this blood money list. He's going to be on red coin. He's going to have his choice, effectively, of it's it's poison, it's bounty, it's red coin. Now it's it's an incredible list. His opponent though has decided, you know what? I've got to get this Arrakis Swarm list through on blue. So we do see the flip you mentioned. Yeah, we see Sam Hunter maybe feeling le least confident about the monsters now and saying on the other coin. I want to have it through and I don't want to think about it anymore. Just That's let true. me win with this monster there. Yeah, and the Northern Realms list can do well on the other coin as well. 
it, it just has a chance of missing Renfrey, but it, it generally thins very well. As we do see here now, San Vanta has found most of what he's looking for, I believe, in this opening. He has access to the Defender, and he has as well the potential for the Arcane Tome to grab his next choice. Here, though, I wouldn't be surprised if that was the Arrakis Queen to give him extra defenders. Against something like Syndicate, I would rather have more protection almost. And we'll see what Sam Vanthan decides to go for. So far, just taking it slow, uh, buffing uh, the defender a bit. And then we'll see if we see Arkantorm or something else. Yeah. Catburger. Poisons. How many poisons do we have in the hand? Ooh, so well, far... One of the bounty and the poison are there, and it's a really nice time to get the bounty down, because if it is consumed, of course, the opponent will still get the coins. But there are a few poisons up there. The poison engine, you've got the Blenheim Brother, as well as a solitary poison. One more on the board, if there is a bounty target as well. Okay, so we'll see how... How is that bounty going to be dealt with? Or if Catburger is just hoping that that will be a passive income? Well, for, yeah, for Catburger, it, it'll be pretty simple. If it doesn't get consumed, he can use the poison in hand, as well as the Salamandra uh, assassin that's on the board, in order to transition that in a single turn. We see here, I think this will be the Arrakis Queen. I think that would make sense it to does. just develop as much as you can. It does give the coins though, it right? It gives the coin, because now we can see that Cat Burger is on nine. Yeah, it's not a pocket full of sunshine, but it's a pocket full of coins for Cat Burger. Well, the pocket's a little too small for what Cat Burger could have made out of that, so it's only nine as always. There's no thinning in this deck, there's no boat, because like he said, this is a kind of fresh air. It's not your usual wise that you see with Syndicate. It's not, but that lovely pairing. This is the problem with the Arcane Tome. It gives and it takes away as we see all of that damage and value coming in and the Tunnel Drill cleaning up that second defender already. So that is a tight spot for San Vanter, possibly, because having that defender is crucial to develop the rest of the things you have or the things that you want to protect. Yeah, potentially. So the those Kikimon Stalkers are way more vulnerable right now. Yes. Now, the one thing that will he will be happy with, he gets the Arcane Tome back again and he can start setting up. He's going to get rid of both of these engines here, both of these damaging choices, simultaneously. He is in a really strong position point-wise. It's whether, for Catburger, has he got enough to resist the potential push coming through. I'm not sure how much longer he'll want to play here. And Catburger decides that, you know what, this is enough. Yeah. I was just about to mention that monsters can be really overwhelming with how quickly they get points and how big the tempo is there. And I think Catburger is quite happy with some of the things that happened yeah, in very round much one. So. Yeah, and I think it's gone the way Catburger... Well, Catburger going in with this list on red coin. He's definitely aware of what he's facing as well. And, uh, you know, the monsters... The, I don't think someone was really able to take full advantage of the blue coin in round one here. Well, he's set up from his side. He's now got two, potentially. In fact, three defenders maybe even in this situation, if he wants them, I think. He spawned one from the stratagem, played one originally, and there's still one in the Arrakis Queen. So it's going to make life pretty difficult if he ends up with three of them, because even Syndicate could struggle. Plays himself a hive mind here for even more potential carryover. Is he going to go for a long round against Syndicate, or is he going to try and bleed out some of those valuable cards? That's going to be the big choice. Yeah, definitely, because... Uh... Bleeding here could be very important, as I feel like long rounds against Syndicate can be brutal. They can be scary, and in those few seconds, the candle dropped down. <laughs> Catburger did not like that. The, the candle dropped down, and the candle got heat waved, and he was not impressed with that outcome at all. Uh, I love getting to see the players. It's brilliant that we can see their reactions live while these things are going on. I really love it. That almost feels rude now, <laughs> because you're like, I really like to see how they suffer. I, look, I said what I said. Um, you can see the play, uh, there it is, instantly. We now have had Sabbath down, two defenders and an Arrakis Queen with one in, but risk reward. The opponent now has some nice tools back too. And some very nice spenders that are crucial for Syndicate as well because you want to have 
you know, your one spender, your more expensive spender as well. And now with Kendall being gone, yeah. I bet Kent Burger is suddenly a little more happy about what's happening on the ball. Well, that's the, the, the fear. I, I remember the days when you'd see Tunnel Drill once and be terrified. Seeing it revive from the graveyard, good lord. I really feel like these masters, you know, they want us all to get, have flashbacks. Like <laughs> Masquerade Ball Tunnel Drill. Is he going for the full removal here? Yes, okay, I love this. And you might be thinking, why isn't he killing the spenders? He's used all of those charges because he's trying to remove the potential for the poison combo with Bounty there. Really, really smart line uh, from Sam Banter here, as we do see that Bounty drop down that could have instantly added a poison to the pile as well. Yeah, and we just see the tick after tick. Not quite enough coins for Cat Burger here to fully remove it. No, not enough. And the Blood Money Leader is currently at eight damage if you are trying to keep track. Remember, the Observer, of course, at home is working for those of you who are coming to us over on Twitch. Yeah, so make sure you uh, make use of that mm -hmm. and keep an eye on everything that's happening on the screen. Meanwhile, we just see Sandra, uh, you know, growing the Kikimor Stalkers, kind of just trying to set up the board and set up even more defense. Yeah, another defender popping in here after we see the consume. It might not have been the most point effective rather than a one, but it is very, very effective here in terms of that defense because there are so many to get through. Final leader charge as well. Is he now going to use these charges to start removing those spenders or possibly even the bounty engine here? Well, he doesn't have much time to do it because uh, yes. I am starting to hear the rope like slowly. I'm just being <laughs> like, okay, someone you need to start clicking if you want to be doing stuff with it. Yeah, help but us out. <laughs> so far, all the uh, not all the engines survive. Uh, but Caleb is gone, I believe. Yeah, so no way of generating additional bounties, which makes sense if you can cut the root off at source, you know? Yeah, yeah. Why cut off the rest when you just know that no more bounty is a threat anymore? Yet we see one of the defenders. We do, gone. yes, one of the defenders. And of course, now we can see as well, Ignatius Hale is at maximum value in Cat Burger's uh, deck right now, so he does have access to it if he needs for the reach right now, but I think Zambanta is really trying to push home a huge advantage here. I'm just thinking uh, about the Golden Necker, and what are the, what's the other artifact target for Cat Burger there? So he has got access to the Salamandra hideout. Yeah. Often the Golden Necker in the situation can give you like a single cycle poison removal with that because you end up giving yourself a failed experiment if you have the coins you can spend. But there's, a, there's an interesting thing here for Sanvanta. Normally you'd want your opponent's units to all be at one power, right? Mm -hmm. For your own Glusty, but leaving these damaging engines on the board is just too risky. Can't afford to do that. And you can see quite rightly, he is starting to delete as many as he can. Because obviously, a spender for Syndicate is not just a single order or a single use. Syndicate is very good at creating more Ooh. money and therefore spending it pretty quickly. However, here is the Golden Necker. It is, and Ignatius was top. So that's a big 18 points to grab, and that's a huge swing, as we see as well, expecting Oh my, he's found double poison spenders here. He doesn't have the coins for it unless he uses his leader, however. Is that going to be his choice? I believe it is as he takes both of these here. Second, they both have poisons, but neither of them can afford yeah. to move them yet. It's a scary spot for Sanvanta though now. He's looking at this and thinking, you can remove anything you like in a turn and I might never get my card back. Cat Burger doesn't have the money now, the coin, mm -hmm. but it's a big threat yes. for a uh, Sambanta and a show off. Well, I was behind, but now I am really, really close. So how much longer do you want to stay in this round? That is the question. And a point you pointed, well, something you said earlier, the uh, the risk, the, the, the tempo that Golden Neck can bring, we've just seen that in action firsthand. Syndicate's biggest problem can sometimes be it can't spend. And if you keep killing those spenders, eventually... They will be all gone and the coin has no value. Exactly. Well, currently, uh, Capoca is struggling even to get some coins. I don't think that's the issue <laughs> well, so far. The leader charge has can fix that. It's currently at nine removal. But of course, if you just kill a one power drone, you will get the excess eight coins. Yeah, but That's a that, big swing. That could be a big swing. And I'm looking at Sam Vance's hand, right? Glusty is not 
massive right now. It could be an option to deny the value for the leader, for example. But what else uh, can Sam want to play here and does he want to stay? Well, the risk here, I think, is he has to keep making sure this front row doesn't overfill itself, but because of where the uh, the Andrega Queen has been played, it constantly is filling himself. He's using charges over and over again here, trying to get as many as possible. Oh, he's removing the poison engine. That's very nice. And we've seen the Parasite, which is probably what you could play here and just see if Catburger can close that gap again or yeah. not. Because Glusty now suddenly has much be better target there. You know, a few more drones in the foresty swamp. In wherever desert, he's from. Whatever it is. And here is Mata not getting Golden Necker. Not getting Golden Necker. Oh, okay. Siri. Wait, right, that's a nice that's a nice draw for Catburger there. Not too bad. On the other side, the spores for San Vanta currently not doing a great deal. Typically against Syndicate and Spenders it might do, but not this list. There is no vice here. It's all about poison. It's all about this tech. I'd argue that's a vice, but we'll move on. And it makes sense to bring spores uh, in general to this tournament because yes. there were so many targets that can boost it. But like you said, not really here. So Samantha, mm, do you want to glasty here? Do you really? I, I, if I'm Samantha right now, I'm trying to set up as many value ones on the other side of the board. The risk, of course, is losing your own defender. He's trying to get all of these charges here. Is he going to use them to remove one of the poison threats and get some destruction? Is he going to use it to perhaps drop Roach down to one? At the moment, he's just holding off. There's so many charges here that <sighs> Catburger needs to find a way pretty quickly to, I think, to get through this because it may end up untouchable if he's not careful. But there's also so many units on the board for San Manta yeah. that those rooms are looking pretty full right now. Catburger needs a lot of points but decides to just go for Sirinova hoping that they can make it through to Realm 3 with that resilience. Makes sense here. As you see, we did get that leader charge from Catburger and it did destroy the Vran Warrior. That, of course, would have doubled the value of this potential future Glusty, which would have been very, very scary and I think would have rendered Sandbanter at 2-0. The Glusty still has the possibility of doing that here. Rusty can still happen, and uh, meanwhile, Samantha is just... Oh, boy. I think he's setting Here it up. Here it comes. Yeah. The defender is going to be in the way of this, and you can see the, the panic there. That is a ton of points right now, and while Catburger does have some toll removal, does he have enough to get through the defender first and do it again? In... yeah. I'm not sure, because uh, we oh. have more poison. Yeah, we have lots more poison in the deck, so... We do. Morale is still sat there with a Royal Decree available, so he does have two sets of poison in effectively two turns. We if I'm seen... Sanvanta, I'm gone here. Yeah, because we see a Spender come down uh, for Catburger, and Sanvanta only left with Spores. Quite sad Spores right now as well. Yeah, that, that Spores really not going to give you what you're looking for. Is he going to take the pass? Or does he feel like he's got enough in all circumstances? That's what that's the maths he's going to be doing right now. Can you get through my defender? Can you also deal? And he says, yes, yes, I can. I'm going to get rid of this extra poison. That's a huge call from Sam Vanter and could be game winning. Yeah, because that uh, engine or that spender there could be a one round, one, one round poison really quickly and it makes sense that someone just doesn't want to risk it. Yeah, he doesn't want to play with that. And now we we'll see Catburger uh, playing the Royal Decree to get one of the... Yeah, I'm thinking I morale I think here. it has to be the morale still, but he, he doesn't have enough value unless... He, he hasn't got the coins even to get through the defender organically, mm. so he will use morale to clear this up, but it, I don't think it's going to be enough here with these extra coins unless my maths is suspiciously off. And that has happened before, that's so true. Let's, you know, we need to watch what happens all the way, but you were <laughs> right, so that, you know, that even stuff, you were wrong one, now you were right. Excellent, love to see it, and that means it is 2-2, really, really, that was exactly the plan the Arrakis Swarm player wanted last time. He wanted to go for that push and then slowly get to the 2-0. A lot of people might have held off and held that spores back, but he didn't. 
the two points of value turned up to be massive because if he doesn't do it, the double poison does force a round three. Those two points made it a target, made it possible to be cleaned with the stalkers and that just meant that, you know, it's 2-2, two -two. It you is. were right. We definitely don't get to see <laughs> these heroes here. And now, from a series that looked like Cat Burger was in complete control of it, it flips. It's 2-2, two -two, one final game, which means we know both decks. Yeah. We do. And you know what, it makes sense. You guys are in the Divination Challenge, you were so close, you were 48, 52. The players said they don't feel favorite. We've seen very similar decks. This is so close. It comes down to the skill. It does. The talent. That game five. Could be both. And it was really well built from Sam Vanter. He knows that matchup well. He developed Defender, Defender, Defender. Wasn't worried about Ida at any stage, even though it's what was highlighted, because in that particular series, it made such a difference. I think earlier on, if I was Cat Burger, I think if he used his leader ability on a drone and transitioned to remove that final Defender just a little earlier, he could perhaps have escaped that round and had a chance there. Decided to just wait and wait and wait, and it didn't quite work out for him. And we'll see if maybe Spessy has something to say about this maybe. later in the analyst. I would be curious. Yes. But we'll def but now we'll see the blood money again, right? But now the blood money is coming through on blue coin here Against instead. Against Pinsa Maneuver, am I right? Yes, you are Pinsa Maneuver. Now, both of them, I think, would actually prefer to flip the coin if they could, like a gentleman's handshake on it. That can't happen, of course. The blood money sometimes can struggle on blue coin for finding proactive plays, because you've seen it likes to be quite reactive. And on the other side, while that Northern Realms list loves the round control, it can need to use the stratagem. If you if you see Curse Scroll, you often think, well, they, they definitely want to find something. There's that one card that they need, and they need it badly. But no Curse Scrolls are for Samantha this time. No, Which... but there is a Crystal Skull on the other side as we see what is being found. Well, Sam Vanta's got Renfri and also has got the Rune Mage, even the Snowdrop, so he will be happy so far on this coin. Proactivity on the other side, there is a Tunnel Drill, of course, that can be protected with the Stratagem, so not too bad. Mulliganing away those Poison Brothers, finding a Siri. Okay, and uh, let's see what Sam Vanta managed to fix, or maybe didn't. No bricks for Samantha, as far as I can see, either. Nothing that can't be fixed. Vernon Roche, <laughs> you never want in hand uh, in this series, nor the Onia, but you can mulligan them away later. The War Chariot, coming down to answer this very, very quickly, I would assume, uh, goes obviously on the melee row here with that War Chariot. Gives bleeding instead of choosing to move, which is curious, unless, of course, he is going to crew it for a little bit of both, and that is, looks like that's what he's going to do. A melee locked freak show, meaning he is useless back there. Yeah, that that is no longer doing anything for Cat Burger. I just remember, you know, the little flavor text when you're on long dick screen. You can play one card per turn. And sometimes when I see these nope. Northern Lamps plays, I'm like, oh yeah. You can play one, but many more may join the party. That was a big, big swing, Cat Burger, just then saying, I, I definitely want to be able to get out of this round safely. Has used the leader and also use the stratagem there to protect as well this Caleb Meng. So the leader ability back to one as it was a bounty unit. No more movement as leaving on the board. Caleb also, his feet is melee locked. Yeah, and we see the first bounty coming down and the tunnel drill as well. Those are some big cards from Catburger early on. They are, but he needs to keep himself with enough distance to try and get control in this. We've seen what can happen when this NR list is in charge, it can thin to its own will, even if you have a less card, as long as it gets its combo, it can absolutely blow you away. And I think he will want to encourage San Vanter perhaps not to take part in this particular incident. Yeah, Cat Burger knows how, man, how much points this uh, deck can have, and it's just trying to get as much uh, of San Vanter as early on, I guess, right? Yeah, very much so. And, uh, You'll notice the Purify was in hand. He won't be surprised that Margarita was accessible, but he has chosen instead. He uses the unlock from Kurt onto the tunnel drill, but its timer doesn't tick round in that turn because it was locked in between rounds. Instead, we get the leader ability used again 
on the purifying card as a result. Catburger sitting pretty for now. Yeah, that that's a lot of leader abilities from Syndicate early on, but uh, the beauty of this one is that it keeps coming back. So that is okay for Catburger. Meanwhile, Sam Vantel playing the rune mage, making sure that he has the choices for entry later. I see Nilgard again. Yeah, no and he's very sun. happy with this, or it looks like it. He is waiting, waiting, waiting right now to see what is coming. He is on the edge of his seat from this room mage. He was obviously expecting a something specific. He saw Nilfgaard and he was delighted with the choice. Coated weapons is removal here, which, oh, he's not, he's not so happy with that. It does give him one back though. It does, not quite one that you are Definitely finding. No, Maybe, that's yeah. true. Yeah. That's true. We'll see if Catburger gets to play that tunnel drill again or not. So, uh, Sam Banta, what do you want to do here? For the because I'm looking at the hand on air, uh, like we've said, you kind of want to keep for later. Yeah. Um, so we could see Snowdrop, but instead we see Mata from Catburger. Oh no. Ooh. Okay, so the way that's just gone there, drawing a Travelling Priestess for your opponent, especially when they're playing Sunset Wanderers, already terrible. He does only have the one leader charge left here, Sanvanta, which puts him in a spot where he has to grab, and I'm assuming now we're going to see Radovid as the choice of card here to give himself an additional set of leader abilities and extend this round a little longer. Vernon Roche could go away, the Onia could go away, uh, whatever he really decides here to shuffle. Instead, it is actually the Priestess. I assumed he would go left of the Sunset Warrior immediately, but they are jamming cards. They clearly want to uh, get themselves through here. Because the longer you have to maybe prepare for tomorrow, the better. Hey. But equally, uh, the Snowdrop could still save the Sunset Wanderers. Yeah, and the Snowdrop here would be absolutely fine. There are two cards you're happy to send back if you are Sanvanta. You can even use the leader ability if it ends up working out really badly for you to extend this. He is on red coin. Now he has the choice here of saying, you know what? I value this Sunset Wanderer so much that with the hand I have, I'm willing to pass again here. Is he gonna do that? You can see him weighing his choices up. Is, it, is he gonna give up that round control in deference to not being able to deal with Caleb Menga? No, he's not. I like this from Sam Banta. Yeah, instead it's a snowdrop, which makes sense, making sure to get those extra points, but those draws are not ideal. The, well, the thinning is great, because now, of course, you'll be able to play the one engine you have left. The fact that we did see a pairing of Caleb Meng and also, I change how I pronounce his name every time you'll notice, and Hysteria removing that extra Radovid charge on red coin, being able to find exactly what you want is a little bit more awkward. And if that Radovid does go, it's not what you're looking to see. So Sanvanta has to be very careful with his choice of leaders. Because yeah, Norgenum is very used to drawing exactly what they need at the right time. So suddenly not having access to that can be difficult. It and we can. see, the, like you said, the last engine that could be played with oh, the thinning. nice pull though, the Renfrew's Another gang. thinning and another thinning. Yeah, yeah, it starts thinning and thinning and thinning. The, the thing San Vanta won't be happy about here, he only has one leader charge currently, or one set of cycles really on the Travelling Priestess. One leader charge left, which means there's only three charges on one of them and none on the other so far. Oh well, the, the uh, Travelling Priestess, that otherwise is a lot of points, could be a little less, but I, I, that doesn't feel right to say with those cards, honestly. True. Traveling Chris, yeah, no. No. And actually, no, I can't say that. No, no. Uh, <laughs> the pass here from Katberger, he did have, of course, the Siri to play, so it's a little different being a card down if you can leave an eight power unit on the board in between those rounds, you have a good chance of catching up. Sam Banta weighing up the choices again. Of course, he is going nowhere. He says, don't be silly. I will play and I will play. Grabs himself an Istrid, which is a really nice paired combo. Fully expect to see the Onia disappear and the Renfri's gang jump out to really hammer the additional uh, gap between these two. Just a little extra thinning after all the thing before. <gasps> Ketberger now plays the Golden Necker. He does. He really wants this round control. He understands how problematic it is if he doesn't find it. Gets the second tunnel drill. That's why I was thinking. I was like, we've seen this card before. Yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> and back. It is back. So it's tunnel drill. It's Kendall. 
Wow, that's uh, suddenly looking much better for Catburger. It is. There's a lot of points here as we see spending to protect and just. He doesn't, he, is he going to get ahead with a single point? His leader ability is only two damage, not three. So is he just going to spend the solitary coin here? And he could, but he decides to use the leader. Ooh, okay. Not spend, so Catburger is now ahead. San Vanta, um... Hmm, Sansa Wonder is right oh. on the edge. Now, here's, it's a difficult spot because we know he has the Istrid and the pairing there normally is to give even more points to your Snowdrop. But she is currently sat with Poison and a Morale on the board, so are you delaying the inevitable if you're San Vanta or are you trying to hold on to him because the shuffles are going to be more valuable at finding your Priestesses in that round too? It's a really, really strong, long round one here. Not a surprise with the lists we've seen. No, definitely no. And it makes sense that the players are taking their time now, deciding every move as well. And we see rent free. Yeah, Sam Banta using the last piece of his arsenal for the amount of points he's got, even likely to see Sunset Wanderer jump out here. He's decided he's gonna lock in at Cat Burger and potentially try and 2-0. We even got Curse of Wrath, the six damage, and every time he passes, the lowest power unit will get four as well. Cat Burger has to watch out for that because he might just be stuck here. Oh yeah, and the passive of, from Renfrey when you pass, that can really sneak up on it you. It can. Because it's, it's, the lead is changing midway through the round, and so Cat Burger really needs to keep an eye on it, decides to leave. Mm. Samantha, happy with that committed a lot. Yeah. Both of them did. They did. Now, Catburger here losing the round on even. Probably one of your worst case scenarios as this list, because now he's in a pretty vulnerable spot. But he does have that eight power Siri to help defend where he's going. He was doing the math there briefly. Did he have enough to catch if he used both cards and all the coins? He didn't. I think he was at least three or four short, because um, he would happily have committed both if he could, I think, in order to get at least the victory in the round. For him, it didn't happen. Now he's got to try and defend this. Okay, so San Vanta, five cards left in the deck. We know, I at least know two of them for sure, you know, uh, four of them, Onyas and Priestesses. Yeah. And the last one is the Witcher, makes sense. So basically, the dream oh. for San Vanta, right? Well, it would be, but again, he has played these cards and he still hasn't found the Priestesses. So there's lots of playing and lots of clicking but he's just not finding priestesses. This is the first time this priestess has been in his hand. It does get mulliganed away, meaning it finally has zeal, but it has just three charges. So all of the benefit that you would expect from it might not be there in the way you're used to. But they haven't been traveling as much as we usually see them. No, they travel. stayed home. Yeah, the, the, these priestesses are... They couldn't the make weekend. the watch party, yeah, It's you the know? weekend, it's snowing outside. So let's see, Catburger has poisoned and, he's, and one more special left. He candle does. as a spender, and that's it. No more spenders. No more spenders. The candle will survive this round, but not next. Sam Banter's got a really tricky choice right now. Normally, and he has chosen to play the mentor. I'm not, with five cards left, he has to see the priestesses when he does this or he's gonna be devastated. That is not good. And you can see the little smile. He could have held off and waited here. He could have waited to see and guarantee it, not shorten the round as much and left both of them in the deck, guaranteeing they would have found a shuffle back for the Vernon Roche. Hasn't done that here. And now this is really interesting because there are gonna be very few charges on them. He might be in his dream spot, but is it gonna be enough? He does get a big commit from Catburger in the, in the process though. And you, you're asking if it's gonna be enough, but I'm really worried that uh, the priestesses will still surprise us with, you know, it, you never know. You, you they, do, they, you're right, you never know. We have seen the place and just how many points they can be, because it's not just the priestess, the other engine that go with them as well. Wow. But we'll see shortly. Okay, well he does draw the buffed one, so that's already a bonus for him. That's a free shuffle back. She is now extra and another free shuffle back here as well. So he will be happy with that, of course, he does have the Tridums and the Onias, so no matter how few, well, you know what, they, yeah, they, they get doubled or tripled. If they can survive, that's the big thing. Yeah, because we see, oh, just three, four or five charges, but 
Well, Catberg Look at is not... the rest of the hand. Oh, and San Vanter, this is really, really sharp from San Vanter here because, of course, the travelling priestesses have Veil. So what are you going to do with them as a bounty poison deck? Not a lot because you can only have one damage here and the fact that he can just sit that on the board right now and not do much with it, those bounties rendered useless in this spot. So we have seen the leader quite a few times from Catburger. So it's not doing what it could have been if it was a little used a little differently. So both of the priestesses are staying. They are. Now the big question is, what is going to be the more valuable removal? There is a bounty and you can see Catburger is devastated here. He will remove whatever unit hits next. Will Sam Vanter greed for that big finish? Or will he uh, use the charges imminently? I expect him to greed here. And that could, yeah, because you could either set it all up and then do the clicks or immediately spend and get as many points as possible knowing or thinking that there's a removal waiting for whatever you drop. Yes. This... I'm, I can, we can see the hovering. I bet someone is thinking the same thing. How many points do I need and how many... Is there a chance that the car will still arrive, try them, will make it through? We see one click and the rope is closed. It is, and he chooses instead to buff the other priestess just one time. And Catburger not taking any chances. He's saying whichever engine that I get to get rid of reduces the value of these imminently. He's ahead by 15. The leader ability is now worth two, I believe but there's not much left for him because the bleeding is effectively useless here. And Samvanta again decides to greet, says, well, I'll, I have one more, so I will wait. What can you do? And oh, wow, he is staring down the barrel of this and you can see Samvanta starting to breathe, starting to think this could be his time because there is no other spender for Catburger here. Is there a player disconnect? No, it's the okay. Yeah, it's there okay? was briefly, but yeah. it's okay. They're still there. As we see, he has got nine coins. Those nine coins worth a solitary point. And he's clicking the whole way down here. I don't think it's going to be enough, though. There's a hope in that clicking, you know. So maybe if I click a little more, but I oh, this think... Is still, this is going to be so, so close here. So we now will see the other one here oh. coming down and all of the charges on the priestess is spent, and I don't think it's gonna be that close. No, it's not, because of course both Oni is there, and of course the Renfri as well, as we know now, the next semi-finalist confirmed, it's Sam Vanta. Sam Vanta is up on the winner screen, I think it's just sinking in that it is really <laughs> happening tomorrow as well. That is the picture of calmness there, it takes a, a final deep breath, and he is now through. That is, it was an incredible series. Yes. Wow. It, we've seen some interesting mirrors, <laughs> some place that we really wouldn't think would there, would, there would be. I know, you know what? We missed the Nilfgaard Schengens, but we, we've seen enough of them. We <laughs> did get plenty. That final series there, you could see a, the, the draws not perfect all the way through in that final game, but immaculate at the end. The traveling priestess, she traveled when she needed to. You know, we were like, oh, maybe it's not enough little charges, but it ended up being just enough. It did. The veil there really hurting Bounty. Not ideal for either of them, but it did end up working out in the end. What a fantastic series. Sad for Catburger. Neither player, of course, was felt they were super favoured and it was really tight. One of the tightest series it we've was. seen. It was very similar, a line up, very tight. And you guys, you know, only 2% of you True. in the Divination Challenge. No, no difference this there. This close. It very, was this very close. close. Oh, and wow. So we will shortly uh, discuss a little more about, you know, what's happening next. We'll have a look at all the stuff, but Sam Vanter is through. Sam Vanter has made it through. That means Catburger goes home. It was honestly, that I think my favorite series, the favorite matchup from that, the Arrakis Mirror, just getting to experience that, both players taking that final tie over the course of it. Wow. Yeah. It, it's it, it's interesting to see again the choices that players make yeah. when they're uh, faced with a decision or faced with a situation that's maybe not as common. Yeah, so, like you've said, defenders instead of Idus. I was, I wanted to see the Idus fan, but you know, yeah, you know I'll, I'll take it. But it wasn't the right way to play it. They played perfectly for what they had available. Came down to it. Bounty had both successes and failures, 
but in the end could not quite get it through. It was a list I was really excited to see. It just couldn't get through those traveling priestesses. And I feel like even last weekend when we were casting Syndicate, doesn't perform, even it's, though we're all like, yeah. it's a, we're all afraid of it. It's like a syndicate, you know, all those coins, all the removal, and then sometimes it just doesn't do the job. I know, well, it seems, you know, it, it, we it couldn't quite make it. It wasn't the list I thought that would struggle here, but in that lineup, Veil ended up being its absolute worst nightmare. And it makes sense, you know, Bumpty, Poison and Well, I don't think that mixes up really well. Uh, <laughs> I that, did that accidentally rhyme? I think I did that. Yeah, I think so, job, I think so. We'll take it. We'll, <laughs> we'll take, take it right. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. What, that's an incredible series. And we've already had two very different series over the course of today, right? Yes. The first one, crazy ending. This one going all the way down to the final part of Game 5 as well. And I think that's our that's our <laughs> fate here. We'll be here at 2 a.m. casting. Of course. Uh, you know, you, don't worry, we have you secured with the card back. Exactly. We're doing our very best. Don't forget to redeem those drops because I'm sure if we keep having five game series you might even get it all on day one we've been there right mm, we've been there yeah <laughs> and I'm, I'm also thinking if you guys you know are clipping and looking at maybe the players reaction you've said it's amazing to see them mm -hmm. remember to use the hashtag what masters we want to see your creations some of the emotes that have been created from us before are They're still amazing. with us yeah Very so we much want so. to see more you know we do and obviously Sam Vanter there you saw his winner's reaction could just a We've, we've had various over the course of uh, our tournament history, I think it's fair to say. That was possibly the most calm and collected I've ever experienced. It was very put together, just like, yeah. Mm. I we, had this plan, that's all good. Oh, I always had it, you know, I yeah. always had it. He was uh, pleasant enough when we uh, chatted in the advance, but calm, both players had to do that magnificently well. Will he be as calm, though? when he has to face Magpie in the first semi-final tomorrow? That's the question, because that is no mean feat. One of the best, longest standing players in Gwent history. And we get to hear more from Sanvanta. Excellent. And how he feels about the victory. I believe Ryan is taking us to the interview right now. Yes, congratulations Sanvanta on that incredible victory. You made it in your first official Gwent tournament two day two. And uh, to make sure that this inter interview goes smoothly, we've actually got Vlad, our game director, translating for us. So, first of all, how do you feel after that victory, making it two day two in your first tournament? Сердечное поздравление тебе с победой в первом дне турнира. Твой первый большой официальный турнир и такой впечатляющий результат. Я буду помогать с переводом. И первый вопрос, который мы тебе задаем, это как твои ощущения в связи с этой победой? Если честно, я думал, что я проиграю, когда я не закрыл монстру. Потому что когда мы тренировались, тренировались с Дорой, там практически невозможно было победить. Uh, monsters, so uh, it was a surprise. Ah, good to hear. I think uh, that uh, makes the victory even sweeter if you don't expect it. Um, all right, now then you made it today too, so that means you're going to be facing Magpie in the semi-finals. Uh, have you taken a look at his list yet? Do you think you've got a chance against the previous challenger winner, Magpie, or uh, do you think it might actually be uh, quite an easy stomp for you? So, any thoughts on that matchup? Итак, ты прошел второй день, и ты будешь играть против Мэкпая. А какие твои мысли по этому поводу? Что ты думаешь по поводу его линейки дек, которую он взял? Ну и вообще по поводу Мэкпая как игрока? Ну, Мэкпай хороший игрок, но он умеет исполнять. Мачап у меня хороший и больше шансов, чем у Кетбургера, если бы он прошел. Mm -hmm. uh, so I respect Мэкпай as a strong player. Uh, but I also feel confident uh, in my lineup. I feel that I have a, a strong matchup against Magpie, and actually a better matchup uh, than uh, Catburger would have if he would advance to play against Magpie. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. One question, though, before I let you go. The chat, the casters, and me, we've all been dying to ask, what is that behind you in the aquarium? Is there any animal in there? 
Ну и последний вопрос. Кто живет в своем аквариуме, который за тобой находится? Ну, там всякие существа живут. Я их заношу с разных мест. Всякие рептилии? Нет, обычные рыбки. А рыбки? Mm-hmm. Okay, so there are various uh, fishes there. So it's a fish, uh, fish tank, fish aquarium. All right. Thank you so much for taking the time for this interview and good luck tomorrow in your next series. Get some rest now and uh, we'll actually be diving into the analysis of this amazing victory. Uh, and it's going to be Joe Curley now with curly hair taking it away. Yes, thank you, Ryan. What an exciting series. We've got five games to get through. Cast your mind back to when the series was 0-0. We saw Katberger win round one with their AQ deck. They set up these I, the EDs or IDR in the back row. But if you just look at the card quality in this hand, Katberger's pushing for the 2-0 and they end up losing this game in round three. They end up playing one more bronze out and then passing round two and then just getting destroyed in round three and really this is just a moment where Katberger just needed to draw a lot better that's really what this game came down to they ended up being forced into taking a pass and unfortunately for them they just weren't able to come out on top in round three so they went for the the 2-0 push they had all sorts of amazing engines on board but just not quite those big payoff cards like Glusty and things like that so moving on to the second game It was really a story of Katberger's Scoia'tael deck with Milva controlling the board. Uh, Savantar's Northern Realms deck, of course, has lots of engines and lots of cards which want to be sticking on the board. And you can just see with Milva coming in here, this was the theme of round one. Katberger just continuing to control the game with Milva, and that gave them round control. And then what ended up happening in this game is um, there was a forfeit when this Vernon Roach was played. And not a single traveling priestess was found. And that just meant that Savantar wasn't going to have, have enough answers. And you can even see Milva continuing to pop off and put in some serious work. Savantar slams down the Vernon Roach. They also have the option to uh, potentially thin the deck with Renfrey as well by one extra card. They didn't decide to do that. Maybe that could have made a slight difference. Uh, so that was 1-1 in the series. Moving on to the third series, the third game in the series. This was a fascinating one. We saw the Arrakis Swarm Mirror, and it's something that as casters we weren't necessarily expecting to see. And I was actually sat watching this one with Shane Miri, and we were discussing, like, who's going to have the advantage here? And we saw the early Glossy came down from Savantar. Savantar went first. They were able to develop their engines. They got that Glossy down first to control the board. But what ended up happening, and Catburger was quite surprised when this, when this came through, uh, Catburger with Lasse was able to get really good spores value. And the final Glossy was just an absolute annihilation on, on the, the side of Savantar with these... Charge is just being able to line everything up. Of course, if you're able to kill your opponent's drones, not only are you removing them from the board, but your Glusty's also getting the points. It was just a humongous play, and Katberger uh, pulled this one off masterfully. But game four. Game four was the most interesting one of the series for me. And as soon as I saw this play in round number one, because that's where the magic really happened, I instantly loved it. Savantar didn't have the ideal hand. With an Araka screen deck, what you're looking to be doing is using the Urn of Shadow stratagem to get a bunch of carryover, uh, get these IDRs usually in your graveyard, and then you can in round two play Sabbath to pull them back out. Instead though, um, there wasn't access to uh, the Araka screen and the IDR, but there was access to the Defender. And we saw the Arrakis Queen used on the Defender, and these Defenders were an absolute menace for Catburger to deal with. If we fast forward, a little bit further on into round two, uh, this is where you really see the value of this play because you don't necessarily see it instantly. But in round two, you can see um, Savanta had a defender. This was, I think, his third or fourth defender of the round because two came back off the Sabbath and then they were able to destroy their own record screen to get another defender. These defenders were just protecting all of Savantar's engines and then Savantar was able to just continue to remove all of the damage cards from Catburger and this was what allowed Savantar to pull off what I thought was quite a surprising 2-0. The final game I don't think was quite as interesting but we will still, will still take a look at it and I think really what I wanted to draw attention to in this one is just the power of Sunset Wanderers. Catburger was fighting to win round one and Savantar to just have the Sunset Wanderers to just drop down and 
enter and hit the board whenever they wanted to win the round on even. Not only uh, did they win the round on even, but Catboga also just didn't get much coin carryover. And then, of course, the round three. I, I think I've undersold it. I forgot how exciting the round three was because we saw this pass. The Vernon Roach then the opening play, the double traveling priestess and the veil on these cards just absolutely popping off because the execution up is dealing damage to the cards of bounty and it's bleeding. And of course, these priestesses are unable to do anything. And in, on a ladder game, you wouldn't necessarily feel confident enough to just be leaving these priestesses on the board because even something simple like a bloody good fun would be able to clean these up and could have turned the tide on the game. But in an open deck list, Savanta was confident that there was no answer to them. They were just able to float them on the board. And then, of course, we saw the Travelling Priestesses really come through right at the end for just a whole bunch of points. That six bleed, not the best way to be spending your... It could have been nine bleed, not the best way to be spending your coins. And that was Savanta wrapping up the series, getting that 3-2 victory. And I'm very much excited to see their game against Magpie tomorrow. But we now can take a look at the updated bracket with your casters, Aria and Lionel. And we are here with the bracket. It's really amazing to see the whole like recap of the series from Spessy. Really, thank you for that. And the bracket's looking fuller. Yeah, it is indeed. You can see Sam Vanter has progressed now and that first semi-final is locked in. It is Magpie v Sam Vanter. Tomorrow, that is your first series. But don't worry, there is still a lot more Gwent to come today, right? Definitely. So much more. Yes, went. there is. A lot more coming. And I'm excited for the remaining two series. And you know, it's ah, oh, it's just so good. There's so much Gwent to come. But what is that prize pool looking like? That's what I want to see. The players now, they have played through their series and we can see for every match you win, you get a little bit more money. Yeah. And so Magpie, for example, going uh, winning 1-3-1, one, one, it has earned more than Samantha in the nail biter that we just witnessed. Yes, he did. But overall, our uh, contestants are dividing $42,500 between them, so which is significant. It is. It's a lot of money. And of course, every time you play, every game you win, you can earn a little bit more. The players that have already lost aren't going home empty-handed. Cat Burger taking home $1,800. But those players heading through to tomorrow have an even bigger chance of finding some more, right? There's a lot of money on the line With here. With some bonuses for the winners, stuff like a that. So that huge bonus for the winners. Can't wait to see that tomorrow. But we are still here today. Yes. Two more series to go. We will soon say goodbye to you and uh, our beautiful, wonderful colleagues, Shin and Seely, to take you through Series 3. Uh, before that, however... This, well, there's, uh, there, there is that series still to come. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot more to see. You know, we've got a lot of uh, yeah. potential Gwent in the future. And yeah, we're coming back for well, Series uh, 4. That's, the, that's what I wanted to say. Course. kind of forgot because I was just like, oh yeah, Shin, Seely. Coming out, that will be good. <laughs> yeah, that that is still a potential. That is still coming up. The uh, that fourth series, I'm very excited about. Right? Yeah, because we haven't seen those players yet. No, we have but, not. Yeah. Let's not skip forward too much, right? No. Um, we are here right now with two series down. We know who's coming to the semi-finals. We do that first semi-final anyway. The second one is mm -hmm. still ready to mm -hmm. go. It and. Is. Well, we are here in Warsaw, we've already said that, but I'm so excited about it that we will keep repeating, Chad. Yes, we um, will. It is, uh, that is us for the first series though, mm -hmm. and it is goodbye from us for now, but we are not sending you straight over to those next guests, because Bourja is standing by, there have been a few surprises, and here's another one for you. Some people predicted this in chat. We actually have Tailbot, Tailgot, Tailpipes, Tobliat. There's so many names to, to, to name this one wonderful, huge human being. Uh, my most memorable moment is touching his bicep in one of the events, but he's here with us. How are you doing, man? Uh, hey, Buja. Yeah, <laughs> it's great to be back. I'm doing great. Yeah, I'm chilling. Life is good. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not playing any other games, like Gwent was, nothing was better than Gwent, the best game ever, yes. you heard it here. That's it? Yeah, that's it. What's your most memorable moment from Gwent? Uh, Apart I've, from winning with everybody and doing awesome interviews. Uh, no, definitely not interviews, <laughs> I hate interviews. 
it was yeah I think it has to be winning challenger free yeah. yeah that was my biggest yeah. tournament win so I have to pick this uh, but it's even easier to pick the worst moment I think like losing 3-0 to life coach or to masters I remember yeah, that one that was unfortunately yeah the most memorable for me <laughs> and the worst <laughs> at the same time so what have you been up to right now? Uh, I, I heard someone told me somewhere, or uh, maybe I found it while I was scrolling, the uh, famous thing that kids use now, which is TikTok, and uh, you're a TikTok star, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yes, I'm on TikTok. I have a TikTok account with my girlfriend. Uh, it wasn't my idea, <laughs> it was her idea. But yeah, like everyone can check it out. Uh, where, where can they find you? Uh, on TikTok, it's Sasha and Damian, and I don't recommend it to to watch watch it because it's very cringe. But, but it's you, good cringe. Yeah, but I if you it. want to, yeah, just go leave a follow. No. I mean, you have 70k followers on that thing. That means it's it's good content, man. I guess so. Yeah, perfect. Um, you're here in Warsaw. Uh, you're here with us uh, at the watch party. It's awesome to have everyone here. Um, when you were talking to the people, what's the what's the vibe in the studio right now? Mm, right now, it's, yeah, it's nice. It brings back memories, all the memories from the tournaments yeah. when we used to have them, you know, in person, like here. Yeah, yeah, in the studio. It's nice. Yeah, it's it's we great. We had a table here when we're staring, standing yeah, in like as we're playing. Here, together. like yeah, we used to play in this place. So. Yeah. Very, very, very nice. Yeah, yeah, brings back the memories for sure. Mm -hmm. Awesome, man. I think that's it. Uh, I don't want uh, to take more of your time. Enjoy, um, and then we'll meet the next new players, and we'll have the brackets, and then we'll be back with uh, our, our next pair of casters, which is Sealy and Shinmiri. So yeah, let's 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 cue the player interviews.是来自中国的旧我最喜欢的昆特时刻是玩抽象北的时候用欧菲尔双人将对方卡组的大金换到我的卡组的时候我这次对手是来自日本的基王他总是能创造出一些让人意想不到的卡组在集中赛的时候就
here to cast the third quarterfinal of the day. It's going to be between Joe and Miamon. How are you doing, Celie? I'm doing great. What a wonderful series we just got to watch and what wonderful series we have coming up and going forward. Uh, so let's take a look at the Divination Challenge. Then what do you guys think? Will, who will be favored between Joe and Miamon? So these two players, both from Asia, Joe hailing from China, mm -hmm. Miamon from Japan. Miamon has been a veteran of the game. A really long time competitor and streamer. Everybody loves Miamon. I do think so. I am going to uh, go out on a limb here and say that the divination uh, probably does reflect that the divination result. However, we have again, this storyline is back. Uh, Joe is kind of the challenger here, a newer name perhaps in the Gwent Pro scene. Uh, but I mean, one wonderfully great player because otherwise he would not have made it this far. And I cannot wait to see what Joe has planned for the series as well as me on, of course. Yes, Joe is the underdog here, only getting 25% of your divination votes, but he has proven himself a really strong player in the group stage as well as in qualifiers earlier this year. Miyamon, on the other hand, renowned deck builder and pilot, uh, always brings the most unique meta-breaking type of decks that nobody else seems to play. Absolutely, and speaking of those spicy, spicy deck lists, let's take a look at what the players are going to be bringing to the party. Of course, Joe will be starting on blue coin, so here are uh, Joe's deck lists first. We have Imposter, Masquerade Ball, Overwhelming Hunger, Dagon, Aaron Doubt, uh, Erendite Shenanigans, and Pinsir, Maneuver, Erland, uh, as well as Guerrilla Tactics, Shiru. That's right. Let's start with the Nilfgaard list. This is uh, an engine-heavy list that's aiming to poison and lock everything there is in sight. That is right. Uh, if these engines go unchecked, they can cause a lot of damage uh, from Imposter. And uh, yeah, we'll take a look at Miamon's lineup and see if there is uh, these control options there. But uh, on to the next one, which is Overwhelming Hunger. Uh, and this deck revolves around growing your Erendite and playing big temple plays in round one together with that Brewer's Ritual. And of course, the star of this deck really is Dagon Promised. Let's take a look at this card. Shinmari, what do you think? Why is this deck so powerful or this card so powerful in this deck? Yeah, this this card, again, played in uh, first form more often in this deck than the second form because it gives you so much carryover. Similar to the Taurus that we were talking about in the first quarter finals, uh, first form Dagon gives you Five, infuses five units with this death wish that uh, gives them additional two points when they're killed and when and when you uh, trigger those death wishes four out of those five death wishes Dagon promised is going to come resurrect himself from the graveyard come back give you another eight points an engine and an extra consume Exactly, and Dagon does have a second form, but it is far less common because it has to survive for a couple of turns, and that is not often going to happen uh, whenever there is something that can deal with the Dagon. But if you really want to greet it out, I think you could play Dagon for its second form, but uh, I think we are very likely to see the first form with all of those sweet infusions. Yes, yeah, so overall, this Death Wish monster deck looking to uh, have a balanced uh, number of uh, things to consume as well as consumers to uh, trigger those Death Wishes. Exactly, and moving on to the next deck, which is Pinsir Maneuver Erland. Now, we are no strangers to this deck in particular, but there is a different card in here, and that is the Heat Wave. That is that control option. But of course, you do have to sacrifice something, and that something is Rodea in this specific deck. And we do know that Rodea is quite nice. It is quite flexible of a card, especially after that Rune Mage comes down. But here, Joe is really saying that this Heat Wave is a value card and needs to be able to remove uh, the biggest threats here as uh, the pattern repeats, so to speak, in three of uh, four of Joe's decks. Yes, Joe, uh, and last but not least, Joe has the Guerrilla Tactics Shiru Milva deck. Um, this deck, we've seen a, a lot of players like bringing this deck because of its flexibility, because of its control. Um, the Shiru always a massive threat, and one card 
in this deck that uh, really enables that Shiru is the Mahakam Pass. Now this is a relatively new card. Let's take a look at what exactly Mahakam Pass does. Yes, beautiful card. It does have the resilience and does create a dwarf, uh, turning the armor into points depending on what options you get on the create. Can synergize well with Dennis and of course uh, moves on to different rounds. So that order ability of boost by four you can hold on to and apply that to Shiru so that the Shiro can actually be a threat to some very, very tall uh, units as well. Exactly. There's um, there's Violet Forbidden Knowledge that boosts by four, Mahakam Pass that can boost by five, your leader abilities that boost by three each, and then uh, there's an offering that can boost by two. So with all of these combinations, there's a lot of um, different different levels of Shiru scorching, Shiru burning the battlefield that your opponent has to really worry about. And that's why a lot of decks don't like going into a long round against this. Oh yeah, very, very scary deck, of course. Um, but that's the lineup. So let's take a look at uh, what Joe is going up against, which is Miamon. And we can expect that the decks are juicy. Here they are. Of course, they were played the previous weekend, but we all need a good refresher here because there's a lot going on as per <laughs> usual with Miyamon's list. We have Toussaint Hospitality, we have Inspired Zeal Reavers, we have Off the Book Syndicate, which is kind of the more uh, standard list, I would say, mm -hmm. here uh, out of the bunch. And then, of course, Ursine Ritual Self Wound, but a version that uh, relies a little bit differently on some thinning tools. But yeah, let's dig into this Toussaint Hospitality and uh, all the cards here. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, where do I even start? Okay, first of all, it's a Golden Necker deck. But not just a Golden Necker deck, it's a double Golden Necker deck. Some might even say triple because of the Alyssa and the Asir. Um, I think we did the math on the thinning. If you go for a triple Golden Necker, you are gonna over thin if there's a three if it's a three round game. But if it's a if you're going for a 2-0, maybe there's the possibility of just triple Golden Necker in a 2-0 because you haven't drawn those three extra cards in round three. But I think the standard game plan is to maybe use one of the Alyssa or the Seer on Golden Necker and another on um, something that you just want to play twice. Maybe it's Arturis Vigo, maybe it's Vilgefortz. But anyways, the star of this <laughs> deck, though, is the Master of Puppets. This whole deck revolves around this card. Uh, what exactly does it do, Zui? All right, Master of Puppets has an order ability and it seizes a bronze enemy unit and then moves itself to the op opposite row. So Miamon essentially is going to play these in combination with the Petris filter, which makes Golden Necker really a phenomenal option for Miamon to go for because you can potentially pull out a Petris filter, get zeal on your Master of Puppets, and then seize a bronze card that you have boosted with Boohoots, with Toussaint Dua Hospitality, um, the Boohoots from there as well. So so really, you can boost your opponent's bronzes and then steal them for yourself, resulting in these really insane point swings and, and really, really like, you can get a 60 point swing easily with this deck. So uh, I'm really keen on seeing how Miyamon is going to play this one out. But you might run into a little bit of trouble if there are no bronzes to steal because of course, Master of Puppets is limited to those bronzes. You cannot steal a gold card from your opponent. Right, but this deck, it not only plays the two Master of Puppets in its starting deck, but it also has Arturis Vigo that will guarantee get you a one power Master of Puppet, which is even better because you're that's the power that's going to end up on your opponent's side of the board. And then there is the Illusionist, that if you were able to click one of the Master of Puppets in a previous round, it'll end up in your opponent's graveyard, and then the Illusionist can target it to get you a, a Master of Puppet there as well. All right, and then we have the Inspired Zeal list, which is a Reaver Hunter deck. And usually we're used to seeing Reaver Hunters using a different leader, which is Mobilization. However, Miamon is opting to go for the Inspired Zeal, again, kind of similar to the Petri's Filter, valuing the instant proc and utilizing these Reaver Scouts is especially in this deck in pretty creative ways. Not only do you get Reaver Hunters, but you can use this on uh, other bronze soldiers in the deck, which makes it quite flexible after all. Yeah, Reaver Scout is a super flexible card in this deck. Uh, you've got, of course, Reaver Hunters, you've got Lyrian Arbalist that you can copy for engines and uh, damage. You have the uh, Lyrian Lonsknecht, I hope I'm saying that right, for uh, 
maybe like a finisher tempo, and then of course the Sintrian Royal Guards in this deck, which is a very, very uh, powerful finisher if you can get a lot of them. And you've got Idaran to maybe get extra copies, and uh, the Order from the Reaver Scout is also your number one target on Flotsam. Uh, Flotsam's Order, which resets a bronze unit's order and gives it zeal. Yes, quite the deck, Miamon uh, could be playing this quite aggressively because round control becomes quite valuable when you're uh, piloting a deck like this. Now, let's take a look at the off the books. Of course, we have seen this before. There are no strange things happening here, but just keep in mind that the vice keyword is really the important part and all that sweet, sweet coin carry over from Syndicate and Open Sesame set up in the graveyard and then Ixora and Acheronthia then can utilize this coin setup really beautifully uh, and uh, again, contribute to some pretty pretty strong plays. Multiple cards being played a turn from the Acheronthia, for example. That's right, and finally, Miemon has his own variation of Ursine Ritual Self-Wound. Uh, he's for, uh, decided to forego the Oniromancy, the standard consistency tool, and just put in more power, more thinning from things that actually get you points, like Portal and Tempest, but that uh, can be risky if you don't draw those thinning cards early. Sometimes you have to risk it for the biscuit, and that is what Miamon is saying here. Um, some really beautiful lists from both players. Again, we kind of see this more point slam heavy strategy from Miamon, but unlike Magpie, who had a similar idea, uh, this deck is more engine based, more engine heavy with those Reaver Scouts, uh, with the Reaver Hunters, as well as these uh, Master of Puppets going back and forth potentially. So, yeah, really, really cool decks that we will be seeing but yeah what about uh, Joe's strategy then? Joe's strategy because uh, Miamon of course is going for the more point slimy but Joe has some heat waves in there right? Yes Joe has a couple of heat waves he's got uh um, a lot more control I would say than Miamon with the guerrilla tactics deck Sh uh, the shoop Erlen deck can also muster up quite a few control tools, especially because it's got that heat wave in there as well. And so let's take a look at the bands between Joe and Miamon. What do we got? Here they are. We have Nilfgaard Imposter Band from Miamon to Joe, meaning Joe is not allowed to play the ball deck, which is, yeah, a little bit sad to see as a caster because that's a really interesting deck, I think, in Joe's lineup. But of course, Miamon does see the threat here. There's not much Miamon can control with his lineup. And on the other hand, Joe's uh, imposter can control some of Miamon's strategies. So that is the band that Miamon wants to take. And for Miamon, he cannot play uh, Skelliget Self Wound. That's right. So we have our bands. It's going to be uh, Dagon Deathwish and Pincer Maneuver Shoop Erland, Gorilla Tactics Shiru Milva for Joe versus uh, three really threatening engine decks. All three of uh, Miamon's decks left that are unbanned are really scary. You've got the Master of Puppets Overload, you've got Reaver Hunter Overload, and then of course the Vice Engines from Syndicate. Exactly. And we do know the coins. Joe, of course, is going on blue coin. Miamon responding with red. Let's see what the cues are going to be in this series specifically. Um, yeah. Joe, starting off with that blue coin, do you have any thoughts of what we might be seeing? Uh, yeah, I think um, for Joe's decks, the Monster's Death Wish deck is probably the most reserved for blue coin type of deck because it really wants to use that monster stratagem on the Brewist Ritual to thin out two extra Death Wish cards, not only giving the deck a lot more consistency, but extra tempo in round one to make sure you grow that Arendite and then increase your chances of winning round one and getting round control that way. So I kind of expect to see the Death Wish deck first. Um, that's That would be the obvious choice from Joe's lineup, so uh, Miamon might take that into account when he decides to, what deck he wants to queue on red in game number one. It could be uh, the Master of Puppets deck because <laughs> yeah. Death Wish is gonna have quite a few tall bronze units, right? Every time you use your leader, you're getting a bronze Ekimara that is pretty tall. Um, those those uh, giant toads that automatically consume your Death Wish cards from the graveyard, those are also good bronze cards that, that are tall, uh, but Joe might be able to do something sneaky like... I, I know what that oh, sneaky yeah. might be. There is a secret card, you know, um, Kieran 
is in there. That's Karen right. can eat the bronzes and then deny the master of puppets. But of course, Myanmar has a couple, as mentioned by Shinbury, can create up to four master of puppets uh, that will be played. So, I mean, some of them would get value, right? <laughs> yeah, on, on the other hand, like, Reaver Scout uh, Reaver Hunter spam from Eamon would also be uh, strong against Deathwish because Deathwish, it has a couple of control tools, but most of its control tools are looking to kill like one unit at a time, right? Whereas Reaver Hunters, you're going to have too many to do with. And here we are, yep. game number one of quarterfinal three between Joe and Miamon. Let's go. I am so excited for this. We can see Joe is bringing Scoia'tael here on blue coin, which is not necessarily the obvious choice. Usually a deck very dedicated to red coin. So definitely might be that we see some mind games going on here. Miamon, on the other hand, has brought off the books. So also, just like Shin Marie said, is not going for the obvious red coin or, or the kind of priority red coin deck mm -hmm. here, but rather play Syndicate, which is of course flexible. Uh, and it seems like both players are kind of trying to trying play to a little bit of mind games here. here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Joe opening with the Swordmaster. Uh, I think Joe might be the one uh, Shiru player playing Swordmaster in his list. So let's see if it can have any sort of special effect here, but that's in the place of usually like a Berserker or a Pyrotech. Yeah, that's right. We've seen a couple of different variations. I think last weekend we even saw Oak Critters, <laughs> oh, yeah. which I thought was quite fun. <laughs> and you can see already the Shiru deck struggling a little bit with proactivity. Joe has to play that uh, the Witcher Saboteur um, on his second turn with nothing to hit because Miamon has been able to stay unitless for his first couple turns. That's right, and it's still going. Of course, Redanian was brought out by the nine coins in the bank. And here is Moral finishing up the poison here on the engine currently on the board. Maybe saying that oh, it's nice to have Moral on the board if it sticks. Uh, and if it doesn't, it doesn't. But perhaps fishing for movement here was found from the backup plan. Perfect. Uh, which is really nice for Joe here to be able to completely eliminate this morale. Yeah, the backup plan set the morale down to three, and then this uh, trickster was able to combine with the Milva to exactly get that death blow and send the Milva back to the deck where she is safe and sound, cannot be uh, interacted with, and she will be ready to come out with the next offensive movement as well. All right, and Joe playing out the vial here has not pressed the tactical advantage either because of these poison threats that do come uh, or exist from Miamon. Now, there is one card that you'd ideally be playing fairly early on, and that is uh, the Madame Marquis, which is not found here in hand. So Miamon's options are slightly limited, but look at this beautiful Milva movement uh, that Joe really has managed to, to synergize nicely here in, in round one utilizes these um, bronze cards that create movement and rock barrage there from the Dao as well and perfectly sets up the Milva. All right, so after Joe removes another spender from Miamon, Miamon then uses the uh, Eventide Plunder to, to just replace it. Here comes the second uh, Oxen for Guard, this time from Eventide Plunder. Uh, and yeah, he's got the spender on the board, playing for reach. He's red coin, doesn't need to stay ahead, and just kind of wants to win round one cheaply here. Yeah, exactly. As long as that is possible, Miamon will keep on playing as to not uh, fall behind, also not to give up the round. We can see in terms of Joe's hands, uh, things are starting to get just a little bit committal, but nice heat wave coming down here, or deciding to take that heat wave because there is, of course, a czar, as we see in Miamon's hand, uh, and those scarabs are really pesky and difficult to get through, so you're unlikely to get a really fantastic heat wave target in this matchup anyway. Joe just decides to take it here in round one. And and save the Dennis, save the Seamless, all of that stuff for later. Yeah, he, he heat waved the taller, the taller unit, uh, prioritizing points in round one, whereas there was a choice to maybe heat wave the Flying Redanian as well to deny that carryover, but Joe does manage to win round one with that commitment of the heat wave and is able to preserve his uh, combo of Seamless Armor's Workshop with the Dennis. Exactly. This is nice as we are moving into round uh, number two. Miamon still completing those mulligans and look at that, found the Madame Marquis Serenity here in round two, which is quite nice of a find. Uh, no candle though so far from Miamon. Uh, ideally thin early on and then you can get good value on your candle. Finding it in round two, your odds also increase, but at least you have the Madame Marquis. Really nice sort of 
point salami card uh, that also enables uh, engine threats on your side of the board as city. Exactly. Joe also finds a very nice uh, dwarf off of the deploy of Mahakam Pass. This pyrotech with six armor is uh, ready to blow stuff up. <laughs> it looks very ready. He is um, definitely going to do that. And this makes it really difficult for Miamon to really stick those engines that we mentioned earlier. But yeah, still playing no unit syndicate here as Joe, uh, on the other hand, just pu pu puts this saboteur on the board, of course, next to the, um, to the dwarf. Uh, so as to enable the Dennis and Armorer's Workshop on the same last later. All right, Miamon uh, playing the Defender here, which brings out the Flying Redanian. A lot of undesirable targets now on the board for this Pyrotech, which is probably why Miamon decided to play this Defender instead of uh, the Madame straight up. Okay, but here is another backup plan, damaging Azar and gets another create. There is the movement option again. There's also the bowman uh, potentially here to go ahead and remove one of the scarabs out of the way. And uh, there, there is one. Pyrotech, of course, not really ready to press that order ability. It would be a shame if you would hit that Redanian, for example. Yeah, it would the, just show up again. It would again. just come back. <laughs> And uh, Miamon now, Oxenford card is such a good card in this deck. It's able to get two extra points every time you spend down to zero coins with this. It's an infinite spender. It used to have cooldown. It was never played when it had cooldown. And then once it got rid of the cooldown, uh, it became a very, very useful tool to help spend all these coins that this Vice deck is able to accrue. That's right, and uh, yeah, now Joe has to decide, uh, does the push continue even further into this round? You want to get things like Ixora, you want to get uh, Acheronthia out from the deck. Um, Aniromancy is a pretty flexible card here. We see Shiru there is also currently residing in deck, not really ready to, to come out just yet, but here is the Armorer's Workshop from Simlas, immediately planting a lot of that armor, a lot of that boost on the board, making this Dennis look really exciting uh, that is in hand currently. So pushing Syndicate, getting a lot of threats out is what Joe is going for right now. Yeah, so that makes a lot of sense. You cannot pass this early versus Syndicate when they haven't spent Madame Serenity, they haven't spent Acherontia or Exora. You have to get something, uh, you know, a little bit more threatening out. Uh, so this Simless Dennis push does make sense. And you've also got first, first uh, version of Oniromancy, so you can use it twice still. That's right, uh, Echo cards are great in that regard, and um, here we have now the engines have come out, the Pyrotech has been pressed now, so Miamon doesn't have to worry about uh, these getting removed, and Madame Marquis safely tucked behind this defender as well, and um, now Joe needs to decide, is this Madame Marquis enough, or... Do I need to go a little bit further? Probably always keeping this Shiru in mind and deciding when to play it and maximize that value. Yeah, game. keep in mind here, Joe's Shiru in his deck is five power. He's going for the Oniromancy now. He does get this the five power Shiru, but is he looking to maybe move the defender? to get that to five, because that was yes, with the Milva, it would get the defender to five as well. And it's actually a triple scorch but he has to also protect his own cat witcher before he does that yep saboteur is uh protected and shiru look at this point gap it is just beautiful the setup from joe here taking that shiru not burning himself anymore but certainly burning me on my side of the board here. that was that was a great play by joe uh scorching or shiruing i should say two engines from the uh, madame serenity as well as that defender scarab and now there's still uh there's still the possibility of dennis coming down in this round Yes, a lot of point output, and we can see Miamon really upping the stakes here, playing out to that Ixora, getting ready to remove some of these fairly tall units now on Joe's side of the board. This Ixora, for every time the vice gets triggered, the uh, smallest unit of the board gets essentially erased from there. And look at the value on an Ixora now. Miamon yeah. just ahead here and Joe has one card left. Of course, if that Dennis were to be used, uh, perhaps Mimon would be able to then trigger the Ixora again, but does require quite a bit to, to get to Vice 8 here. Uh, but all 
the cards have been played from Joe here, decides that the Dennis value is not going to get better than this, and yeah. it is taken here. Joe does decide to save the resi uh, the order on the Mahakam Pass, so not going all in on this round, saving some resources, trying to force out uh, the Akarantia if possible. But Miyamon looking to try to keep uh, this Akarantia for round three, just goes for the Shady Vendor, uh, and has spenders on the board. Yep, keeps going here as uh, the uh, King of Beggars also has come out and with these infinite spenders really can decide to uh, spend exactly enough to get out and take these leader charges to a, a later round. I want to point out that Miyamon took a Crown Splitter Thug, a card that I haven't seen in a long time from the Order <laughs> of Novigrad, and it was recently buffed. It does three damage now? I think it used to only do two, and that three was exactly enough to kill the Milva, letting the Exora uh, use her Vice ability to wipe out something significantly bigger. All right, Joe's draws here. Of course, the Anairmancy is back in hand. Uh, Curse of Corruption exists still, uh, but the Squirrel has to go. Honestly, Joe has spent quite a lot of the power later, not finding a single one of these chariots as well. is a little bit unfortunate since there are still uh, power in those remaining, but Miyamon, on the other hand, has held on to this Acheronthia, but no candle yet for Miyamon. Yeah, Miyamon really only has uh, one spender here from this Eventide Plunder. No spenders in the deck. Maybe Shady Vendor can find you one if you're lucky. Um, so even though Miyamon has last say, it looks like he might be having the upper hand. If Joe can somehow uh, either kill the spender or kill the Acherontia, there could be... I mean, there's the COC, there's the the Curse of Corruption right now that could kill the Acherontia. Yep, there it is. It would certainly be tempting to take on the Acheronthia sooner rather than later, even though it does require a little bit of setup for Miyamon to keep going. And uh, But yeah, otherwise some um, Maxi currently would be the tallest unit on the board after that would come down. I, I mean, I feel like you have to take this Curse of Corruption. Maybe you, I mean, you don't have it, the Milva left to kill the Acherontia without using the Curse of Corruption. If you did have the Milva, you could have used the Leader Charge plus like the Dwarf Skirmisher. Sure. Um, but with the with the Curse of Corruption gone now, uh, you know, the Acherontia, answering the Acherontia is huge, but with the Curse of Corruption gone now, they're now Miyamon opens up the possibility of heading, getting a spender and boosting it to really tall, but he misses! There are no infinite spenders here. You've got the poison from the failed experiment, the eternal fire disciple that only has one cool, uh, cooldown one, and then there was the savvy huxer, which only gives himself vitality. So technically he can spend a lot, but they don't translate into points. Exactly, and you can also see the players' reactions there. I think Joe was holding his breath a little bit there to see what would come out from Miyamon's side of the board. But yeah, no infinite spender found here. It does go for the Aneiromancy, and it can now decide to pull out one of these Dwarven Chariots, play it uh, on the uh, ranged row to spawn some of these roadie Dwarf tokens as well, to spread it out, essentially negating any kind of poison value away from Miyamon. That's right, but Milan still has a chance left. Remember, he does have a Shady Vendor in his deck that he can grab from the Royal Decree, and uh, you need a, a little bit of luck trying to roll that, uh, that Eventide Plunder from the Shady Vendor in the front row out of your uh, four provision crimes. And Joe actually decides not to take the uh, Chariot and is going for removal instead, thinking, you know, maybe there might be something to kill still going forward. Maybe I want to stay short because there is the possibility that Miyamon will actually click this uh, failed experiment to combine with another poison from hand. Yeah, we do see that poison, of course, in hand, but uh, it can gain uh, Miyamon coins. But I do believe the chance to create a spender would be uh, sort of soon, but now you have the damage threat uh, from... <laughs> Joe here, so the poison does come down uh, on the fist tech and um, also this failed experiment. Sadly combination. though for Joe, this maxi finisher is not what you want to see. You've got 14 points on your side of the board. It's really not a big uh, big enough lead to, to, to be able to win this game because Miyamon, uh, he doesn't even have to find the spender at this point. He just needs to take uh, something that tributes the uh, Shady Vendor and it'll be, anything will be enough here, right? As long as you can 
get something worth of value that's not just pure profit. All right, and let's see what the create on the shady vendor will be. And uh, yeah, a couple of options here for Miamon and uh, stolen mutagens does do the trick as Miamon plays out the last play here. Very, very close game, cons everything considered. Uh, Miamon does pull out victory in game number one. He takes a 1-0 lead over Joe. There it is. Syndicate has one win for Miamon, and now we're getting to the real spicy stuff in Miamon's <laughs> yeah, lineup that's right. because he has no other choice. Um, so we do have either the Inspired Zeal Reavers or we have the Toussaintois Hospitality, and uh, let's see what we're gonna 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 get from Miamon. As Joe, of course, again uh, can decide to play any of the decks still available to him to make sure that Miamon does not make it to tomorrow's semifinals because. Joe wants to be there as well. Yes, and uh, Miamon uh, going on blue coin now in game number two is probably going to queue up with Reaver Hunter inspired Zeal Golden Necker. It is a deck that really, really wants to go first to set up his engines early uh, to help get an additional, some additional value from its uh, stratagem in round one to help it win it and so that it can push uh, in round two with carryover from Flotsam, from Wagon, uh, and then using like Reaver Hunters early to control the round and get a longer round two as well. That's right, and into that, Joe will have to respond. We could see, of course, guerrilla tactics from the more uh, traditional coin, which would be the red coin in this instance. So maybe that is something Joe wants. Can expect, I think, the Reaver matchup coming down here from Miamon as well. Maybe not so much mind game uh, dependent as it was in game number one. Um, but yeah, there is also the Pincer Maneuver list that Joe could choose, which is the Erland carryover one, or could go for the Dagon, but Dagon is oftentimes played from blue coin, but you never know, it can also be used from red coin situationally, uh, perhaps when your opponent does not expect it. Yeah, uh, I think it would make sense to maybe try the Shiru uh, Grill Tactics deck again, because it does have uh, a lot of movement options, which can uh, shut off things like Reaver Hunters, maybe have Idaran spawn Reaver Hunters in the wrong row so that they're not online. Uh, and it also has more control. It's got the possibility of shiroing some of those uh, multiple Sentry and Royal Guards if, if there's ways to line them up. And uh, yeah, it's a very, very low control deck from Miamon if you were to queue the Reaver Hunters, even though there's a lot of pinging damage, but there's not a lot of stuff that kills uh, outright if, uh, Miamon, or if Joe can set up like a huge Shiro, it could be the, the way to victory for him. That is a really good point, but those uh, Zintron Royal Guards would be pretty difficult to line up as they kind of boost unevenly as well. But we did see Joe really masterfully handled the movement abilities and lined up these Milvas very nicely. So uh, perhaps is able to navigate uh, this type of scenario and can pull out a fantastic Shiro. I mean, the Shiro from the previous game was pretty good. I'm not gonna yeah. lie, I'm not disappointed. It was cool. I always love seeing Shiro and then um, can't hear it in my ear right now, but the voice line that Shiro says is also quite great. Oh, how lovely it exactly burns. Exactly that one. <laughs> <laughs> I always hear it. I don't, and you know, sometimes you just see a card and you can hear the voice line in your head. For me, that is definitely Shiro, and all Shiro fans are delighted that it is now, yeah, even better than before. Right, I, I love casting Shiro games. Yeah. Uh, it's always a, a very intense thing because you never know what the Shiro is going to end up hitting. You can guess, you can, like, there's mind games, you can, tr like, try to trick your opponent into making suboptimal plays to avoid that big Shiro, and then all of a sudden you can pull a quick one on them, and no, you thought I was going for sixes, I'm actually going to go for eights instead, or something Yeah, like exactly. That. And, of course, with that deck boost that we saw in the previous game, Joe had the Shiro boosted up to a five uh, with the offering, which is a really interesting aspect of the deck, right? 
It is. You can, you, your opponent will never know whether you used Offering to boost an entirely different unit or if you boosted it on Shiru. So there is that constant uncertainty and you really have to take that into account even though your opponent might have boosted something completely different than Shiru. I, I call it the Schrodinger's Shiru. <laughs> the it, Schrodinger's you don't know what power it is until after you see it and then it's too late. <laughs> that is so true. I, I, I will be using that one from now on. Uh, we kind of saw one of those in the previous game, I yeah. think, yeah. Um, but yeah, cool strategies up ahead. Um, Overall, I would say that like Joe's got an uphill battle uh, in front of him right now. Uh, Miamon's decks are just so greedy and so difficult to control. Even even though Joe has control cards, like we were mentioning, like the Heat Waves. But Miamon's decks have just so many ways of uh, dodging that control or even flooding the board with multiple threats on the same turn. Like take, take for example, his Northern Realms Reaver Hunter deck. Mm -hmm. You've got um, <clears throat> Flotsam that is relatively difficult to control because it is an artifact. You've got Reaver Hunters, you can zeal the Reaver Hunters to all of a sudden get two of them on the board and you would need like kind of like two answers instead of one. Reaver Scouts also have zeal. Then you've got the Golden Necker and Vernon Roach, which can put like three or two threats on the board at the same time. You've got the wagon carryover that could be coming from a previous round that will transform itself into a threat and then that could combo with all sorts of different things too. That is right. Uh, I love that you mentioned the wagon. It is quite the card in this list. Of course, banishes the card to the right, gets resilience and then uh, transforms itself to the unit that you uh, earlier in a round banished in the next round. So um, can set up some pretty cool combos, for example, with Idaran. Uh, but are we going to see? We are going to see Northern Realms versus Northern Realms Shinri. Both Pinsir Maneuver, but very, very different decks. Uh, Joe is playing the Shoop Erland deck with uh, the Locks and the Iris Companions. It has not that much control, definitely not enough when you're facing a deck like Reaver Hunters, but the Temple of Militale, of course, can get you more control options. That is a good point. You can really get some good options. I do feel like yeah, there is the Heat Wave. Heat Wave can come down on something tall later on, or perhaps an Ildiko. An early Ildiko is something that Miamon might be playing in some games as well. Um, but Shoop can do with something. You do also have the Margarita here in hand, which is a lock. But Miamon's a leader, and why he's opting for this inspired zeal to be able to avoid this uh, seems quite good. Now, here is the early Ildiko. Joe, for now, is not really caring about that too much. Just goes ahead, plays his own uh, Radovid to get more of these pincer maneuver charges. So Ildiko is left untouched. She will be able to boost something by four, and now every Northern Realms card that Miamon plays will automatically get zeal from the Ildiko uh, and not have to use his precious leader charges. So here we have Selkirk immediately answering the Radovid. So what do you think um, this heat wave potentially then being reserved for something like Idaran, and that's why we saw this Ildiko go through, but uh, that order ability in combination with the Seltkirk was really nice for Miamon to be able to get through and completely remove um, the Radovid that was on Joe's side of the board at the time. That's right, uh, but that also means Miamon doesn't really, it's been two turns now, Mimon doesn't really have a real threat on the board yet, which is uncharacteristic of this deck. Gives uh, Joe a little bit of breathing time to set up things like his temple, like his meter generator. Oh. That's right, here we see these creates coming in handy. Uh, let's take a look at the options that were chosen here. Seldkirk, Viraxis, and Philippa. These are incredibly good outcomes for Joe here on the Temple of Militale. Three control options because Viraxis can also reset the order of a control card like Margarita, like Seldkirk, or Anseas. And here we see the Anseas pool from the Militale Temple Order. And uh, hovering over Iris's companions here, will we see that come down for now? As you mentioned, Miamon does not really have uh, too big of threats just yet. Uh, there are two Reaver Scouts and we saw the Philippi being tutored. Perhaps it comes down here to hopefully answer both of these, but does not ping the second Reaver Hunter. All right, gets one of them. 
uh, which was guaranteed, and leaves the other one on the board. But without bonded, uh, Reaver Hunter's not gonna not gonna keep pinging. But you know this deck, <laughs> <laughs> the, the Reaver Hunters don't stop. They no. they keep on uh, and they, they keep don't on, stop coming. Yeah, and they exactly. don't stop coming. Here they are, and of course the zeal from the Ildiko. Ildiko is getting great value here in round one, really, because Miamon can just hold on to these leader charges now. It hasn't had to spend them. Normally you would reserve some for Seldkirk for your Reaver Hunter scout. But right now, Miyamon is like, okay, I guess uh, I'll get to keep them because Ildiko is really doing some work here in round one. And Miyamon with uh, his favorite tempo pass uh, in round one uh, gets just three Reaver Hunters on the board, but the, the, the point gap is quite big. He's up 22 points, and these Reaver Hunters are going to ping again. They sure are, and uh, this makes it a little bit difficult for Joe. But to look at this, the Anseus is in fact coming down and uh, not... still has to play another card though because of those pings that you mentioned. Exactly, it's not quite enough due to those pings. Even the leader charge commitment here, uh, I don't think would be enough because he doesn't have like a Radovid judgment that would come out uh, to support his extra tempo. So he's gonna have to play an extra card, go two cards down, uh, but we might still see a round two push even after going two cards down because uh, Reaver Hunters is just that scary yeah, in the long run. Yeah, giving round control to Reaver Hunters a lot of the time for a lot of decks really does mean game over. But especially now, the, the nice thing uh, about Miamon's board state, not for Miamon, but for Joe, is that there's not a lot of carryover set up going over into this round two uh, bleed. So this is really a good opportunity to keep adding the pressure and, and push a little bit more. But if Miamon survives this round with potential carryover, uh, for example, that wagon is currently in hand and Flotsam, uh, of course, we do not see uh, yet any any flat sands coming down here from the golden um, necker, but Mata in hand can of course tutor that card. Now in open deck list, Joe is confident enough to be able to uh, drop the Selkirk on turn one, knowing that there's no answer for it, and just say I'm gonna kill, I'm gonna duel whatever you throw at me. Exactly. Let's see what is going to be happening here as the Mata coming down here from Miamon as protected, uh, predicted, sorry, and pulls out the Golden Necker. And now, um, here we go. The leader has been tutored, also a Muta Generator. All right, Nishod thinking that this is going to be the longest round. He's going to play very deep into this round to shorten round three, so might as well get a lot of carryover while you're at it. Exactly. And the carryover is being set up currently. The risky thing is Joe has used all of his leader charges. He doesn't have any more to tutor the early. And he doesn't have a Redea in this deck either because he's playing that Heat Wave instead. The Redea sometimes can get you a Curse Scroll to get one of the cards that you're missing, but now he's going to have to rely on uh, drawing it or maybe setting it up with that uh, Sintrin Envoy. Yeah, exactly. That Envoy is a really nice card to come out here for Joe. Can be used to hopefully put that Erland on top. And His look at this is. pressure. Yep. As Shunra mentioned, here is the Erland that was currently put on top by the Sintrian Envoy. Arbalest is on the board right now for Miamon, but a little bit slow in terms of the engines you want to be developing. Yeah, and look at this, like, the, the Temple really, really doing Joe a favor here with the, the, the Selkirk and the Varaxis in this round, having been able to put enough pressure on Miamon that he's forced to play the Golden Necker here. Exactly, here it comes, reinforcements onto Flotsam, into the Sintrian Royal Guard. Uh, those can very quickly pick up some points. That's right, and he finds yet another engine, a two, uh, a two point per turn engine even, yeah. <laughs> uh, from that uh, Karak Frigate. Love this card, haven't seen it in a while, but really cool to see that created from uh, the Flotsam. And now Miamon's back ahead. Yeah, that's right, and Curse Knight coming out here for Joe. There's no reason not to be trading that, putting even more carryover into the deck. Now, Shoop still has not been played. Miamon, on the other hand, keeps on going here, uh, or has to keep on going to keep up with the pressure coming down from Joe. We'll have to see if that last card is going to be coming down as well. Um, but yeah, a little bit of carryover setup, ideally, for Miamon. 
That's right, but I mean, Joe's also got carryover. The problem with this push, I think it's been a good push. You've gotten to get a lot of good resources out of Miamon, but you came into this round down two cards, thanks to Miamon's tempo pass in round one. So you've got to, you've got to claw back uh, something here, or Miamon's still going to have a resource edge against you. Yep, let's see here. Okay, another Reaver Hunter coming down here. Arbalest, quite a good sum of orders here that can, of course, be combined with the Onager currently in deck to really boost up the point gap for Miamon here, <laughs> which Miamon, is quite nice. <laughs> Miamon could have gotten ahead and he deliberately chose not to because of the wagon in his hand that he thinks, you know, if if Joe decides to pass here to get one of his cards back, I'm just gonna set up my carryover with a wagon on this Reaver Hunter and basically start with a Reaver Hunter for free on the board next round. Yeah, we do know that Shoop could come down, but it is not guaranteed to hit as the Rune Mage has not been played yet. You could hit the four damage uh, on Shoop. Perhaps that is what Joe is looking for, but it has not been found. That Reaver Hunter scout, uh, sorry, not the scout, the Reaver Hunter itself will be going uh, through to the next round uh, in the form of a wagon, it seems. Yeah, so no damage option. Uh, Joe is going to go for the resilience. It's got some nice uh, synergy with the muted generator and the zero provision tokens, boosting itself and the token. And you're going to have at least you know some some resilience, some carryover value in compensation for missing that damage. Yep, that is right. Carrot frigate charge a wagon here. And of course the orders on the Arbalest, but Flotsam and the Wagon is ideally what you have set up going into the next round. And then you want to find your Idaran and you want to find your Vernon Roach as well out from that deck. Yeah, both players still have quite a lot of gas in the tank. Um, we know Joe is top decking Erland and Rune Mage both. Uh, and Miamon still has Vernon Roach and Idaran. That's right, and yep, playing out the Onager, of course, uh, making these order clicks a lot nicer, holding on to that wagon for now, but... Does Miamon actually play an additional card to just play the wagon? He wasn't able to get ahead with the wagon last turn, but he is doing it. He's yep. giving up an extra card advantage to set up that carryover. The carryover is there, now you just need to find your Idaran, and you need to find uh, that Vernon Roach as well. But six cards in the deck for Miamon, so the odds are looking quite good. Joe, on the other hand, just like Shinri said, we know the top decks, it is happening, and not a lot of that carryover ended up uh, sitting on Shoop as the poor thing got damaged quite hard there that, from that the was, order abilities. That was another reason why Miamon would want to play that extra turn, right? Because you get a chance to use more pings with the Arbalist and maybe the Reaver Hunter onto the shoot. And there is both the Idaran, the Reaver Scout, and the Onager looking quite nice for Miamon. We see the Order Press. And now, in round three, Leader charges as well and can zeal the Reaver Hunter instantly for this Idaran to trigger instantly. And off the shoot goes as these engines keep on ticking for Miamon. Oh man, I bet some people watching this are having PTSD <laughs> right now because it's turn one and there's four threats on the board. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Miamon maybe didn't have them immediately in round one, but here they certainly are. Uh, but you prefer them, honestly, in the round three, which you really have to win. But here they are, keep going. Idaran again synergizes, Flotsam order, yet to be pressed. And we see that Reaver Scout, of course, in Miamon's hand as well, that can create even more. This is dangerous. There's only seven points on the board for Joe, and Reaver Hunters don't care about immunity. There's also the Onager that doesn't care about immunity, and Miamon, with the <laughs> setup, is going to snipe everything off of the board, and Joe forfeits. Erland not being able to be clicked. Despite his immunity, Erland falls to the might of Reaver Hunters. Poor Erland. He did his very best, but I mean, if you let these Reaver Hunters go off and do their thing, they are, they're a pack, package deal, really, all of those. And they came in and really took out Erland. They mistook Erland probably for something else. <laughs> but, <laughs> a dragon, Yeah, maybe? exactly, a dragon. Um, but, but off it goes, and that, of course, seals the deal as the game was sealed right there and then. Yeah, and uh, Miamon up to a 2-0 lead now over Joe. Just has, uh, I believe, his Master of Puppets deck, saving the best for last, Steely. <laughs>
<laughs> we'll see about that. Of course, Joe uh, might not agree and says, mm -mm, this deck is not going to go through. Of course, there is a chance. Again, we mentioned there are some tricks you can do, for example, with uh, the monsters list that Joe is playing can eat Karen to avoid these master of puppets getting those really big swings. Um, but we'll see if Joe can really stop Miamon from completing this strategy. Yeah, and now, I mean, at least Joe has the advantage of choosing his coins, knowing that there's uh, Miamon's always going to have to queue with the same deck, and he can decide what, uh, what matchups on which coin he wants to take. That's right, and Miamon, on the other hand, will be focusing on getting the Tucson to uh, Hospitality out. A real combo deck. It has a couple of different packages in there, I would say. There is the uh, Siri, Sangriel, and Milton. Uh, That's right. Fall Siri, um, rather. And that is a combo in itself. There is the Golden Necker. Uh, there is the Asir as well, which is a pretty interesting card in the list because even though, as Shinmari mentioned, potentially in a 2-0 situation, you might be seeing a triple necker, uh, the Asir could also decide to shuffle back some other important gold played earlier, such as a Vilgefort's bounce, uh, which can cause some pretty interesting situations, I think, if you're not going for the, the triple golden necker, which is very rare, I think, yeah. This deck can play golden necker three times. I don't think it's probably most of the time should even do that but no, probably not but i hope we see something like that i don't <laughs> even know really what to expect with this deck because there are just so many different ways to play it um and it's very very uncommon to see something like this on the pro rank so uh, not a lot of players have a lot of experience playing against something like that which is one of the advantages that uh, miyamon enjoys since he loves to take off meta decks that's a really good point miyamon of course played last week in the group stage and played this deck only once because it was banned. Uh, Miyamon bo won both of his series and therefore made it to Gwent World Master Season 5 at this uh, tournament right now. And um, yeah, only played the Toussaint Trois Hospitality list one time. So it was quite difficult to get a grasp of how Miyamon actually wants to play it out. What are the general strategies that Miyamon might be taking? So I think we might all be surprised. And I, I hope, I hope so. Yeah, I'm I, ready. I want to, I want to see something that like we didn't account for in this, in this series with this Master of Puppets deck. I want to see something crazy that we've never seen before that's mind blowing. Exactly, and Miamon might have to try that a couple of times because Joe, of course, will do his very best to stop Miamon's Master of Puppets from going through. And um, yeah, like you said, all the coins uh, or has the option to choose what deck to play from the uh, optimal coins. Yeah, so speaking of that, Joe, in game number three coming up, is going to have a uh, blue coin. And he's going to be able to go first. He's had Death Wish Dagon, Shoop, well, I mean, we don't need to speculate. We're going to see right here. <laughs> here it is, as Joe is bringing the Pinsir Maneuver list again. Erland uh, is back for revenge, perhaps. The way he, he left last game uh, was not nice, and so, uh, Erland hopes to save for this one. Miamon, on the other hand, does draw a Master of Puppets. Fisher King Mata can tutor out the Golden Necker if that was something Miamon wanted to play early on. Um, and Joe, on the other hand, has the Temple, has the Rune Mage there as well. And um, off we go. Blue coin starts. All right. It's Shoop is the choice is the deck of choice for Joe. I think, you know, one maybe thought process that Joe has here is that this has the best chance because it's the sort of deck that doesn't have to play that many bronzes. You're really playing bronzes in round one, maybe with your meter generator, you don't have to buff them. And then in like a decisive round three, because you've got the temple that makes you extra golds, you can maybe go an entire round three without playing a single bronze. Yep. And then with no bronzes on the board to buff, these master of puppets are kind of useless. That's a good point. And one thing to note here as well in the deck is that Miyamon has a defender to protect these Master of Puppets and keep hovering them. But there is one card here in Joe's hand that counters these defenders, and that is the Peller, currently kept in hand. Pretty nice find. Of course, it's a neutral, so it cannot be tutored. But getting through those defenders to heatwave something might be really important for Joe to be able to do. And of course, uh, yeah. 
can can utilize that heat wave on a master of puppets. What if what if Joe has the heat wave just like Petri filter to avoid Miamon getting a seal? That well, would be crazy. <laughs> he actually could heat wave a Petri's filter and shoot destroy a Petri's filter if really necessary, but that would be uh, that would be something. <laughs> I've never seen that before. And let's take a look at the temple outcomes. Whoops. Uh, he got Falibor, Donamir, and Ravenon Kimbolt. So Defender could come in play here against uh, the Master of Puppets. Uh, Falibor is an interesting choice. Not sure if he's going to be able to get really good value with that, but they're, oh, I really want to see it. You know what's interesting about this Donimir that was created? Mm -hmm. uh, Guillaume is a card in Miyamon's hand that can actually steal away the defender status. So even if your own defender gets purified by Peller, what Miyamon could do would be to play the Guillaume, boost the Guillaume up enough, and then steal the defender status from Donimir. So you're saying this Donimir could backfire against yeah, Joe, potentially? that's what I'm saying. Wow. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe that is a far fetch, but it is a possibility in any case. This is Gwen and anything is possible. Exactly. Uh, Miamon, you know, setting up something on top of his deck with his Fisher King, maybe just to guarantee a unit from the Golden Necker. It looks like it's probably the Defender that he set up there. Uh, and now here we go, Golden Necker round one, because he's gonna play more than one of these. Just gonna commit it in round one, thin his deck. Um, and a lot of decisions to be made here in this turn. You've got the Defender, you've got Royal Decree into False Siri. Is False Siri gonna, wait. Oh, actually, it does work because the False Siri is queued up after this battle prep, so the False Siri can play the the battle prep uh, by the time she's uh, in. It, by the time it's her turn to play on the board. And there is a pretty smorky line that this opens, which is this tome going to be pressed on this Sangriel coming down on Siri, uh, boosting her up immediately so that she moves and, of course, purifies herself, meaning that Sangriel um, status also gets purified and Siri doesn't actually take damage from Damn, it. Damn, <laughs> what a turn by Miamon! Uh, gets the Siri back on the same turn that he plays her with the Golden Necker combo, <laughs> and all of a sudden, like, he is up almost four, like 30 points. That's right, and here is the Squirtle, a rune stone crate from a rune mage. Couple of options here. Wondering if uh, movement was something that Joe could have hoped for in terms of moving that defender away. Uh, but yeah, Shoop here coming down from Tome. We see the Arcane Tome being bounced around and Joe really utilizing the Tome being on his side because again, um, oh. wow, okay. <laughs> Destroy a random enemy unit and uh, it was used on Shoop Hunter and that defender is gone by Fion. That is a very nice outcome for Joe, um, utilizing that Arcane Tome to get the Shoop and then high rolling off, the, destroying the defender. Maybe the False Seer would have been even better, but happy to see the defender gone. All right, and it seems like uh, a seer has put we a golden necker stopping. back, and that is being sh again played with the tome. And Elisa, <laughs> Elisa can also put it back <laughs> technically. Will he do that? <laughs> I, we gotta I don't check. Know. There might be a sangriel that can be put back. The decree can be put back as well if that is something Miamon prefers over the golden necker. As we said, the triple necker is not always uh, optimal. Miamon has to act so fast. He he started playing this round as soon as it became his turn, and he's already roping out because there's just so many actions that he has to take. He has put back the Sangreal with the Alyssa, choosing not to play a third Golden Necker, and then he has to make um, a, a unit from his opponent's faction and also play this Beatrice Filter. He manages to do it, but wow. <laughs> like, you cannot wait for a second with this deck. No, you really have to have played this many times, which I'm, I'm sure Miamon has done, because that rope was perfectly timed and perfectly played out before it ended. <laughs> now, the Tome, of course, is on Joe's side of the board, but cannot be activated here, as there are no more special uh, cards in Joe's deck. That's right, and all this rope is making me sweat a little bit, Seely. <laughs> I've been in this position too many times, and it's not ended this well. That, um, yes, I, I'm aware. Uh, Shinri, of course, closely associated with the rope club. <laughs> um, 
Uh, but yeah, really stressful to see, but it's also really fun to be watching this very intense gameplay. And look at that! Heatwave now was actually tutored oh. from the tome. Because you know, as you were saying, there were no special decks left in his, or specials left in his deck, but he used a mulligan to put the special back so that he could get an extra click on the arcane tome. But this, of course, enables it for Miamon again. That's true. If Miamon actually would want it this time around. And uh, he only has Sangreal as the only option for this, uh, for this arcane tome now. But without the false Siri interaction, Sangreal becomes significantly worse. Yeah, that's right. Because of the, uh, the, the infusion or status rather that it puts on, that you do want it to be purified or else it essentially plays for zero points. That's but right. here is Palmerin uh, choosing a card, or it doesn't get to choose because Milton is not yet on the board, so has to play the first card out, which is the Morlehem Hunter getting a lock onto the Squire. Yeah, and uh, Palmerin ended up boosting that bronze unit by four, the provision of the Van Morlehem Hunter, uh, potentially setting up a future Master of Puppets on that uh, on that night. That's right, as we know, we have the uh, Petri filter on the board, and this is why this deck is so interesting. What Miamon is doing currently is holding the Petri's filter and threatening that reach constantly. The threat of Master of Puppets is there, and Joe has to play accordingly, because when it comes down, it will be sealed and that swing will happen instantly. A Peller coming down here on the Squire instead and removing the lock. Uh, no defenders left to purify. Yes, and able to click that um, that Squire now, setting up an extra two boost and potentially even engine value if the next card that comes down is a Knight. And Joe actually has three Knights in his hand. Here it is, the Donimir blocking currently the Master of Puppets from Miamon's side. So that create from the temple for now is very good. For, for, now. <laughs> for now, but it seems good. like your prophecy might be coming true very <laughs> soon, Seely. We well. see the Milton in hand, we see the Guillaume. Uh, that is, if you can get, the, the magic number for Guillaume is 14 power. He has an order a really high grace requirement, but if you can get Guillaume to 14 power, he can steal all these shield defender statuses. Uh, and uh, would you, you would also steal that infusion, right? Yes. The end of the, the the infusion given by the squire. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> it is only round one and we are deep into it. We are so far into this game right now and I am really invested. Miamon Here comes Milton, does boost up this Donimir. And Miamon has, uh, successfully stayed ahead in a lot of these turns after he's played his card. So from Redcoin, he's constantly threatening, threatening to win on even, and every card he plays gets closer and closer to that Master of Puppets decisive turn. That's right. And um, for now, Joe keeps playing into that range throw, damages down here. Does not get the death blow for the knight, but uh, all is well as Donimir keeps boosting. Uh, we do know that Miamon technically has the threat of Vildefort. Although we haven't seen it, it is a card that Joe has to take into account as well. As this Donimir is getting more boosted, it's starting to maybe seem like that Vildefort could come in at some point. But here's the Young sitting at 14, now has the order that will be activated next turn, can be pressed next turn for Miamon. And yeah, then things would go as you say, Shinmarie, all of those statuses from Donimir will get stolen. It was actually the uh, passive from the Toussaint Trois leader that put Guillaume to 14. He ended up at 13 after his deploy, and then the leader buff went to 14 exactly. And Miamon, with that click of the Milton, gets a huge boost on his order, and uh, he's now well in command in this round one. Exactly, and keep in mind, blue coin here is Joe. So, uh, it does look very, very scary now that that defender uh, status, like, yeah, it <laughs> backfired. It did end up backfiring. <laughs> it did end up backfiring, and now there's a defender with a shield, no doubt. He has, Miamon has his shield, so Anseis can't even duel the only unit that he can target in the range row. Okay, and here is the Master of Puppets set up. Joe knows exactly what is coming next, Miamon. Uh, has it here, and um, yep, 
past one on even and not much Joe could do there other than take the loss on even. Wow, Mia Mon's Knights to Sot deck is popping off right now. He actually even used the order, the zeal ability from the Petrus filter on the Guillaume so that he can click the Guillaume on the same turn that he played him. Um, meaning that Anseus would never have the chance to duel. Yeah, exactly. And um, here we are, the last pulls from Miamon. Exactly three cards left in deck, potentially for round three. And the other cards have now been drawn. Mm, it is pretty not strong plays left for Joe here, though. It is not over yet. There's, I mean, Erland is still a lot of points. Miamon decides to pass, not play his uh, Siri Nova carryover, and rather prioritizes maybe the double last say. And with double last say, you can potentially threaten two Master of Puppets. You can play this Master of Puppets second to last, and then another Master of Puppets from Vigo last, while already having the uh, the Petrus filter on the board. But the question is going to be, are there going to be bronzes for uh, Joe to Joe steal? Joe can play only gold if he wants to. Joe could avoid uh, Miamon having any of these Master of Puppets by just avoiding playing bronzes. Of course, the leader charges are there, and the leader charges put tokens on the melee row, which becomes a little bit tricky uh, for Joe, but uses them now, perhaps for that exact reason, does not want to give Miamon a single bronze in the, the round that is about to come. Yeah, so deciding to, you know, get rid of them. Uh-oh, but he's roping! He put back his Erlen! Wait, no, that wasn't the Erlen. I'm sorry. <laughs> I got too excited. I got too excited. It, but it was the like Anseus. It was the Anseus, also uh, a very, very important card, but uh, I'm not sure if he did that on purpose. He can still get the Anseus boost points from the Erlen, but he will no longer have that, uh, that big duel at his disposal. And also, it's a gold card. Yeah. It is a really, really big thing happening because now uh, Joe is drawing into all of these boosted bronzes, but you don't really want them. As you can see, we Just immediately did a discard. discard. Joe that was so fast. But, but that you have to do that because the strategy revolves so much around the Master of Puppets. But we do see Neomon still has some points. Belgefort, uh, Vigo, but um, not much other than that. That Enseus had to be the rope though. And Shinmuri, I think your reaction was very valid because <laughs> it was kind of a heartbreak there to see that Enseus go back into the deck. Okay, but I mean, the Erland is on the board. Uh, I don't think there is anything Miamon can do about it, thankfully. We're not going to see that <laughs> Erland get sniped this time around. There is so much boost in the deck. Like, we will have to see Miamon now knowing that like these Master Puppets are probably not going to get value with the discard. 51 point Erland. That scene. has to be the tallest Erland I have seen. I have to say, this is a really, really tall Erland. Erland, he came back with a vengeance. He was like, no, those Reaver Hunters did me so dirty. I'm back and I'm not going anywhere at 51 points. Yeah, does Miamon even have 51 points left? If he were to play all of his cards, would he be able to beat this Erland? It, I don't know. Like, Vilgefortz, you, you can't offensive Vilgefortz to Erland. You can't defensive Vilgefortz anything because you've got nothing left in your deck. But oh. Miamon just played out this Sangreal, kind of knowing yeah. that it was zero points because there's no way to no, purify no. this well, status, right? Actually, you could get a self-lock off of the Arturus Vigo. Ooh, the okay. Van Wollenheim Hunter can lock your own units. So that could be a way to kind of... Uh, manufacture some proactive points on Miamon's side of the board. That's a really good point. And one thing about Miamon's deck is that the Artorias Vigo is actually uh, always guaranteed. You know what you're pulling from it. It's guaranteed to hit a Master of Puppets. But as you said, Shinmuri, here is the self-lock to make sure that Sangreal actually does not play for zero points, uh, but rather a little bit more. I mean, catching I wanna, up in points here. I mean, Joe, you notice Joe's passed. He hasn't even played his other two golds. Despite them being golds, he doesn't want to give Miamon anything to target with his boo hurt with yep. his leader and i think that's the vilgefortz because yeah. now you know the self vilgefortz is inevitable but there's nothing in the deck to be tutored it, out either so, right yeah <laughs> if he had played uh the golds that the non-immune golds vilgefortz could have pulled out a bronze as well and 
Joe wins it with a, with a little <laughs> smile, a little grimace. I don't know what that was. A, a combination of both a smile and a grimace. But what an ingenious play. Amazing. Erland soloing this entire deck by himself in a round three situation. I feel like Erland got his revenge here. I really feel. <laughs> Joe has to be happy about that. I mean, he knew that was the strategy to take. We could see planned ahead for it in round two, taking those tokens. Even though Isaiah's went back, you know, maybe it wasn't that bad because he, Isaiah's was not needed apparently <laughs> yeah yeah maybe that was the plan the whole time just to not just get rid of all your tallest boosted units so that you can concentrate every single point possible on that immune Erland. What a deck from Miamon resulting in these very interesting strategies, not only for Miamon, but of course your opponents, because they have to do, they have to think quite creatively. But of course, they have been uh, prepping ahead of this, knowing the decks now, you know also what strategies to take. So Joe seemed very confident. But now the question is will this Tucson Tua hospitality be Miamon's downfall this week? Oh, no. Will Joe manage? to not let this deck through, utilizing sort of its weakness against it by denying these Master of Puppets? Or will Miamon be able to sneak in that last win to make it to the semis tomorrow? I think, I, I don't know the answer to that. I, mm -hmm. I think whatever happens, we're in for some fun games, as you can see from, from this series so far. We've got uh, Shiru Milva, Guerrilla Tactics from Joe, as well as Dagon Deathwish. Both are decks that are capable of pulling out some tricks or tactics, some out-of-the-box type of plays, like the ones we just saw against uh, Master of Puppets. So let's see what these players have in store for us. I'm so happy. <laughs> I'm so happy to see this list. All right, here we go. Guerrilla Tactics is going up against, uh, fr from the traditional red coin. Now, we know that Guerrilla Tactics, certainly, like you said, Shinri, might have a couple of trick up tricks up its sleeve. There is the Shiru threat. There is the Curse of Corruption that can get through defenders and such. There is the movement to move things uh, like defenders blocking Master of Puppets. Mm, so the question is really, how is Miyamon's strategy going to work out in this game? Uh, is he going to be able to get through and uh, steal some big bronzes? So and let's talk about big bronze targets. Yeah. Let's talk about the targets that he can find with his master puppets in this matchup. It's gonna be uh, traditionally the things that Dennis boosts, the things that you boost with the Armor's Workshop, right? Um, so, I mean, Joe might even decide to... to tr you can maybe not play the Dennis, but it's a source of a lot of points for that deck, and it kind of depends on all those points from the Armor's Workshop and the Dennis, so it's difficult, but you gotta choose your moment, right? You gotta use them maybe at a time when there's no Master Puppets available for Miamon or after he's passed, something like that. Shane Marie, this Curse of Corruption is staring at me currently mm -hmm. uh, from where I'm looking because we saw how tall units can get when those boosts are really targeted for the Master of Puppets to utilize that big yoink. But what if that backfires? What if that Curse of Corruption can come in and sweep like a huge target that was just swapped out with Master of Puppets? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's possible. We could even see like... <laughs> I don't want to say it, but like, what if he <laughs> does a self-Curse of Corruption to deny the Master of Puppets target preemptively? I, there's like so many crazy things that can happen with this sort of matchup. That's good. Maybe you you uh, jinxed it now, but we're going to have to see. Of course, Defender is on the board, not going anywhere for now. And Miyamon has also pulled uh, the Golden Necker into hand with the help of Meta. That's right. Miyamon t likes to play Golden Necker in round one with this deck so that you can put it back with the Alyssa or the Asir. All right, and placing Siri here, false Siri in the middle of these rowdy dwarves as well. Now armor's workshop. In case Joe wanted to play it this early, I'm not sure. Uh, but it, but if that were to happen, you would potentially give this false Siri some boosts as well. And um, yeah. Just checking armors. Uh, if Elven Swordmaster can damage allies, but it cannot. It's forced to damage enemies. Otherwise, it would have been really nice to kill this false Siri. Yep, she's currently right there and not going anywhere for now. Backup plan hitting armor here as well. Not ideal for Joe, but can choose uh, any of these crates, whether that be Bowman, uh, which it is starting to chip through at this defender. A little bit of chip damage, of course, uh, exists in the Guerrilla Tactics list, so might eventually get through that defender. 
That's right. Uh, golden Necker, we see the first Golden Necker being played here. Onto an Illusion is not the best. No not targets in the graveyard, one, so a little bit of a waste there. Royal Decree, a um, couple of five different options here. Could go for the uh, the Siri Nova to establish that carryover. Um, ends up going for Fisher King and the Petri's Filter, of course, setting up that zeal for Master Puppets later this round. And Fisher King here can choose to put any card uh, to the top of the deck. So let's see after what. Um is being chosen here by Miyamon. What does Miyamon value and really just wants to have at the top there? The interesting thing is the card that he puts at the top of his deck, he could play this round with Palmerin. So maybe he puts something like um, Arcane Tome on top of his deck so that he could Palmerin into it and get his Golden Necker again in round one. You know what just happened? Oh, mm -hmm. never mind. There's there was no... a squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The squirrel coming down on the Golden Necker. This is a single Golden Necker list now. Yeah. Only one of them is going to come out here. Uh, that is true, and it was the Arcane Tome. Maybe th that was the plan, but it got disrupted, so very heads-up play by Joe, knowing that, you know, th there is the possibility of Golden Necker being shuffled back into the deck. So Miamon instead going for a Sangreal, and we do see the uh, False Siri Sangreal combo again successfully pulled off in this round. It's so many points. It's something like, I think it's equivalent to playing like 15 for 6 provisions on each card. Uh, it's really, really strong, and Miamon up to a 31-point lead. That is a big lead, and of course, even crazier combo if you add something like Melton to the mix. But for now, Miamon did not have the setup. As you said, the plan got disrupted, uh, Palmerin pulling that tome. Now the question is, would Joe use this tome for himself, or would he think that that would backfire in some way? I mean, there is no threat of Golden Necker anymore, well, so... My thought is, Normally, Miamon's deck can't click Arcane Tome that many times because he's at risk of overthinning, but you just banished his Golden Necker, so now he's not going to get the thinning from the second Golden Necker, and he's able to click this Arcane Tome maybe extra times. Yep, that is a good call. As we see, those Boo Hoots are still in deck, something that could be pulled out with the Tome if Joe were to flip it over, but takes the pass here, decides the gap is just a little bit too big, not going to challenge that anymore, and Miamon takes round number one. He does, and he has round control. This is what you love to see if you're playing this deck, but how much power does he really have left? There's no Golden Necker anymore. There's still a lot of Master of Puppets. There's still that one more Petri's Filter, but you can kind of expect maybe that Petri's Filter to get answered by the Heat Wave if the Master Puppets does end up being that big of a threat. Exactly. No, that is definitely, uh, it sounds so silly saying that you would heat wave a Petri Filter, but in this particular list, the value of this seal is really quite insane for Miamon. So, uh, yeah, prepare yourself. So we might see plays uh, like that that right. are, are a little bit unexpected. But here we go. Uh, Miamon, of course, around control, as mentioned, going into this list. And uh, a Seer, what did he put back here? It looks like he put back no, a Petri's filter. filter. Yes. No, he put back his Petri's filter because this is exactly what we're talking about. It's so important to give zeal to these Master of Puppets that he wants a second one so that it can, uh, it can sur the first one can be traded with the Heat Wave and the second one can survive. Um, Master of Puppets really is this deck's win condition, and without the zeal, the Gorilla Tactics has so many different ways to kill a four, four damage, uh, four strength unit. Absolutely. Um, yeah, of course, there is no defender anymore to float these Master of Puppets down, so they are going to have to come at a time where they won't be bounced back either by Joe. Uh, Mahakam Pass, for now, is being played. Let's see what the create is here. It seems to be a Giant Slayer. Pretty nice value on this card, as it will start chipping away at that Azir. And if it gets the Death Blow on Azir, then uh, that will gain resilience. However, as we know, Miyamon does like boosting his own cards, so perhaps chipping away at that as Seer is not really going to happen in this matchup. I mean, it is a bronze, so even if it gains resilience, <laughs> that might end up being Miamon's resilience points later. Yeah, good point. <laughs> it is a bronze, uh, a C uh, sorry, Alyssa coming down here. And what did it put back? It was Sangreal. a Sangreal. Again, we see a bit of a pattern here. Mm -hmm. uh, no Golden Necker, of course, to put back anymore as it was banished before. Okay, Joe. Uh, at a crossroads here, gonna play this, uh, the Dwarven Skirmisher, just trying to stay short 
for as long as he can to minimize that like uh, enemy boost value from the Milton and the Guillaume and uh, Buhertz and such. There it is. And um, the, the choice here? It looks like possibly a Maxi being played by um, by Joe. Got it. Uh, it doesn't look that good, right? I think I saw the Heat Wave at the bottom of the deck, and we are going to go into a fairly long With resilience. <laughs> yes, with resilience. Um, Joe has some carryover. He's got the carryover Dwarf, and he's got the carryover Mahakam Pass. Uh, no Golden Necker for Miamon. Joe... I think he did take a shuffle, but he drew three bricks. Oh, yeah, look at him. He's laughing. Rough. He's grinning. To, he's, he's laughing to himself. He can't believe way it. This is happening. He shuffled with Maxi, and Maxi betrayed him. Okay, that Maxi is. Ne Joe is never playing Maxi again. I can see it in his eyes. Joe's like, mm -mm, never again. Poor. So, what do you even do in this situation? You mulligan the two armors workshop, and then you just play the rock barrage from hand and don't play. Um, the Dao? Yep. It, this is interesting. I, I recall watching a game from the previous uh, week as well where some of the Scoia'tael mulligans just ended up being quite unfortunate because that Simulus is really, really good payoff. But also, if your Dao doesn't come out early, you might be in trouble in a later round. And that is exactly what happened to Joe, but it is quite unlucky. Yeah. Uh, but it's not over by any means. No, absolutely the, not. It, it's basically, it's missing seven points. And seven points can be significant, but if you can shut down all of these Master of Puppets, those seven points might not be necessary. That's right. And now the Chariot has been played there on ranged row, setting up for that Armor's Workshop. It can come down at any point, but you have to be a little bit careful with your boosts uh, if you don't know that you can actually control the Master of Puppets or not. Uh, meaning that Miamon does not get to pull them off later. Okay, and here is the vial. So now we have the vial on the board as well as the Mahakam Pass. And that Shiru might be taking on some of those boosts Th later. We're going to have to see. This is what we were talking about, the flexibility of the Shiru. The Shiru now can, can be a 3, it can be a 6, 9, or 12 from the Guerrilla Tactics charges. It can be uh, an 8 from the Mahakam Pass, it can be a seven from Vile. So effectively, it's anything six or higher or three power. Those are his options on um, on Shiru's. And uh, it just makes it so difficult for Miamon because the second Miamon plays like a second unit that's somewhat close to Milton, you also have like the Milva in the deck and these um, backup plans and stuff that can line things up and potentially set up the Shiru on the same turn. That's right. Um, yeah, not much you can do either in terms of playing around it because the options on the Shiru, as you said, is just so many. Um, but for, for now, we're taking it a little bit slow. Both players are sort of establishing the board for their own strategies. Uh, the Shiru, in Joe's case, and the Petri Filter and the Master of Puppets in Miyamon's case. Now it's a question of how greedy do you go with the Shiru? Because you could Shiru this 13 right now if you wanted to. You could play it as a three. Nope, he's gonna take the Curse of Corruption instead. Save the Shiru, maybe try to Shiru uh, some Master of Puppets. I, I'm not really sure. Um, but you could have Shiru that 13 with uh, a Vial use and two leaders. This is quite interesting as well because Miamon can for now play the Sangreal, can uh, also steal this now with Master of Puppets and then self-flock again with the Mor Morlehem Hunter to avoid that uh, Sangreal for playing for zero points. So that's a play we can see again from, from Miamon and for now can play unitless but really kind of uh, can't play out that Petri Filter without losing a boost if there are no units on the board. We can see how effectively Joe can, can really uh, sort of kill all the units but instead has to play the backup plan oh. with nothing to damage and there is a purify actually uh, uh, but do you actually want to purify it <laughs> not if you expect it to be stolen you can't deal right. with it no but it is uh it it is funny to see maybe you take the middle one the Vrayhead brigade uh, it doesn't do any damage right now because there's no enemy to hit but it could give you additional ping value from the guerrilla tactics if you wanted to you know move that unit repeatedly uh, in the future so that is what um joe decides to elect uh, to take 
the Vrayhead Brigade. I love these, you know, I really like these create cards that have been introduced to the game because they tend to allow you to see uh, cards that never really see play in the deck, in the actual deck, but for the situation, because there's so few choices, it might end up being the best choice. Absolutely. Now, this situation is really interesting because no matter Mia, what Miamon plays currently, it's a little bit awkward on the board. You can't play out your boohoots, you have nothing to place to, to boost yourself, but here comes the Morlahem lock. Maybe something that Joe doesn't really want to remove just yet. Also, leadering to put it to 13, not as easy to remove anymore. Hoping to save that unit on yeah. Miamon's side of the board. And it was actually a really good call by Joe to get rid of that Curse of Corruption early. You know, this now we know why he used the COC instead of the Shiru, because, you know, once these uh, knights start boosting his side of the board, his COC is gonna be scorching his own unit. But uh, Miamon's made a declaration of war by <laughs> locking this Sangreal, or the, yeah, the Sangreal infusion, he is basically saying, I'm going to get your dwarf. Yeah. Like, because I don't think he's going to end up on your side. I'm just going to preemptively lock this bad infusion. Exactly. And uh, here is the Simulus coming down on the Armorer's Workshop. Nicely here in the middle are all these tokens set up, as well as Simulas. Uh, and uh, the boost can be very nicely spread out here. You just uh, can't self Shiru, I guess, <laughs> after that. And the buffs keep coming. It's a 25 power Giant Slayer now, taller than the Giants around him. Yeah. <laughs> that is very true. Um, I like that you said that as well when that create happened and you said, but it's a bronze, mm -hmm. meaning it can be stolen. So yes, you sealed it in stone. It is getting stolen, at least according to Miamon. That's what Miamon wants. The target is on this card currently. Rock Barrage coming down here. Milva as well now on the board. Of course, we see no death blow really, but can hold on to this order from Milva as it's not really going there. Again, Miamon's uh, deck isn't act exactly reactive besides those Master Hobbits. Oh my lord. Guillaume getting 17 power himself. Uh, able to steal statuses. Is there anything useful to no, steal here? I don't think so. Uh, it doesn't look like there is any status except for the lock and the infusion, which, which wouldn't each really other be out. helpful. They cancel exactly. each other out anyway, so that's not really doing anything. Um, this is a 39 point Giant Slayer now, by the way. Uh, can, wait, wait, wait. Meaning, uh, by the way, an 80 point swing uh, 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 once that. Can we, can we Shiru both of these units? at 19 and 17. Like, you've got the Milva that deals one damage, the Gorilla Tactics that deals one damage, so you could get double 17s. Shiru goes to 8, 12, 15, 18. So you cannot... Unfortunately for Joe, 17 is not a number that you can Shiru with his current setup, but oh, how sweet it would be. If how you lovely could, it would burn. Uh, uh, That's right. But it comes what? out on the board. Also, like, Joe can kind of just keep it for now and um, see Let's what happens see. because, yeah, of course, okay. there is the, the rope here he, as he, well. Yep. <laughs> so has to take two this turns to set it up. This is so risky because Miamon has a Vilgefort still in his deck that's unplayed. Luckily for Joe here though, Miamon does not have access to it because there was no Golden Necker uh, to be played a second time. So Joe's actually not gonna get punished here. And now, but these are going up, making it more difficult for Shiru to eventually actually Shiru them. Um, so let's see what is actually going to be played into this Shiru right now that is like slightly boosted already. Um, but I mean, of course, there is the Vile. Yes. The Vile can still boost up Shiru. There's a Vile that can take him to 18. Uh, what was that? That was an offering. That was discarded? That was an offering that was discarded right, okay, by no Joe target. because it does not have a target as we can see. The units are just a little bit too big, just a little bit. So, I mean, it's a 40 point lead for Joe right now, but if this Master of Puppets gets the steal, it's gonna be an 80 point swing. Yes. So it's either a 40 point lead for Joe or a 40 point lead for Miamon. We don't really know, but we're gonna have to see. <laughs> Uh, there is a heat wave, of course, but there are also two Petri Filter and two Master of Puppets left. Now, uh, the, the sequencing becomes quite important now for Miyamon. Does want to really last, say, get this uh, dwarf on onto his side of the board rather than enabling a heat wave on it by taking it too early as well. Oh man, 
these uh, these units on Miyamon's side of the board really getting out of reach for this Shiru. Shiru can get to 18 uh, and then 21, and then Milva can deal one damage to get the 23 down to 22, but it's just not enough. Um, Dennis now playing only on one unit? What's the thought process in that? He doesn't want to buff up the other... Oh, he doesn't want to buff up the yeah. other Rowdy Dwarves because he's planning on heat waving his own uh, super tall Giant Slayer. Exactly. And doesn't want to give uh, the other Master of Puppets because there's two now. The setup is there for two, so doesn't want to give that second one a value either. Um, 102 points versus versus Miyamon's it's, 50. I, I, I'm really sad that it looks like this Shiru is going to end up being played for three points. It doesn't seem like it's getting really, it's getting clicked here because, okay, Zeal number one comes down, takes the 42, and it's 34 points, 35 points now in favor of Miyamon. It's coming. This could be the last game, Seelie. It could very well be. The point cap is there. Uh, also, kind of had to. The, the hover was interesting there from Milva on that one point master of puppets potentially, just taking it instantly. Um, but that swing could have happened a little bit later. Okay, so the as tallest well. unit that he can seize is a seven. It's not huge because you're giving him a four <gasps> and it's a tie! <laughs> what? So we have our first tie of the weekend. <laughs> Celia and I both, have to both had to compose ourselves for the camera there right before we came live because <laughs> we were freaking out at the time. That was a crazy game. But as you said, Shinri, a three point Shiru. It didn't yeah. end up going off at all, which is not what you want to see in this deck in Joe, particular. Joe, in hindsight, I mean, I couldn't have called it at the time, but in hindsight, he maybe got a little bit too greedy with the Shiru and uh, wanted to get more. Could have He could have gotten a very respectable, I think like 18 point unit with this, a single 18 point unit with the Shiru. Had he been willing to spend all of his stuff early in the round, uh, ended up not getting anything. Exactly, and the, the time it was played as well was right into that rope where Joe didn't have time right. to potentially plan it out either. So maybe uh, took a little bit too long to actually decide on what Joe then wanted to, to do. Um, and he, there's actually, I think, um, Joe's name translated, I think means essentially like indecisive, oh. uh, being indecisive. So uh, maybe, that is actually what Joe did there. A little bit too indecisive on when to play that Shiru or not. <laughs> All right, these these Master of Puffets games have not disappointed. They have been intense, down to the wire. We even got a literal tie. And I want to point out, the Guillaume Grace actually helped cause the tie by stealing the vitality that was given by the Vial of Forbidden Knowledge. So we ended up he ended up actually getting a useful fight, uh, status to steal, and that one or two points made the difference that ended uh, the game in an exact tie. Pretty well played on the most part by both players. I liked how you know Joe was uh, aware enough to use the Dennis on a, on a gold, on a small unit, not boosting up the bronzes that would have been stolen eventually by the Master of Puppets. So there were so many different decisions there. I, I can't wait for our analyst specimen to to break that down for us and see what maybe else could have happened during oh, that sure game. I'm sure Specimen will have a lot to tell us about this particular moment. I cannot wait to hear it either. But here we are again. Of course, it is a tie. Miyamon here on blue coin again, while Joe is responding from We're running the it back. red coin. We We're are, we running are. it we back. Went, and same, here we go. same coin, same decks. Let's go. Let's see if the players, maybe what they might have learned from that previous game. Maybe Joe will be decide to pull the trigger a little bit faster on the Shiru this time. Um, but we're seeing a familiar sight, Miyamon opening with the Defender. Yes, uh, a pretty classic play that we have seen from Miyamon, but you know what is missing? The Golden Necker? Yes, the Golden Necker does not exist currently in Miyamon's uh, hand. And before, we did see this being tutorable with Meta. Currently, not really. So let's see if Miyamon can get out of this situation. The Defender is there. You could hold a Master of Puppets and still make a pretty big swing later on. 
Um, That's very dangerous, though, because but it is dangerous, there is yeah. the movement, of course, always at the disposal of the guerrilla tactics leader um, to get the defender on the other row and then maybe kill the master of puppets before you click it. Yeah, guerrilla tactics really is the dex uh, or the deck that has the most answers uh, from Joe's side, and uh, here again we do see the the Siri. False Siri come down there right in the middle, does use the Imperial Diplomacy into an orb. So now the orb is actually in Miyamon's graveyard, for which, which will end up coming out because Miyamon plays enough specials, right? Right, right. so nice little carryover value that Miyamon was able to find with that orb. And Chariot nicely making sure that there are three boostable units on the melee row in case Armorer's Workshop would like to come out. However, we see again the hand, the Simulus is unplayable <laughs> this round, unless you want to play only one Armorer's Workshop, but double back up in hand as well as the, the loose Armorer's Workshop currently in Joe's hand. True, so both players drawing a little bit worse this time around, um, but let's see how they adapt to the situation and, and what they're gonna change up. Yep. False Siri now at five power, growing relatively quickly. There's unfortunately uh, no offering because you could you can offer in your own unit. Uh, no offering from from Joe to answer this false Siri, and decides to just go for a, a battle plan here. Yep. Another interesting thing is that there is no tall punish really in Joe's hand currently, but there is that squirrel, and we did see squirrel being really really uh, impactful in the previous game. So Miamon can kind of count on only playing one Golden Necker anyway this game, unless there is a chance you would get like a Seer and shuffle it back right away with the Seer, that way you could avoid the Squirrel, but I think it's the only way to do it, right? Okay, yeah, I think so. That That's something to look out for, but right now in round one, Miamon has timed his pass uh, the very, very, very good timing pass that we've seen other players do today as well with the False Seer uh, waiting until she's six power, and your opponent still has to play a card. So now it's Joe's turn. He plays a card. False Siri goes to seven. Then he passes. False Siri goes to eight. Grace activates, comes back to Miamon's side. So it looks like Miamon's only up five points right now. He's actually up like 20. Yeah, this is a really good point because we did see earlier uh, False Siri did cause a little bit of confusion, which can happen, but Joe now has to take the time to make sure to count it out as well before. And uh, another create going on uh, the same unit, hoping to get resilience, even if you have to play that one extra card. So Joe taking his time, not uh, passing too quickly here, gonna figure out how he's going to make the points that this false series uh, represents when she goes back over to the north card side and decides to play Dennis now, which is actually, um, you know, maybe a pretty good use of Dennis because he's so vulnerable to the Master of Puppets later on. So you get him out of the out of the game while Miamon has already passed. And also saying there won't really be resilience value if you don't care enough to push into this round, for example, because the Mahakam pass was clicked and the resilience uh, was was not happening on the Giant Slayer either. But Joe keeps on drawing yeah. into these bricks. Look at that. Uh, Last Mulligan, though, saves it. but. But no, no heat wave here, no curse of corruption either. So lacking a little bit of control options, but going directly into that round three, and we will be looking at a very similar uh, situation that we did earlier. It's going to be a super long round three. Joe will have last say, but he doesn't have the uh, order ability of the Mahakam Pass this time around, which helps get Shiru up to that high power for that big, uh, for that big scorch. So, um, and and this time Miamon has. The, the Siri Nova carryover, and he's got Vilgefortz in hand already. So a lot of different factors at play here. I'm not really sure uh, who's gonna be favored here. Yeah, I'm also interested if we can see sort of a direct double Golden Necker coming down from Miamon with the Asir setup because of the Fisher King. The Fisher King can actually set Asir as the top unit pulled potentially from the Golden Necker. So we could definitely see some shenanigans going into this round from Miamon. Yes, to avoid the squirrel that Joe has kept in his hand, but if Joe ends up keeping a squirrel in round three and the Golden Necker gets immediately put back into the deck, you're holding on to a four-point card. Exactly. Maybe maybe slightly better if you're able to banish something like that Orb of Insight, but I 
I figure by the time the Golden Nectar is played, the Orb of Insight is probably going to be triggered. Yep, that is a really good point. And off we go. One Master of Puppets was sacrificed uh, by Miamon here on the pass. Has it in Graveyard now. You don't need that many Master of Puppets in this matchup. Exactly. You really only need as many as you have Petri's filters, right? Because your non-zealed ones are all going to die. Seems to be the case. Petri filter going back into the deck as Ooh. well here. So the problem, again. the problem with the idea, your suggestion of uh, shuffling the Golden Necker back right away that is that anymore, yeah. Asir and Alyssa have both been drawn into Miamon's hand, so he can't play it off of the Golden Necker anymore. But here comes the Illusionist and creates this engine, the Elven Swordmaster, instead on to Miamon's side of the board. Of course, a prime target for Milva yes. to ping down when she comes out exactly. of the board. Exactly. So, uh, Joe doesn't. I don't think he's really that scared of this uh, of this Swordmaster. But at the same time, if you don't answer it right away, maybe it gets boo herded and it becomes actually a little bit harder to deal with. Yeah, these boo hurts we did see kind of the instant leader happening in the previous game as well uh, to just protect a card so that there is something uh, on Miamon's side as well to boost. With these very reactive deck from Joe, uh, it could be that the board sort of gets wiped and these plays become a little bit more awkward. Ooh. But here is... This Mata was so yeah. dangerous for Joe. He could have drawn any of these five provision cards left in his deck. and or he Milva. has. No, well, the Mata draws him his lowest provision card. Oh, you're right. So yes. he could have gotten all those bricks, but he luckily drew into a Saboteur. But unfortunately for Joe, he doesn't have access to his Zoneiromancy or his Curse of Corruption this game. And Curse of Corruption is going to be a very important card. All right, here we go. Let's see what the setup will be as a Seer currently is putting something back into the deck here. And... Uh, can you check what that was? It is was? false Siri, mm -hmm. because there is the Sangreal still available. Uh, Miamon may be looking to uh, combo that in one turn. With the Milted? Because Milted is also Ooh, here. So yes. that would be like the ultimate combo. We already saw the Siri plus Sangreal, yes. but add Milton to the mix, and he also gets to utilize that boost that will be put on by the Sangreal. That could be a really, really big point swing. Exactly. Milton would be able to uh, boost himself by 12 on his order ability after the Sangreal's played. Um, you've got also your uh, Tucson Hospitality leader that could combo with the uh, False Siri if you don't have the Sangreal at the same time to just to get out of, say, uh, range of an offering. Okay, uh. and Joe, on the other hand, does decide to play out the Maxi. She's yep. not doing too much here in round three mm. anymore. Right, no, no more ways to draw cards for Joe. Uh, we see a Filba Forts on the Maxi. Um, maybe he was trying to get Milva out with that. I don't really know. But what was the point of that? Because of the the new Vilga Forts, though. Oh, that he can't. Does he can't get the, No, that's yeah. right. So what was he going for there with his Vilga Forts? That is uh, interesting to see that it came out this early. I'm not sure if I can. Maybe put he my was trying to mill that. a squirrel, a squirrel that could have been pulled by Oniromancy. Yep. That, I, I could see that because he wants to do that before he plays his Golden Necker now that he doesn't have the way to, to make the Golden Necker come back, uh, go back into the deck right yep. away. Okay, that would be like a, a, a pretty nice thing that been, in case that yeah. girl was still in the deck. But of course, as we can see, it is there in the hand. Okay, so we have the Golden Necker played from Miamon. Uh, a lot of points and the first Petri's filter down on the board. And uh, I, I can't imagine Joe does anything else other than Squirrel at this point, yep. right? Oh, wait, what? I, I take it back. I take it back. Did he forget he has a squirrel in his hand? Or um, what's the That's a what's the decision great here? question. Was there a higher priority? Perhaps? Maybe. Let's see what is being damaged currently it's, here. It's it is the Van Morlaham Hunter, Hunter, and there's really not nothing active to get rid of either. Any kind of movement that you have to get or, was... or, or damage. So that squirrel not coming down here is definitely an interesting choice, considering now, just like you said, it, it does open up another Golden Necker. As we see, Alyssa in hand can put this Golden Necker back, and Tome can draw it. Yeah, maybe um, just played maybe played a little bit too fast. I'm trying to think if there's a, a, a logical reason not to squirrel there, and what else you might be saving the squirrel for. 
Um, so, Miamon is not going to give Joe another chance to yep. squirrel. He is going to play the Alyssa now and put back Golden Necker. And there's still an artifact, there's still a special, and there's still a unit left in the deck. So, Golden Necker will be getting full value here. Exactly. We are actually going to see. We went back on it and saying, no, we won't be seeing a double Golden Necker, but apparently. We will uh, Daw here though, coming up and clearing the engine, perhaps here. Um, rather just going for the value, putting Milva right back into the deck with that death blow. And um, Shiru, what, what do we think about Shiru here? The, the big kind of point swing, but right now Miamon's units are not really aligning. There's not much here. To, to plan this Shiru around, but here comes a big play. The Golden Necker into another Petri Filter and also into that Royal Decree. Yep, false Siri. And you can even play a Palmerin here as well. I don't know, I mean, Palmerin has to boost an unboosted unit, so uh, you're not gonna be able to continue boosting that same tall bronze that you already have. So uh, Miamon trying to decide if maybe the six point Fissure King is even better than the Palmerin, and that is what he's going to go for, just the Fisher King, because doesn't think he can really get... I mean, he could have boosted... No, uh, he couldn't have boosted the False Seer because the Boo Hurt gets played first. Yeah. And uh, here is the Fisher King. Does not really matter what goes on top of that deck, just a six-point play uh, coming down instead from Miamon's Decree. Oh. And uh, Arcane Tome has now been bounced, allowing yeah. Joe to find a Neuromancy Curse of Corruption, which are pretty good tools to have, uh, especially as we can see currently the Curse of Corruption target would be on Miamon's side of the board. And there is so much to take into account in this matchup. It is uh, very, very crazy, not only to spectate and watch and cast, but also um, as a player, as one of these competitors, uh, Will, he will now play the Squirrel and take the Curse of Corruption from the Arcane Tome for 17 points. The Squirrel ends up, I guess, banishing the second Golden Decker? And here also, the Buhurt is now enabled from the Tome as well. So um, that is something that can be played with Miamon. Uh, one with this Palmerin and Boohurt in the deck, so of course does decide to utilize this Boohurt here as well. As it goes onto the Siri, doesn't let that sit on the board. It takes the swing uh, immediately. All right, looking at Shiru potential here. As Miamon ends his turn, this Siri is gonna be at nine. The Milton is at nine. The Mata is at nine. Yep. That the, is, it's, you, got, is you, you take this, right? Unless Miamon can maybe use There's his leader. There's a Boohurt still. There is a Boohurt that can be used here from okay. the leader. But there's still a couple of units. All right. So Miamon aware that the triple nines was a big uh, threat. And he decides to use his leader at this point to get rid of one of the offset one of the nines. There's still double nines, one of which is an engine. Um, all right, Joe. Moment of truth. What are you going to do? You got punished last game for being too greedy and too patient on the Shiru. Is this now the moment that you take a, what is this? This is like a 24, 21 plus three engine points, 24 point Shiru? Yeah. If you want it Does right it now? Does it get better than this? Realistically, the rope is kicking in. You also want to find that Enerbancy from the Tome before it goes away, because you you can see that Miamon clearly does not have special cards remaining, as Joe knows exactly what the deck consists of. But he's running out of time. Yeah, it's, he it's has to... running out, and it seems like the Shiru is no longer an option. But is the Tome being pressed for that Enerbancy into something self heatwave on what Miamon would have stolen with the Master of Puppets here? Okay, and he's going to play the Enerbancy onto a Saboteur and hit down maybe this Fisher King? Oh, and he... The, the turn oh. was roped. I don't yeah. think Joe was even able to pick what card uh, came out of that Enermancy. I don't know, I hope so, because there were those Armorers workshops. No, I think he right? was able to pick because on the Spectator Client, you, there's a, d a bit of a delay in terms of when the rope ends for the player relative to what we see, but I don't think he was able to pick the unit that he targeted no. with that Saboteur. That, at least that much was clear. Uh, but either way, that rope definitely got a little bit scary uh, for Joe. And 
Two 11s two currently 11s, on the board yeah, here? I don't think you can get 11s because it's 7, 10, 13. Uh, 7, 10, 13, 16 would be with the vial. So the safe number, let's look at it this way. The safe numbers for Miamon are like 4, 5, 8, 11, 14. Those, those are like safe numbers for him. And the other numbers in between are shirable numbers, if I can use that as a word. Yes, shirable. It is a coin term today. <laughs> if something is shirable or not, we have two shiru related terms actually Schrodinger's shiru and now shirable as an adjective. Okay, but this Milva is also maybe going to help line some stuff up. Joe, I hope, I really hope Joe doesn't end up regretting. Um, you know, waiting on this Shiru again. But uh, we'll, we'll see. It's a 51 point lead, 52 point lead for Miamon. We've got a 12, we've got a 9, a 21. It's, it's really well spread out power. Two nines, sorry, two nines for Miamon again. Keep in mind there is a 9 as well on Joe's side of the board. That's Saboteur currently mm, sitting that at true. 9 as well. So if you do decide to go for the 9s, you might burn yourself in the process. Maybe you do want to burn that 9. That is your highest bronze. That is a good point. Maybe that's actually a benefit to scorch your own 9. So that would mean that the Shiru has once again opened up. It is very, it's looking very Shiruable at the moment, doesn't it? It is. So, <laughs> Would but it the come rope down is coming. Here? It's happening again. Joe just cannot decide on this Shiru. He's gonna run out of time. He has to play both of these cards that he wants to play in this turn. Take a long time to play. Shiru is on the board, but the rope—it's ticking. He's gonna go it for. Happen. It, he's, it was he's, too late. Was was this? Or was planned? it intentional? There's gonna. There's a lock. There's a lock, from. Arturius. Arturius Vigo, you yes. can lock that. And Miamon is, he's thinking about it, he's trying to figure out, is this a trap? Or can I just lock the Shiru and win the game? Let's see what Miamon decides to do. There is one Master of Puppets, but as you said, not many targets besides that nine to steal here. So that would then be what you're going for in the Bronze Department. Here comes a Create. Surely goes on Morlehem Hunter here to lock that Shiru that can still do damage. Yeah, a second a, a second uh, Puppet wouldn't even be that good, I think, because the, the second there you know, it is. second tallest Bronze is only the a five. The lock is coming down on lock. the Shiru, and Joe sure. did not once again get to use Utilize the order ability and burn the board. Joe lets out a bit of a sigh there as maybe uh, yet again another opportunity missed. Uh, 50 or 60 points, I should say, in favor of Miamon right now. This Simless and the leader charges are not going to be enough to catch up. And we have our third semi finalist of World Master Season 5. It is Miamon moving on to day number two over Joe. What decks, what a series, what an intense moment, and not to mention that tie. Look at Mimon, cool as a cucumber. Definitely, uh, well, he's maybe saw that coming after the lock was available on that Shiro. After that Shiro didn't happen, the Shiro could have been very impactful, but it was just completely, yep, yeah, run out of time. The rope got to Joe. The yes. rope got, got I, him there. I, I yeah. can sympathize with Joe, though. Yeah. Like, there's so much pressure in this in this big stage and there are so many different lines and options that you can take in this matchup you're never really sure what is going to be your best opportunity to you, like you're staring at like a 50 point deficit you know you need to be, get super super greedy with the shiru so it can definitely be like a moment of paralysis where you are not sure what is the best line and you just run out of time to do the best move and you just have to float the shiru absolutely i agree with that high pressure situation but now, we of course want to hear from Miamon himself after winning the series, as Borja will be interviewing Miamon post the series. All right, I am here with Miamon, the winner of this uh, quarterfinal, third quarterfinal of the day. And uh, I believe I have with me also Mayuko uh, standing by as a translator. Um, can you both hear me? I hear yeah, I can hear you. Oh, perfect. Mayuko, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask a simple question. It was an intense uh, match for sure. A couple matches that we just saw. How is Miyamon feeling? How, what's going on? What's going through his head? 
あ宮門さんとてもすごい戦いだったと思うんですけれども今率直にどういった気持ちでしょうかちょっとお聞かせくださいミュートになってますね You're probably muted. <笑>すいません大丈夫です。本当に嬉しいです。はい。So he's happy. He's happy. Me and happy. Very, very, very simple.、Um, anything that he wants to say about the matches? I, I know that there were some、uh, things that didn't go in Joe's favor, so、uh, I just wanted to kind of feel how he, how he feels about the whole thing. あもう少し何か今回の戦いについて言いたいこととかありますか特にジョーのもうすごくあの頑張ってこの結果になったと思うんですけれどもえっ、ー、と最終戦スコイアテル対、えー、ニルフラーズの戦いだったんですけど、えー、もしニルフラーズでスコイアテルを抜けなかったら最終マッチでえー、と僕の,あのミルクと,、えー、とモンスターが、えー、戦うことになったのでそのマッチアップが結構相性悪くてだから本当にあの2戦目にあの勝つことができて、えー、本当に良、えー、かったです、えー、もし負けたら自分が負けになっていても全然おかしくなかったので、はい、僕は勝てて良、えー、かったです So, so that match was that match could be uh, the match was、uh, Skoya Tail versus n e w f g a r d deck. And、uh, if、uh, Miyamon cannot beat、uh, that second match,、uh, he needs to、uh, fight against、uh, the monster deck with n e w f g a r d deck, which is not really good from his perspective. A perspective, so he's now really feeling relieved for achieving achieving the win in the second match. And he, he, already, he also t h i n k、uh, if he couldn't beat, if he couldn't win in the second match, he would be defeated in the third match, considering that the、uh, relationships with. Dex. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, he, in, in that case, he would not be favored with his matchup, but thankfully he made it.、Uh, thank you both for the interview.、Uh, thank you, Michael, for translating. And we will see、uh, Miyamon tomorrow、uh, in the semifinals. Thank you. And of course,、uh, we'll throw it over to Spessy for the analysis. Yes, thank you so much, Borja. We're going to crack straight on. There's so much to talk about. Look at this set of turns. This is all the way back in game one. It's nil nil. We see Joe Shiru do some burning, which, of course, later on, the burning from Shiru was severely lacking. And we're going to take a look at some of those key moments. But I just wanted to sh show you the sequence of about one minute. Like, we see this Shiru come through from Joe, and we're like, okay, surely Joe's got this in the bag. But then Syndicate just has different plans altogether.、Uh, I'm currently hiding the coin count, but currently Miamon has seven coins in the bank. And this Exora is just about to pop off. I'll fast forward a little bit, but suddenly, like the point gap just completely <laughs> changes. And Miamon was able to get ahead by just a single point here, still with three leader charges available. It was just absolutely obscene how many points. Uh, both players put out. Miyawan ended up taking this one, and game one, I would say, went about as well as it could have for Joe, but Miyawan still just able to come out on top in game number one, which put、uh, Miyawan up 1 0 in the series, of course. Moving on to the second game, it was a Northern Realms mirror. Let me just adjust this little bit in the middle here so we can see the whole board. And there was a lot of really interesting things、uh, going on here.、Um, I wanted to highlight the tempo pass here from Miyamon. So he's at six cards and at this moment decided to pass. And Miyamon is just a master of the tempo pass. I think it's the longer that the Gwent has been out, the more common it's become.、Uh, the, uh, I also want to just give a shout out to the Ildeko, who was absolutely popping off in round one here. Previously, she had to be inspired to give、uh, your card zeal, but now she just gives all of your. 
non-neutral card Zeal, and, and she was just fantastic. So me and one was able to get the Onsace, which was buffed up by Joe. But not only that, uh, Joe was also forced to play another card. And then if I fast forward a little bit later on um, into round number three, so me and one, round one went really, really well. It forced the long round, which is exactly where they wanted to, uh, that me and one wanted to be. And then we have this moment at the end of the game where the Earl is down on the board. We saw insane carryover from Miamon with the Idaran, the wagon carryover. Uh, there was a shoot which was getting damaged and then all the Reaver Hunters were just about to clean up this Earl. And I would have loved to have seen it, but Joe wasn't sticking around to see the Earl and cleaned up by the Reavers. And that of course meant that Joe had to get the reverse sweep and it started off pretty well for Joe, actually. Uh, they, they were able to come out on top. But again, just me and Mon's decks are just... Oh, one second. You cannot see this. Just one second. Having a slight issue with my OBS here. Um, uh, me and Mon was just able to put out an absolutely insane turn. Forgive me, guys, as I just fumble around with my OBS for a moment. Uh, we'll, we'll skip on to the next clip here, I think. Um, as this one is, is not working as intended. Uh, but me and one was able to play like Golden Necker, uh, put it back with a Seer, uh, just put so many points down in one single turn. The Arcane Tome was like bouncing back to Joe, who then got a Shoop and then a Heat Wave. Uh, my apologies that I just had a bit of a technical hitch there. And then we move on to the most ridiculous game. It was really the big one. So Joe got some points on the board. They had that humongous Erland at like, 60 points, and I'm really sorry that I'm not able to pull up that one and show you, but Joe was able to get that, that game three with that 60 point Erland, and they just discarded two cards. They didn't play any of their other golds as well because Vilgefortz would have put a bronze on the board, uh, which could have been um, then stolen by Master of Puppets. But then we have to talk about the tied game because even more excitingly, what Miamon just said is that if Miamon loses this game, they don't fancy their chances in, in the last matchup. So this is a huge moment. Right here, look at the rope. This is how long was left on the rope when Joe decided to play Shiru. <laughs> that is not a lot of time. And what ends up happening is Miamon somehow masterfully managed to do some insane maths and work out that uh, it was impossible for Joe to, to line both of uh, their cards up. But the Shiru just floated on the board at 14 points and it ended up not killing a single thing. Now, Miamon actually had Vilgefort stuck in deck as well, so this should have been completely fatal for Joe. But Miamon didn't have the Vilgeforts available, so it wasn't able to, to punish it. But this, this Shiru never ended up burning anything. You see the Vilgeforts stuck there in the deck. And um, of course, this one ended up being a tie as well. Um, and it was just just ridiculous. Uh, a single point it came down to. I'll just replay this this last little moment. We saw a self heat wave uh, on like um, Joe's own 42 point bronze card um, at points. Uh, you can see the master of puppets with the Petri's filter just putting in some serious serious work. The heat wave comes through on the 42 point giant slayer. The vitality is ticking along. The leader charge from Joe here comes through. And it was just mind-blowing that such an insane game ended in a tie. And then, of course, we had to run it all over again. And it was another story of the rope. Because in the this game, we saw Joe not you know, take too long to make a decision. And perhaps that was on their mind at this moment. I've got the, uh, the clip paused here at the exact moment which the turn is going to shift to Joe. And at this point, Miamon has just played Golden Necker for the first time. And as Shin and Seelie pointed out, there is a squirrel in the hand of Joe. But just look at how quickly Joe decides to make a play. Just doesn't really, we, we just saw how long they roped. Okay, this is the way this, but they played this pretty damn quickly. And at this moment, they like kind of freeze and they're like, oh, Wait, maybe I wasn't supposed to do that, I think. And uh, I was with Lionheart and he also pointed out the fact that it's very, very early uh, in Asia right now. So perhaps um, we could attribute it to, to that as well. Uh, obviously really, really stressful games, just insane maths going on here as well. And then of course, there was this other huge moment of rope. There was actually a couple of them um, where we saw the rope come through here 
Uh, this time it wasn't with Shiro. Oh, it, it perhaps was. Let's, let's see. There was just so much going on. I almost can't remember. But again, Joe roping all the way down to the wire. Shimiri squirming in his seat. The self heat wave on their own card. Uh, again, just missing out on a few key uh, key points. But the even bigger one, the even bigger rope that happened was just a couple of turns later, where again, Joe is just roping all the way down to the wire. I'm sat here pulling my hair out. It's so tough to watch because it happened again. Look at how late this Shiru comes down. And of course, it ends up not burning anything. It ends up getting locked by Miamon. Miamon victorious, commiserations to Joe. But I have to say, Miamon, what an entertainer. Like these decks are just obscene and I really hope he is able to continue on. And I think I, no one would say that he doesn't deserve to win the tournament just based off his lineup alone and, and try to cement himself as a Gwent legend. But what a series. I had so much fun watching it. I'm going to send you back on over to Shinmiri and Sealy for the updated bracket. Thank you, Spessy. That was a really good analysis and recap. Uh, I, I, it's th that series was so amazing. I just got shivers just watching those clips back again. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I do love that Spessy was said that the kind of emphasis on the stressful situation there. We were sweating a little bit here. Joe was probably as well. So was Miyamon, and yeah. so was the other Joe, the analyst Joe, <laughs> <laughs> sat there at CDPR. We were all really nervous. But uh, as Miyamon said in the interview it ended up working out uh, because he was really scared of going up against that death wish deck from joe there are so many different factors that contribute to 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 what happened whether you know it's uh an unfamiliar deck that you're playing against, high pressure situation, you know, the lack of sleep, maybe the time zones, but whatever happened, Miamon is moving forward to the semifinals in day two uh, with a three to one victory over Joe. That's right, and let's take a look at that prize pool again to see exactly how the money has been distributed. Uh, very similar to the first series that we cast, Shinmari, uh, as the result was 3 to 1 in favor of Miamon. Yes, and he gets $2,500 already with a much bigger prize uh, still waiting in day two in the semifinals and the finals. I believe there, uh, yeah, there's a total of $42,500 prize pool for World Masters Season 5, so still the lion's share to come. And uh, today we have one more quarterfinal for you, which will be casted by the lovely ghost uh, Aria as well as Lionheart. And it will be Kaneki Yamori, the uh, winner of the midseason tournament, and Pyable, the number one crowns point player from this entire season. That's absolutely right. I cannot wait to watch that last series. I'm sure a lot of us has anticipated it as well. Of course, Pyable uh, has been around when it comes to Gwen for quite some time, also very successful at it. And he is here to hopefully snatch another World Masters title, is what Pyable is hoping, of course. Uh, Kaneki, on the other hand, also just a fabulous player, such a good achievement in the mid-season tournament. It was a joy watching Kaneki as well. So let's see uh, as these two giants sort of go head to head uh, later on in the next series. Before we get to that, we have one more special guest for you. Uh, let's take it away. Let's see who it is. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for that introduction. That introduction and Shema Daniurai. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, taking the time and leaving the watch party, making it through the snowstorm all the way to the Gwent Tavern. Uh, and we finally get to meet in person. You are yes, a veteran of Gwent. Mm -hmm. I feel like you've participated in so many events, but now uh, we actually get to meet in person. So how does it feel to you know, be here in person with the Gwent community and everybody? Oh, uh, it feels great. Honestly, I would say right now, I think I feel like a Make-A-Wish kid because <laughs> I finally got to have my interview in person. I wish it was as a player, but uh, it's the best thing we can, we can have I'm, as a spectator and I'm enjoying myself so much and yeah, it's been great. That's so nice to hear, yeah. Uh, you still very good player, you nearly made it to the tournament yourself, which uh, lets me believe that you still have a lot of insight into the game and a lot of knowledge and you know the players that are participating very well as well. So do you maybe have some crucial insight into who's going to win the whole tournament? The whole tournament. Well, so my unbiased opinion is that I, I want Fireball to win, <laughs> but um, 
my my uh, divination challenge is uh, Sanvanti versus Paya in the final with Paya winning. But I think no one in the community would have minded if uh, Mayamon won the whole thing as well. That would that would be pretty cool, I would say. Okay, so I did learn one more thing earlier in an interview that Burja had with quite famous ex Gwent Pro. Uh, and so I wanted to ask you, do you also have a TikTok now? Nope, never will. All right, and that settles that. So before we close out this interview, is there anything else that you would like to say to the community? Yes, I would, I would like to say um, it's been wonderful five years that I've played this game. Um, it is the best game I've ever played, even though I've cursed it so many times throughout my um, journey and my sanity has never been better uh, since now that I've retired. But yeah, I love this game. Uh, even all the Reddit and Twitch chat people that have flamed so much. Um, shout out to everyone who worked on, on this game, who um, participated in the tournaments, who watched them and yeah, the entire community. I've never, f I've never found a better community uh, in any game than Gwent, no matter what I've been saying for many years. The game's great. <laughs> well, I must say it's also people like you that build this community because uh, we were very grateful to have you as a Gwent player. Uh, that also entertained the people in interviews, but also on camera during the games. It was always a pleasure having you there. Thank you. So thank you very much for coming over here. And now uh, the next step, we're going to take a look at our next two players that are coming up. Uh, and then after that, we're going to throw you to the bracket while we set up our next pair of casters. Okay, so hello, I am Kaneki Yamori, French player for Team Elderblood. I am 21 years old. I am wi uh, the winner of mid-season tournament. And my favorite Gwent moment was when I first qualified to an Open because I was one of the player um, that played for fun. I was a casual player and I didn't think I would ever qualify to such a tournament like this. So qualifying for an open actually was my best moment, like I was really happy for a while and this was even better than winning the mid-season tournament, I think. So I learned today that I was facing Payable, he is obviously one of the best players of all time. And I was talking with my Teb teammates uh, today before the draw show and I told them that I would be okay facing anyone anyone else, but not Payable, because his lineup is super great into mine, and he's also a great player, so I think I got bad luck, but I still believe I can do it. So hello, I'm Payaball, and I'm just a random Polish kid that likes to play children's card games. And you might have seen me in a tournament or two, uh, but my favorite moment from them is when I won my first tournament series versus Kolemon, uh, because it was the Dragon Slayer moment where I killed my own ship, so he sacrificed his own Kulturis. And that won me the game and the series, and then later on I managed to win the Gwent Open and then Gwent Masters afterwards. It was like the start of my competitive career, I guess, and it's a moment I will always remember. Alright, um, so Kaneki is a really nice guy, and I really like him, but I think he's gonna struggle against me a lot, because I have a pretty favorite lineup against him. And he also has a pretty troll Nilfgaard deck. Uh, but I mean, I wish him good luck. He's uh, probably gonna need it. <laughs> and yeah, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic before my series and also the whole tournament because I only really wanted to avoid uh, drawing Magpie because I think he's the only person that has a favorite lineup into me. And well, he's on the other side of the bracket, so that's kind of perfect for me too. So I'm honestly really happy about this bracket. Welcome back and 
Oof, what a series we just <laughs> had. But we are back for the last series of today. I'm Ghost Aria and I'm here with Lionheart. Yes, you are. Hello. That, you couldn't take a breath for a single moment. An incredible series. We now know three of the four semi-finalists, but there is still one more to go. Oh boy, it's Pyabolt and Kaneki that we're going to be dealing with next. That is quite the series. Can we follow up the last one? Well, I, I hope we won't, because otherwise <laughs> we will be finishing that drops today. We might just, we might just. Wow. Okay. It seemed from the player interviews that Pyabolt was quite confident into Kaneki's lineup, and Kaneki was a little bit nervous too. But I think we should check what everybody else thinks. What about those divinations? How have people seen this? Oh, and the people have <laughs> clear vision. 2020 nearly. Yes. 79% of people think that Paya is winning this series. They do. Wow. They agree with him. They do agree with Pyabol. Now, of course, I don't think I've ever managed to cast a series or an event where Pyabol wasn't in, where he wasn't the significant favorite among the community, which you can understand. He's a lovely guy. But we have so, so much for these, right? This is going to be an incredible series. This is, but the interesting thing about it is that we haven't seen these players last weekend. True. So we haven't seen the decks either. I think it's about time to have a look at them. Yes, let's start off. And we're going in first with Kaneki Yamori. And Pyabol described this as a troll Nilfgaard list. And I will try and give you a little bit of context to it. You might be looking at it and thinking to yourself, okay, it, this is Nilfgaard. And of course, it is running all of those flanking engines, which typically cause a lot of problems. There is a decent amount of power and removal in it as well. Heatwave, Yen's Invocation, Vilgefortz, the risk, and of course, the risk of that Traherne as well. But the weird card, uh, weird I suppose is an objective term, but you've got the Angloem in there. Now, this Angloem into the current meta, there are lots of amazing locations, scenarios, things that you can steal from your opponent. An interesting choice though, is there are no spies in this list for Kaneki. So as a result, if he did manage to grab a scenario, he would not be in a position to proc it. While you mentioned that Kaneki didn't play last weekend, another player, I believe a friend of his he prepped with Puzzle Express, did uh, in the first, first weekend of World Masters, and this exact list went 0 and 5, so Kaneki really will be looking to try and turn that around. His next list, though, a little bit more staple, Off the Books Syndicate. And you say it's a little more staple, but while we know syndicate-wise, we mm -hmm. all know it, dream about it, have nightmares about it, on ladder, True. in tournaments, basically everywhere, because this deck is all about vice. Mm -hmm. It's all about maximizing the coin carryover to trigger the vice cards as many times as possible, and that is the Archontia and Ixora. And uh, so these two cards, if you manage to get all of the open sesames, then you have, I don't want to say unlimited, but a lot of coins a available lot. to you. Yeah. However, Kaneki decided to not go with the usual poison package here, but instead brought your favorite engine, <laughs> Townsfolk. He, I've, been, I've always been a fan of the Townsfolk, I'm not going to lie. It's great to see them here. I'm not sure it's the best decision. I think the poison package could have added a little bit of oomph, but... We will see how it works out. I would love to be wrong about that because I love Townsfolk in this list. We will see because this deck recently, all with the addition of Madame Serenity, got a little better because Madame Serenity is able to thin and bring two really useful engines. So maybe, you know, all in all, it will end up working for Kaneki. Next up is Patricide the Fury. It is, and this Patricidal Fury list, it has a lot of power into it. It is all about, well, there's plenty of rain in here, but it's realistically a beast deck, a crucial card that you've got to highlight in this. It's the Corrupted Flaminica. Now, a card and its art that we've always loved. It is just, it, it's terrifying, horrifying, but beautiful in its own way. It boosts itself by two for each unique beast in the graveyard. The beauty of Skelliger, as you saw in our earlier series when we were casting, you can usually play these cards in multiple rounds. With a list like this, all of the ability to get many, many beasts into your graveyard and use this as an original slam, you then have another opportunity to replay her again 
into a second. The list has some elements of control. It is mostly, though, the rain that's hitting. Of course, Kertrold, it is becoming quite the staple for Skellige. Sov in there just for all of that goodness as he has fantastic beast synergy. It is going to be curious to see if he can deal with this one. But we also have Guerrilla Tactics Squirtel too. Yes, once again, we have the Milva very aggressive, uh, very heavy red coin deck here. Mm -hmm. So we've seen it before today, we've seen it last weekend. Uh, you want to have your finisher Dennis for as many points as possible, but as we've seen already today, this deck has a lot of control. The one thing that could be problematic for Kaneki is that he is starting on blue coin yes. and therefore will have overall more blue coins than his opponent. And this being a very deck that prefers red coin, he could struggle to find the right moment to queue with it to win. That's very true. So those are all the decks that Kaneki is bringing. So let's have a look at Paya. And he is here with Imperial Formation. He is indeed, and look at that glare. That is the glare of a past champion trying to make it two times as champion. His Imperial Formation list is a little bit more standard. There are a couple of strange things in there that I'm sure you will see, but it is Renfrey Soldiers. It is all, again, the Renfrey, of course, being one of those key cards. No matter what you say, I love the art and I still really enjoy this card. Renfrey, of course, can give you a curse and a blessing and it can be incredibly game-changing. You use your entire leader, which a list like this really enjoys doing, protects all of those engines, but then still has the added benefit as well of another leader ability, several of which, it depends on what you pull, but there aren't too many bad choices for Renfrey. Let's be honest, it's a fantastic card and a brilliant set in this. It will synergize well with the number of units that are gonna be stacked on the same row as well. You have Triss in here to boost all of them up. It is a powerhouse and it can be really, really problematic to face. Now, the card that I didn't talk about was the Cyprian Wily. I adore that we're seeing Cyprian Wily here, I'm not gonna lie. Pyre refusing to bring Traherne with him and I have never respected him more. It, of course, can be really useful into lists like Syndicate Vice. It can banish the boat, deal with low-value engines, things like that, which can actually work really, really well. An odd choice, but maybe it will end up paying off. The next list that he has with him, it is Blood Money Syndicate. And we are going to see another Golden Necker Syndicate. So we've been able to see this just on the last series that we've casted. So it is your Bounty Poison uh, with a little bit of a, a different twist. And that is because Paya decided not to bring Mata no. to make sure that he draws that Golden Necker. Instead went with Fisher King, which is the kind of like an old school version. I'm getting a vibe from mm -hmm. Paya's deck that he's bringing the good old Tried version Tried and tested. Them. Yeah, and that makes sense because Paya has spent some time on <laughs> Gwent Leather, let's be honest. So we'll see how this one performs for Paya Ball, because we know Syndicate can be a little tricky uh, when it comes to tournament performance. Then we're going to see one more, or maybe, no, one more, one more overwhelming hunger. We are, and this one is Death Wish Dagon. I love this deck. It is a fascinating, again, very, very clearly blue coin deck here for Pyreball. That Urn of Shadows is an absolute giveaway. The Arrakis Queen is really the one that benefits from that, so you can struggle if you don't have access to it. And he has been a little greedy in terms of whether he's going to find it. No Aneeromancy in here because he wants both Heatwave and Erendite and Detlaf Higher Vampire and Eskel Pathfinder. He has gone really top heavy here. He does have Royal Decree and Whispering Hillock respectively, of course, to be able to find the Brewers, the Dagon or the Arrakis Queen in the right moment if he can find it. Plenty of backup points with the Succubus and also the Dolduloch as well. It is a fascinating list. I don't expect to see Infinite Dagon here, the second version. He has been promised and indeed delivered all the way to the end of Gwen. It's going to be a scary matchup, I think, for Kaneki. Finally, it is a little bit different. It is Squiretel Precision Strike. And I am so excited to see it. So this, <laughs> uh, this is a little different than the Guerrilla Tactics that we've seen, but in 
essence, it's very similar as well, because the finisher that you would ideally have in this deck is again Dennis and the Armorous Workshop played by Simless. However, instead of uh, going for Milva and more control, uh, this Precision Stride deck goes for Great Oak and Swarm. So I think it's really important to highlight Eudora as one of the cards that is definitely significant for this deck. Because Firstly, Eudora makes this a 24 card deck because she just disappears at the start of the game. Love that. Yeah, it's good. It's yeah. good consistency there, right? And then she shows up again with Zoltan. And what that makes possible is say, it's another buddy on the row making things like the Great Oath easier. So I think Eudora being one of the latest addition to Gwen uh, has really quickly found a deck that works for her greatly and I'm really curious to see how this deck will perform. Next to that I think I'm really, uh, you know, there's another thing that we haven't seen in a while and that is the Commander's Horn. <laughs> yes it is. I, you know, I, you know, it makes sense with the row stack. Why wouldn't you go for something like this? And we'll see how that performs for Paya. We will indeed. We now have our players' deck lists. Some very interesting lineups, and you can see. Pyabol, definitely a veteran of the esports scene. One of the things that's made him great over the years is his ability to work out a meta and decide on a target. Is that going to pay off for him here with his potential aim at guerrilla tactics from what it feels like? Is that going to work out for him? Or will Kaneki, against what they both seem to think, pull this one off? I will get to see that pretty quickly or maybe in a few hours. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? Maybe we'll see another tie or two. Oh, no, don't. No, no more tie. The only tie here is this one, I assure you. And it's a beautiful tie. Thank so you. So let's keep it that way. Let's keep it that way. But the players do have four deck lists and they will be dropped down to three each as we see these bands come in. Kaneki, of course, here does not have access to his Syndicate deck. Okay, and Paya will not be bringing the Nilfgaard. Okay, some interesting ban choices there. From Paya Ball's side, I can understand banning this Syndicate list. We, well, you mentioned earlier about having an issue for Kaneki where he seems to have a lot of red coin decks, but a lot of blue coins to play. Well, that Syndicate list was his definite best blue coin list. Oh. So that could mean Kaneki will struggle even more than we thought. We're finding things to play on blue coin. Then. Has he got proactivity? We'll find out. And of course, we will not be seeing Renfrey Nilfgaard as a result. No Nilfgaard here, and I think I know a few people in our community that will certainly be cheering that. But we have a huge series ahead here now. Indeed. And I see you've changed your opinion. I, 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 was, I was bullied into it by several people in the Gwent Tavern. I was adamantly told I could not support the Great Sun anymore, so I'm a Monsters player now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, hopefully that will, uh, you know, uh, maybe gain some more popularity for you. Let's hope so. The, the final two, this is the last quarter final of the day. If you've been watching along for the whole time, you definitely, definitely can have claimed the first drop by now. Make sure you do it. You do not want to miss out on that card back. Definitely. So you need to claim the first drop and then you will start getting the hours in for the card back. We're nearly there today. So if you've been here all day, you should be pretty close. Maybe. But make sure to come back tomorrow either way to see who will be the winner. But you know what? I'm getting ahead of myself. Of we don't even know who's the final semi-finalist. We don't. And that's what we're here to decide. Now, Kaneki is starting. He's going first. He's on blue coin in this series. And one of the things he's going to have to really try to do is get this Nilfgaard list through. He was a little bit worried about it himself. Paya also passed comment on it. We did see it struggle in the mid-season tournament this version last weekend, played by another one of the pros. Wonderful player, Puzzle Express. He had a bit of a tough time with it. Could it be that he starts with this list to give it as many opportunities as possible? I think it is his best chance from blue. Yeah, and sometimes that is the choice players make, mm -hmm. that they will take the weakest uh, deck in the set list that they have and they will try to get it through so that they know that they can. Because yes. they are more sure about the remaining deck list and they therefore kind of have more control over what's happening in that series, right? Yeah, of course. And like from... From Kaneki's side, he'll be more comfortable with his red coin attempts, so he will probably use the blue coin attempts to get that through. He has up to three of them, of course. The Scoia'tael match, that Guerrilla Tactics, mentioned briefly touched on it that it seems Pyre's lists are targeting it somewhat, so even on that coin, 
it will be crucial for him to find a way through. And that could be decisive here for Kaneki. On Pyreball's side going on red coin, he's, he's got a variety of choices, honestly. He kind of has a luxury of riches. We will not see monsters. I am adamant. I've, de I've determined I will be right about this once. We're not going to see the monsters list on red coin, but we could very easily see perhaps his syndicate as a result. We could, or we, it could be even the Squirtle one. Possibly. Possibly, but yeah. Uh, it's unlikely it's going to be the monsters, I but I... So. I don't think Paya is the type to surprise us with that kind of cue. But I hope he doesn't know. hear you because he's just going to mix it all up now. That's oh. what's going to happen. Oh no! <laughs> I did I jinx it. Maybe, maybe. No, I, I, I think I can very much see. The, it's potentially the mind games between the two players now, because again, expecting maybe Kaneki's chances to surprise Pyreball with his cue order to push some of these decks through. The Gorilla Tactics list is typically very red heavy. But if he's worried about Pyreball targeting it, will he flip it? Well, he did indeed do just that. Kaneki has gone with Squirtel here on blue coin. And Pyre has brought the Syndicate. Of course. Okay, so that will be interesting to see. Ooh. So Kaneki here looking at his opening hand. It is a handful of bricks as one would expect with this list. The uh, difficulty with Dao and his rock in hand but is shuffling away, holding on here to that, perhaps indicating he doesn't intend to use it in this round. Instead, it's the backup plans that disappear. Okay, Empire is still to do one more uh, mulligan. Let's see, what did Pyre miss? Well, by the look of it. And no, well now his head is much better out of nowhere. That golden necker wow. uh, will definitely come in handy, right? Who needs a Fisher King when you can just be talented? Pyreball says. Now we could see the opening to this and one of the problems with this list is a distinct lack of proactivity. Pyreball will be acutely aware of that and he's currently looking at the lineup here and thinking, okay, do I stay uninteractive? Do I perhaps drop my own Conjurer's Candle here? Because of course, this list is also very reactive. But dropping something like Kendall can be quite problematic because Kendall only stays around for two rounds. That is very true. And as a result, you don't want to, in any syndicate list, spenders are pretty vital. And one of the things that makes Kendall great is its ability to be that spender that's difficult to interact with. We've seen he hasn't taken that line. He's just dropping the poison onto the board, challenging Kaneki and saying, you know what? How about you now put something on the board? Give me something to play with. And I'm looking at Kaneki's hand and I'm... There are a few bronze dwarves that could be played right now. That could be the option, but uh, the offering is useless for now. Yeah, unfortunately not able to work right now. We do see just the dwarf drop down. It's not the best target for Pyreball either, so it's not too bad. Bonus, if it gets poisoned, you aren't exactly missing a whole bunch. Kaneki though, this is going to be an uphill battle from here, especially with the hand. A bricked Dao is unfortunate. Well, it's not just Big Dao, it's also the Armorous Workshop, and also Dennis that you don't really want to play in round yeah. one. This hen is not looking great for Kaneki here. No, but on this side, he does have nine plus four vitality on board if he is in a position where he can actually find a unit to stick on the board that he can keep, he will at least find himself a useful pass. And that's what he's going to be hoping for. We see Pyreball just easily grab himself a little bit of hysteria to again force some proactivity from Kaneki. And from Kaneki, we might see the Dwarf Berserker coming down, perhaps, for being the card that can stick and stay around. But instead, yeah, we're I believe seeing the offering. The offering yeah. Constantly. And we don't know what was boosted. Maybe we can uh, yeah, check Yeah, let's later. find out what did he choose to boost in the deck here. He has gone for that Shiru. So he's pre-planning, giving himself a little bit different range here from the Shiru. And I, I know we've talked a lot about Shiru in open deck list, but I actually think the knowledge of Shiru deck is kind of, you know, every, every second of the game you know he's there and he could come and scorch you. That's true. You can see there are so many things that you have to think about, so many decisions you have to make, especially at this level, especially against the very best. So you just never know. Pyreball just actually finally dropping something down that can be interacted with, expecting Kaneki to full buff here. This to me seems to be him saying, I don't think you can deal with this in one. 
I'm not going to lose this round on even and I'm going to get myself out of here. That makes sense. So it's an interesting uh, situation here because Kaneki is really kind of done here. Uh, yeah. As far as the things he wants to spend. We could see the Witch Saboteur being uh, played. Maybe the Heat Wave as well. Uh, meanwhile, Pineapple has things to play and will play them. And he does indeed. He's just taking it slowly here. A couple of choices. Could have played the Tesha Mutna Sword for 10 and removing the armor, so 8. Could also just have dropped his own Siri for a single turn. Right now, he is technically he's behind by 13, but it's actually 14, 15, 16 points. So he's got a long way to go to catch up here in a single card. He can play the poison, but you don't really want to give morale. Instead, he takes the Tesha Mutna Sword, thins through the roach, and gets himself there in one foul swoop. Doesn't use the Siri. You could see him considering it in the last turn. Just a threat, but no, that is where he goes. He takes round control, but Kaneki will be happy just to get out of that round unscathed. Uh, hopefully fixing his hand as oh. well. It's not looking great. It's getting worse, honestly. <laughs> because now there oh, are and it's brick so after brick. many bricks still happening for Kaneki. Uh, the Dao still bricked. Yeah. Simulus isn't, because he can take double backup plan here, and actually in this matchup, double backup plan to potentially clean up a couple of spenders or some awkward options, probably more useful to him. He has to change up that strategy a little, so I'm not surprised to see him prioritizing that. He will be very sad about the Dow being bricked, perhaps expecting uh, Pyabol to give him an easy out here. It tickles me greatly that backup plans are the backup plan for <laughs> yes. Simulus. I can't get over it, honestly. I mean, it works, you know. It works, but it's just... It's on the nose, but I like it. Indeed. So Paya putting down Siri and basically asking, can you deal with her? Yes or no? Well, there's the option to heat wave it, but it's a risky choice because leaving Candle unheat waved doesn't feel great. Once again for Kaneki, he is sat in a spot where he doesn't really want to give anything that's here. You do have, of course, the option of the Dwarven Chariot here, but it's such a powerful engine in this series. He does decide to play it, though. Remember, he is on eight cards, so as a result, while he isn't ahead, if Pyabol does take the pass here, he will be okay. He can still play one more card. It could end up being Simless almost, but it's such a big yeah, card to I give. would give the Witcher, honestly, in this situation. If that's the case, I'd give the Saboteur. Pyabol taking every second calculating his decisions. With the hand he has, is he going to be more favoured into a longer round, forcing again a bit of reactivity and just constantly, constantly damaging? His leader ability is currently a seven removal, of course. So I'm not sure. Paya seems to be thinking like till the last second, mm. do I stay? Uh, is it worth it for me? And decides it's not. So now Kaneki needs to deal with the situation. Like you said, it could be the Witcher. Um, it seems the most, it seems the least problematic card for me. He could decide, you know what, I don't want this carryover for you, so I'm going to Heat Wave, which is definitely an option. I'm not convinced it's the right one. The eight points probably not going to be the decisive factor here, he says out loud. But no, he takes the line. The Heat Wave on Candle will probably be worth a lot more, and we get our first long round three. Well, let's see if Kaneki can fix that hand first. Yes. It could be a short round as well. That's if it's very true. Bricks. Okay, so it's looking a little bit better. He has to be very, very conservative with his mulligans, I think, and hopes not to draw a brick here. He's draw ah, oh, and you can see he's absolutely devastated. His everything is brick, brick, brick. He gets a maxi, a squirrel, and then his simless is now also bricked. The Dow unbricked didn't draw the Milva, but that is not what you want to see. Oh no, that is really not great for Kaneki here. No, but on Pyabol's side, however, he has a he has almost an embarrassment of riches on his side of the board. Multiple spenders, lots of offense, but we have seen crazier things happen. So let's find out how are we going to get started here for Kaneki. Is he just going to give up the fact that he has something perhaps that he's not so keen on and play something like the Milvau early? No, it's going to be an Aneromancy instead. No, it is a squirrel, never mind. <clears throat> yeah, it was squirrel. There's no open sesames in this uh, deck. So the squirrel mo was more likely uh, one of the bronzes that was played before. Yeah, just a tech choice, really. Yeah, uh, so I'm looking at Kaneki's hand. And I'm... 
Uh, uh, so is he. <laughs> yeah, we are all probably just wondering how is this going to go down for Kaneki. So meanwhile, Fireball basically has everything he needs. Uh, Golden Necker will be bringing the Salamander's hideout. Um, so that is really, yeah. Uh, is he missing anything, Pyre? We will take a quick look. As you can see, though, that one backup plan has managed to remove the tunnel drill. On Pyreball's side, both of the Blenheim brothers are gone, and Ignatius Hale has found no real value yet. Okay, so there, there are some things that... Yeah, and he could was... also get Fisher King, which wouldn't be great. True, true. Uh, we'll see how that goes for uh, through the Golden Necker as well, because that only brings the top unit. You don't have a control over what that car brings for you. Uh, meanwhile, Pyre could be creating more poison value here. He could. Or maybe go for uh, the guard. Possibly. In some matches, the poison would be the right call, but he's going to be, and he has taken it. I think he was weighing up this decision, thinking, am I going to get enough value from this when you consider my opponent clearly doesn't want to play too many units here, and it's going to be, is it going to get the value that I'm hoping for? He did decide on taking it. I think if he had other spending options, if he found one of the infinite spenders effectively, that he could put some points on his side of the board. He may well have taken it, but didn't fancy the guard there and instead just holds the poison. And we're seeing Maxi from Kaneki. Just to have a look at the things that uh, he's missed. Yeah. Which, In what order did I not get my cards? Which, how many more times do I need to mulligan to finally unbreak this hand? And the answer was quite a few times. I think so. It can be really difficult with this list because, of course, the similar sometimes is one of your bigger plays, but the thinning from it is something you rely on. Normally, you'd also want to try and use the Dow, but it's so many, it's so much value and removal against this is premium for him. It's a really difficult situation, but we still have eight cards to go from Pyreball yet as he looks for a target, starting to finally get those bounties going and does drop one onto Maxi. Just simply that it's six base power is beneficial for him. Yeah, it's more coin than the others, makes sense. Uh, Kaneki doesn't really have engines on board right now or anything that would require a removal. No. So it's really up to Pai to just choose the target he likes the most. Yeah, and that makes sense. For Kaneki's side, though, he does have heat wave and bearification. So now the candle that needed heat waving can just be turned into a harmless little bear and a heat wave for anything really threatening that you just need to get rid of or a bunch of points. So it's not all bad here. As we can see, he is taking every second to work out what his next line is. Ideally, he probably wants to remove that Salamandra assassin. He's worried about a single turn of poison next round, but he's trying to work out what the value of it is. And I think this, Oh, okay. You know what? He takes the poison out of the equation on the board instead. And that makes sense because we haven't really seen Milva doing the control that she usually does in yeah. this deck. So it makes sense to utilize that a little more. Uh, you mentioned the uh, other bronze, the Salamandra Assassin. I was thinking that could be removed with the other backup plan. It could have been, yeah. The Simless into that backup plan was definitely one of the options, but he's left it alive. And now Pyreball kind of has a decision here. Does he try to finish off that bounty on its own and then develop? Because he could use his leader ability to do that, play the Caleb Meng and put a bounty on a seven power unit as a result, keeping alive that assassin and its threat of poison, using it all in one turn. It's a, it's a big set of options. If he's willing to do it, he could also just use morale, but you want to save that a little bit longer, I think. We'll see, because he is taking his time. He's making me nervous. Yeah, each time this happens, <laughs> I'm like, am I missing something? Yeah. Is the player disconnecting? Oh. Is that... But we just seen the candle drop down, and that makes sense. Paya can just set it all up for the perfect play. Having candle and potentially knowing if it's getting removed can be also really important for the rest of the game, because then you know if you need another spender or not. Very true. Now, he didn't spend at all with it. Instead, valuing the five coins that he has from it. Kaneki, when they're taking their time here, it might seem, oh, it's so simple, just use the verification. It's going to be one. It's so simple. Obviously, there's also the risk that maybe the Salamandra hideout's a better choice. Which way around do you want to do it? But they have to consider every interaction. Remember, these series are open deck list. So there's no surprises in terms of what your opponent could have and you have to consider every option. 
indeed, and he decides to go for the verification. I was also thinking if maybe Kaki is trying to keep it for later for the Mahakam Pass perhaps to get some more True. points for himself because he seems to be struggling to get points and to get things stick on the board but yeah, uh, <clears throat> the candle being the spender uh, definitely makes sense to get rid of that and Paya Ball meanwhile just plays another Brunt He does, he now, he templated that so he had just enough coins to finish off that bounty as one of the things he, he's also spending down to four coins, getting some bleed value here, he, trying to make sure, expecting perhaps this unit to be removed. He's seen one backup plan played, he might be expecting another available in hand, trying to get value out of this spender while he can to put things into reach for easier cleanup later. One important thing to remember is that if Kaneki wants Dennis to be worth any point, he need, ideally needs at least two uh, units next to each other with armor. That's true, and that's one of the things Pyabol is working on right now. How many of your units can I get rid of? All four bleeding stacked here. Interesting choices. We do see that second backup plan now, I'm sure. No, armorer's workshop to protect. Thank you for uh, proving me entirely wrong, Kaneki. You were very confident about it. I but... was. I thought he was going to remove the spender. No, Pyabol not happy with that at all. But the important thing is that uh, bleed goes through armor. It so technically, does. that squirrel could be gone pretty quickly. Uh, but yeah, Kaneki just decides to protect little of the units he has left. He does. But of course, that play also signals to Pyabol here that Simless was a single card, which means it must be bricked. He now has a read on the hand. He knows for sure that the other Armourer's Workshop is in the hand. Yeah, or, uh, so now we know that Paya is aware that Armourer's Workshop is one of the hand, uh, things in hand. Kaneki has access to the other backup through uh, on Iomancy. If he really wanted it, yeah, he could definitely do that. Uh, we, obviously, we know that's there. I think he'll be trying to line up a Shiru, maybe taking Mahakam Pass, or I don't think he's going to find much value here for the Curse of Corruption, but we will see. He does still have full leader at this stage, and he is now weighing up his choices. Is it worth playing this extra, uh, the extra Armourer's Workshop, to try and save this? Well, the, the Poisoned Unit also has Bounty. It makes no sense to protect that. Instead, he is just fortifying his armoured options elsewhere. But decides not to spend a leader to move Caleb that is row locked. Which yes. is an interesting choice, because I, I was thinking about the backup plan and things, how to make, uh, move the Caleb. Then I realised there's a full leader for Kaneki still there, waiting to be used. There is. I think his biggest worry is as soon as he moves something, if he can't kill with Milva in the same turn, she has to stay out on the board and she's definitely not surviving. And that's a real worry. He wants to maximize all of this if he can. It's a scary situation as now the morale comes down too. I think that might have to go. There is, however, now for Kaneki, a possibility of a very, very tasty five power Shiru if he wants it. He has a five of his own, which he will have to move, but Pyabol bleeding away, perhaps trying to think of that possibility as well. But Kaneki can now have a tasty Shiro indeed, and that would solve his issue with both of the Rome locked uh, and units that are now on board. What are we going to see that happening? I can see the hovering around the environment and like, it's, we're all there. It's a choice. There. Is he going to take it? Yes, okay. So he should move his own squirrel first. He buffed this up earlier to five, remember, and now he is going to aim for as many fives as possible here. He can actually get four if he moves as well. It is a huge swing. That is the biggest Shiru I've seen in a little while there. Four units gone, two of them threats. Then that suddenly looking much better for Kaneki. Wow. However, Milva is now staying on board. It also makes sense when you know you're close to an end of a, of a game. Milva is three points on board, and that could be more than what that kind of being locked in the warrior of, oh no, I can't do anything, and Milva will not do a death wish, death blow, that is fine. She's now just three points on the board, but helped greatly with setting up that Shiru. Definitely, and I think that's going to be something that you might see later when you get Specimen here, as we do see a spend pinging multiple units down to one, giving them bleeding as well. Pyre very keen 
to prevent these units from continuing to exist. The reason, as you mentioned before, of course, it is the value from Dennis. And now Kaneki has a difficult choice. Uh, does he play Dennis to make sure he gets at least some point out of it, some points out of it from the front row? Or are we maybe going to see Heatwave on the spender? It's really difficult. It is, because of course, the sooner you go tall as Kaneki, the more chance you are giving Pyabol of finding a way to remove them. He still hasn't seen the Golden Neki yet, so he's probably aware that Pyabol has access to it, or he will certainly assume so with the way this is going. He takes the heat wave here on the more aggressive of the spenders. So Paya uh, also has leader. I'm not sure how big the leader is currently. That nine already. So it's nine whole damage as we do see the golden necker coming down. The purify not ideal, but a bounce is <sighs> okay. There were better choices for him for sure, but he does get a few coins in his pocket. Hysteria here, and now the poison possibility opening up. And this could still be enough for Paya. Because uh, if the leader is spent, then there's not much armor left. Correct. Well, in fact, he could destroy it in total right now. He could leader to remove the elf here. There might be no more Vriad Dragoon. There is a bounty on it. There's probably a decent incentive to consider doing it for Pyabol. He's weighing up his choices and he does take it. That is a, uh, a big decision. Probably the correct one as he plays out those extra two points of bleeding as well and then it simply cannot be that useful as he usually is as a finisher here as there are no two cards next to each other Empire just plays it out to well, bring... well, yeah, he what does, could that uh, be? Uh, he takes the Ignatius Hail and Pyoball here racing into a 1-0 lead his Syndicate list has made it through that was... But that was pretty smooth for it Paya. It was, it was. A difficult situation, Kaneki pushing with the, it was a really awkward list. His draws were very unfortunate there. Had the extra mulligan, but it really didn't help him when he was going first. Found brick after brick. His lo he wasn't able to gain that round control. Never really able to establish any control in that situation. And as a result, 1-0 Pyabol, but now they flip. Now they flip and that means Kaneki will have the red coin, which could be the better coin for him. I think so. So will we see the Scoia'tael again? It's a possibility we'll see the Scoia'tael again. We have yet to see the uh, the famed Nilfgaard list. I'm, I'd like to see it. I'd be very curious if it's the one we're going to go for. But getting the Guerrilla Tactics list through is just as important, of course. So is he going to try it? The fact that he gave it a shot on blue coin originally maybe believes, maybe he thinks that if he draws well with the extra mulligan, it has the chance. So that could be exactly what we see. Equally, I wouldn't mind seeing Patricidal Fury here either. You know, we haven't seen Skellige for a while, it feels. And it does, yeah. it does. Well, they are not messing around. These players are keen to go, and Kaneki does give us the Nilfgaard list. Pyabol, it was no real surprise. This is definitely his templated blue coin choice. Deathwish Dagon. Has he drawn his options? Well, he does have access to the Bruis. He also does have access to Whispering Hillock, which will give him a chance, of course, to grab either the, uh, to gather the Dagon. Okay, so Paya, you know, maybe it's the experience. The more cards you mm -hmm. <laughs> shuffle and mulligan, the more talented you are with your draws, <laughs> we'll see. Kaneki, meanwhile, uh, so yeah, like you said, this deck didn't perform really well for Puzzle Express, who brought it previously. Um, so maybe uh, it will do a better job for Kaneki? Maybe. Well, he's going, he's taking it on red coin. He's going second. It is the kind of list that perhaps can try to be very aggressive, take the round, take control of it, if he can do so. Now, I did mention Pyabol does have access to this Bruis, so he can double thin in this round, provided, of course, that she survives, may even decide to use a leader. Is he gonna open with Dagon first is the question, because in terms of removal options, this list that he's playing into, it's more engine-based removal, aside from the heat wave. I would, ex he doesn't, he just takes things slowly. Okay, well, Paya is just testing the war and saying, okay, what is it you have? How did you draw this time, basically? Ooh. And Kaneki, 
what is the game plan he can have here? Because I, I see the illusionist that is not useful at all right now. I've seen a little bit of flanking there, so that could be something that Kaki will try and develop right now. Yeah, the flanking engines can be fantastic. Obviously, battle stations as a card can really help you ramp up quickly. You get to play two bronze cards and then draw two cards to replace. It is... It is a powerhouse of a card and it can help you develop multiple cards at once. And when you want flanking, well, why wouldn't you want two different cards on the board at the same time to give you that? It's a really nice little combo. He instead here just opens with a Diplo looking to find something. Uh, instead, he gets a, a Solano Harpy with nothing to consume here. Does keep him ahead. And obviously one thing to consider, Pyabolt is running that Aerondite. So each turn Pyaball is ahead, that Aaron die is getting stronger and bigger and that could end up being a real threat to Kaneki's engines because the Nilfgaard one, well, definitely wants the unit to stick. It does. Now, the normal line with this list, as we say, is to thin with the Brewers, double thin with the Brewers potentially, get so many points and so far ahead from your opponent that you win the round and you rely on the power that it has in its normal cards later. Pyabol has played into this Nilfgaard list a lot and doesn't feel, by the look of it, that he actually needs to give that much commitment to potentially take out this round one here. He can hold it in his back pocket, he can use it when he needs it, but for now, he is just slowly, slowly, slowly doing his thing and trying to get the value. And meanwhile, Kaneki is playing the first flanking engine, and I think that can be really risky against... Uh monster's death wish especially when you're mostly trying to annoy your opponent and remove the stuff they have and then you run into somebody who's like okay yeah do it, it's about yeah very much so this list again a nightmare for the gorilla tactics list completely the reason he has chose to bring it because it does hurt certain lineups Kaneki now it's he's made his choice you can see the engine being damaged pyabolt slowly going for the consume and just keeping everything ticking over and alive there once again ahead, still no stratagem played, doesn't really feel that he needs to as it stands. His Aerondite has grown every single turn, putting it at three already. And the gap between Kaneki and Paya is just slowly getting bigger and bigger, and Kaneki needs to start having things on board. He does, but of course the Slave Drivers, every Nilfgaard player's favorite best friend, delivering two of those engines now does make it a little harder to play against as they really do deliver. The leader ability, of course, protecting both of them, but every turn your opponent plays a card, these will damage it by two. So four power units will just die all on their own now. And even if there are more than four power units, uh, they then lower the value of any consumes that Paya could possibly run. Correct. So that actually works pretty well for Kaneki it, there. It does, but you were right in saying that if, let's say, a four power Death Wish unit comes out, actually it might help Paya Ball to play it, as he now makes his decisions on what he would like to do. Taking every second here. It does, of course, have bonded harpies, so he could choose right now to play the bonded harpy just to get that extra value. It's the most he's gonna get. He really is taking his time here. Paya, you Paya know, doesn't, doesn't want to make a single mistake. Ooh. And clearly, you know, it's not worried about the ropes as much as we are. He, he does not fear the rope, this man. You can feel my heart rate rising with every increasingly loud tick as we go here. He is now ahead by the nine points. Of course, it's only five in reality because of the engines on the other side of the board. Kaneki here. It's getting a little awkward for him, realistically. The Battle Stations does not want to play two bronze cards in his hand right now. Squirrel doesn't have a good target, and Illusionist is definitely not the one. Equally, Ramon is for later. Not ideal. Could take something like a War Council. That could be okay. Doesn't really want to play Ivo this early either, because the round has not gone long enough. So it's, it's not exactly where he would like this either. So basically what I've heard right now is that Kaneki doesn't want to play a single card he currently has, but decides wow. to go for uh, the Ramen. Uh, interesting choice, because there are some things in the graveyard already to be played. There are, yeah. But I'm not really sure how is this going to work out for Kaneki. It's enough points to put him ahead. It's a big card to commit for such a small benefit and gap. 
Interesting choice. Obviously, normally the illusion is a great target. You're not going to get the best options in this matchup typically, but there are certainly better available than that. Something like a succubus would, for instance, have been far better for him if he can keep them going and Nilfgaard be Nilfgaard, do its own thing. Pyre here just commits carryover effectively. That frog will be brilliant for him a little later. Just slowly, slowly. They are bringing the pace back down, giving us a chance to really appreciate this semi-final. You know... Quarter-final. They care about our US that are waiting for the drops and they want to make sure that everybody gets them. But meanwhile, Kaneki plays the second Illusionist. That makes sense to commit the second one as well once you already played the first one yeah. and get as much value as possible. And almost doing the thing that Nilfgaard does the best and that is playing your strategy better. Pretty much, he finds himself a consume and he also grabs himself a Death Wish unit. Really nice from Kaneki to all of a sudden swing the points well in his favor. Pyabol being greedy with his cards so far, holding on to those wonderful golds. Now he needs to find himself a lot of points to get back in touch here. He can definitely do it, but how? Well, we also still have the strategy on board, mm -hmm. which is not something we get to see very <laughs> often when you're this deep into round one. And Paya finally decides to go for it and plays it out, bringing two of the foglets, also consuming, so thinning, wow. like you've said, four cards are out. This is how Paya got the point. It makes sense. It was, it was something that you typically see earlier on in the round. He was hoping maybe to be able to hold off on this ended up needing it. That swing was huge. 25, 26 points there, really putting himself back in contention. Did have to commit a leader ability though, in order to ensure that he didn't lose that extra thinning. It's not just the tempo now, it's the consistency for those great cards later, right? Definitely. And uh, so now we're seeing that Kaneki is going more into the round one. Makes sense, because uh, He's finally starting to see some value out of Paya. Because so yeah. far Paya was only committing bronzes, but now Kanki's like, oh, finally a gold card. So I need you to not have it in round two and three, right? Yes, and he's decided to play the Ducal Guard front row here with that and the leader charge to boot. Interesting, as it does boost for him. Paya Ball taking the pass here. Makes sense, the Aeon Knight's still growing, being pretty big right now and Kaneki now needs not too many points which makes it awkward though. It does, they very do, but he's got, it is difficult here because the squirrel isn't quite enough and you'd love to use the squirrel on an air and die in a little while. Heat wave, well we don't need to tell you how good heat wave is right now, battle stations answers itself and Ivo is a phenomenal amount of points. Right now he is boosting himself by a lovely 10 but it's overkill, you don't want to do it. Of course, those of you may be thinking, but but the engines, no unit was played for Pyreball last turn, turn, so these Ardfian light cavalry are unfortunately helpless. And instead we're seeing the full use of the location. He does. And now we're going to see the Squirrel then? I'm very curious what he's choosing to play here. It must be the Squirrel, it's the heat wave instead to remove the carryover so that toad is gone. One of Deathwish's struggles, of course, if it can't consume. Okay, well, we'll see how that choice will work out for Kaneki or maybe what Spessy has to say about it later. Yeah. So Kaneki now uh, into round two with a card down, right? He is, yeah, obviously he won the round, but will he bleed against this list is the question. Still not drawing amazingly, but of course that battle stations will fix all of that for him. Well, there's, there's the card we all love to see. Uh, Traherne has turned up. Uh, it's a little late in the day to be relying on a Traherne, and as a result, I'm not surprised to see it disappear. It can be an opener, but not necessarily what you're looking for elsewhere. No, it's a little late, like you say. It would have been better in round one, so it could just be a Nausicaa Sergeant for <sighs> Kanaka here. Again, but though, that's also... Awesome. No, 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 it could not be. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's also a brick. <sighs> So Kaneki just decides to pass. At the speed of light, he passes. Well, Paya has no issues with that, really. He's happy to go for a long round three, right? Seems so. The long round, here we come. Paya decides there will be a toad in my graveyard and you cannot stop me. As the heat wave is gone, that means the day gone 
if it can survive somehow, which I don't think it will, could just go forever. Yeah, but we now see some possible answers for Dagon in Kanekisan. It could be the Yenbo. It could honestly be a lock as well, because I'm not sure if Paya is running any uh, purifiers. Uh, this list, I don't believe, does run any purifiers. Oh, it does actually have a Naglfar Taskmaster. It does have a solitary Naglfar Taskmaster there, but he draws the Squirrel instead. Uh, not going to be the most useful for him in this situation, but all things considered, when you can see Detlaf, you can see Arrakis Queen and a very, very sizable Erendite already, it's going to be a really interesting one. Kaneki's side, he can of course play multiple units in one go, no battle stations committed just yet. Yeah, and then we also see the Angluem on Kaneki's side, and like we said, this is an interesting addition to the Nilfgaard deck as it's doesn't really synergize with the rest uh, like we would normally see. We don't yeah. see Duchess informants, stuff like that, that would normally help you a little more being the Nilfgaard player, but here it is. And yeah, unfortunately for them, it isn't a scenario this time. It will be the value here just going to grab. Is he going to go for the Thrive unit here over the course of the long round, maybe? Yeah, it's, it's definitely more it value is. than a scenario, but equally still very limiting because Kaneki could not pick other things because then he doesn't have access to consumes Correct. or anything else that monsters But Nilfgaard need. finds a way, you know, I, or that's certainly going to be Kaneki's hope here. He is staring down the barrel and you can see he's leaning back right now. Uh, perhaps not exactly what he would have hoped this would have gone. Pyre running through every possible decision in his head. What would he like to do? Is that actually going to be one of his removals? Is this where the Erendite drops in? Or do we just Arrakis Queen here to get the extra value? That's the decisions he's going to have to start making. Yeah, uh, we'll see if uh, Paya just goes more greedy and uh, solitaire, basically, creating the things on his side of the board. And that's exactly what he goes for it right is, now. It is, and I love this decision. I was waiting to see if Paya Ball used that last leader charge. It's open deck list here. He knows Yen exists, leaving that Arrakis Queen on the board could have been fatal because of course the card that she steals goes to the top and battle stations is going to help you draw in the round yeah so it makes sense to immediately consume it with your leader having another death laugh down and ready which is a lot of points for Paya Ball. he is looking you know quite calm about the whole thing honestly so far for him yes so good uh, there is locks available for Kaneki if he chooses to try perhaps and limit that debt laugh of course locking it will mean it will no longer function if it is consumed is it going to be fast enough though 30 points down he says I'm gonna have to try it what are you gonna do about it yeah um yeah, oh, leaders also, as well there. yeah Kaneki also getting some of the thrive while you leadering Trying to close the gap pretty early though. Yeah, just deciding he wants an additional leader as well. He's trying to ensure that that survives. Maybe he hasn't quite counted the Erendite value. The Obviously, because you could just kill this armor as well. The uh, Alba Cavalry. Slave Driver can play others. More and more locks can be really frustrating. Against Nilfgaard, it's one of the reasons they can be difficult to play against. Nothing gets its value, right? Yeah, nothing really gets to do what it's supposed to do. That's usually what Nilfgaard likes. Yeah. But here, I'm not sure if Nilfgaard can pull it through. Meanwhile, Paya hasn't started uh, with Daigon. We haven't seen the location yet. There's a lot of options for Paya. There are definitely a lot of options for Paya Ball here as he's weighing up. Is it worth... He's just going to take it slow by the look of it and drop a squirrel. He's saying, you know what? I'm going to give you some time. I don't need to do anything yet. Let's just let the Erendite build and let's make you play other things. It almost feels cruel now looking at Kaki's hand. Because uh, are we going to see <laughs> the battle stations finally? Uh, not yet. I think this is just another squirrel coming down. Potentially, it can get rid of the succubus, I would imagine, as while that set hasn't been created yet, she has indeed disappeared from the graveyard. It won't necessarily be the line, but it could have been, like certainly from Doldalock and maybe then that decree, right choice from Kaneki. Not what he wants to be doing in round three, really, but still. Well, yeah, it makes sense to get rid of that uh, just in case. Kaneki also try, uh, taking it slow. This really, this game has like an interesting tempo. Yes. 
it feels very careful, like if they're taking each step with so much consideration and kind of just like playing the player more than the game. Yes, taking every available second here, making sure that there are no missteps, of course, even at the highest level, it can definitely happen. A variety of factors can contribute to it. We've seen a few over the course of the weekend. Both of these players would very much like not to have that happen here. Yeah, they would definitely want to be there tomorrow for the semi-finals and finals. And now we see Kaneki finally winning uh, a little more, getting more cards, and they look much better. They do indeed, as he manages to choose the two bronzes to play. Lots of good engine value. Gets some, okay. The Vilgaforts he'll be very happy with, the Traherne and also the Battle Prep less so, but he now does have a little bit more tall removal in his arsenal and a lot of points of swing as well dropping down here. Makes sense, that kind of closes the gap for Kaneki. Vilgaforts will be very useful later on. So what is it that's left for Pyreball? Pyreball right now is still able to grab a Succubus, a Purify, Eskel, which will destroy a primary category as well. And the Dagon finally does drop down here. It, I, you would expect it to be answered relatively quickly, quickly from Kaneki. Quickly from Kaneki, he says. And the Yen drops in. First I think, try. Yeah, first try indeed. Maybe he was holding this until after the battle stations had been and gone to prevent that potential lose condition. Yeah, you were explaining that earlier that Yen bought putting the card on the top is then Pretty dangerous with battle stations cause for, for the opponent because that is the card that we will draw. So now uh, battle stations being gone, but Yen was still reacting pretty quickly. Dagon is no more. Dagon is no more. Well, he is, but he sits in Kaneki's deck. Actually, no, he doesn't because he's doomed. He doesn't even go to the top, actually, now I think about it. Dagon does not do that. As Dagon. a result, it doesn't matter. T scratch everything I just said. Dagon promise, disappeared. <laughs> promise for so long and then just deleted. Yeah, Dagon gone. Day, day gone, gone indeed. It's been a long Day's day. Gone. <laughs> day, day yes. Dagon has definitely gone as we see Pyreball taking every second he can here to make his choices. Which is he going to go for? It is the Eskel and he takes the highest value removal here. Yeah. And there is so much more removal from Pyreball. There is. Uh, the Kaneki doesn't know, but we know. Uh, the Aerondyne, the Heatwave, there are not that many big targets on no. the board, actually. No, there's not. This list hasn't really grown a huge amount. Kaneki missing a few bronze cards, some engine value, but it is an uphill struggle here. For those of you keeping track, that Aerondyne is a whopping 15 points here. He has <sighs> delete. 15 point removal and a consume to trigger as well. Uh, no real useful triggers on the board after that lock, of course, but it is going to be closer than I first thought with Vilgefortz's big tall removal and an Ivo worth currently 15, 16, 17 by the end as well. Yeah, I was thinking about Ivo, how, how many cards have been played, how big is that gonna be? And it might end up being pretty close, but we see Fireball just playing another card, distributing the, uh, the card so that there's not one that's super tall, really smart. Yeah, doing his best there to uh, reduce the value of that tall punish. There's already a 15, there's no need to give a better shot here. Kaneki taking it slow. Battle prep also trying to reduce, making sure nothing goes too tall here. Pyre looking in a strong situation up 22 points here with an Aerondite, maybe one of the biggest you'll ever see at 17 power. So Pyre could potentially, uh, you know, have lots more points after this, no matter what kind of key does with World of Wars. 15 goes away, Bronze 5 comes back in. It does, and I think it is going to be all said and done in this series. Pyreball has 17 more points. Ivo is also 17 more points and the status quo right now. They are going to play it out. It is those final seconds. Nice there, decides to remove the Thrive engine, knowing what's coming to reduce the potential threat, but it's not enough and Pyreball, 2-0. It ends up only five points difference, you know? It's not that much. 
I was Ow. it was looking rough for Kaneki, not gonna lie. It was, but like you say, it was actually very close in the end. The players took a long time over those decisions. You can see that in those moments, micro decisions can make such a massive impact. What do I lock? What do I remove? And when do I do it? When do I play my cards? Because I know that there are certain things that my opponent can do that would not work right for me. Okay, well, <laughs> two, two zero, zero so for Fireball. Far. Will we see a reverse sweep right now? That's, the, that's what Kaneki now needs to do. He needs to line up that reverse sweep to try and bring this to be 3-2. I, I did say earlier, we never get 3-0, so don't get planning to go anywhere yet. I'm sure there's still a lot of mileage in this last quarter final. Pyreball now, he is back on red coin. Yeah, and the last deck that he is bringing is, I believe, the Precision Strike. He, he, he has Precision Strike and three chances to get it through, two of them from its preferred red coin as well. What, however, well, Kaneki has everything left. He can kind of take his choice. He knows exactly what Pyreball's bringing, and that does give you some amount of knowledge. It gives you the advantage of being able to pick what you're facing, right? But like you said, Pi attacked against that girl attack this deck he quite heavily. So that one's not favorite. The Nilka deck seems to be pretty cursed. <laughs> not it's a struggling. Not a single win for that Nilfgaard. And yet, you know, we got so much hate for that Nilfgaard pin, you changed it. I, I did, yes, it, it had to be done, it had to be done. And Monsters, however, have done very well since I changed it, I think it's fair to say. We shall see what's coming. What does Kaneki do here now? He's already made the attempt at the Squiretel list from Blue Coin, and it didn't pan out. He knows that he's playing into this Precision Strike list. Precision Strike, a list I love to call Brick City. The only list that bricks just as much is, of course, the Guerrilla Tactics version. Do we see Skoya v Skoya, your dream matchup? My dream matchup, but however, this time, I know that will sound unbelievable, but I would rather see the Skellige. I, you know what, I'm here for it. I would like to see each of Kaneki's lists just so that we can see where he plans to go with it. I think he's most confident in the Patricidal Fury. Mm -hmm. It's the one we haven't seen yet. I wonder if as a result, now is the time you have to bring it. Get yourself on the board. Of course, every single game that you win gives you a bigger chunk of that prize point. It's not a small amount either. It can be a big, big difference in your prize pool. True. So even if you know that you're not making it through with that Skoyatel and Nilfka, it might be worth it to queue with the Skellige just to get a little extra more from that prize pool. Very much so. Well, we don't have to guess. And you know what? We guessed right. We did. Love <laughs> to see it. Kaneki here wants to get himself on the board, not looking too happy so far. Is this where it turns around for him? Pyreball, 2-0 up, aiming to try to get to day two. Will this be 3-0 or is the reverse sweep on its way? Well, we'll see if Kaneki will be able to not only get the skelly get through, but also the remaining two decks. But not, you know, let's not get ahead. Yeah, we've got plenty of time left ahead of us as both players have drawn considerably better this time around. Um, a lot of beasts in hand for Kaneki. But of course, this list is chocked full of them, so Sov will still have targets, I'm sure. And he is just getting underway nice and early here. Maxi makes sense. Uh, just being Kaneki, I think you want to know what you're drawing. <laughs> yeah, it's not got that. That's been rough for him so far, to be fair to him. So, yeah, it makes sense to take out the element of surprise a little bit. The Flaminica being there at the start is mm. tempting. It is. However, some of the other things you might want to. I don't, I, I don't mind it. I would probably keep this. Knowing that you can thin those fish through, he has enough rain to make that possible, it means he's guaranteed to find both Flaminica and Fakusha, crucially, between round two and three, if he decides to go that way. Uh, I don't know what he's done. We will find out. Yeah, if Flaminica is the first card, then we know that Maxi decided not to shuffle. And we also have seen uh, a double thinning Roach and the good boy, Nickers. Yes, best boy turns up, both of them thinning through all together there as Pyreball responds very rapidly and just drops down a dwarf. I wouldn't say the best boy, by the way, with Geralt, uh, the best boy being so He close. can be best this this boy, it's okay, fine. Okay, good. <laughs> that would be Borgia's dog, Geralt, to clarify, not the actual Witcher. Well, you never know. In <laughs> Maybe the he's tavern, here too. <sighs> you never know. Wind is howling. Indeed. Wind's howling. 
Okay. Sorry, Dog Cockle, I apologise. That was terrible. What are we going to see from Paya? Because we have some cards that we don't want to see. Like Dennis, definitely waiting for later. He does. It's a, it's a great well. hand. But it's too strong, right? Yeah, it's a great hand later. True. Now, is he going to... Okay, so he just uses that on a single power, and he's... Is he dropping a squirrel here? Pyabol feels like he's uh, not necessarily too worried about this round, given his hand strength, but that's another unique beast. That is curious, however, because we've seen in this deck that Corruptive Flamenica can be played twice. Correct. So if I was Paya, I might have been saving that Squirrel for a little bigger, maybe more precious target. But <laughs> Paya decides to just get rid of that. Maybe it's because he doesn't want to commit anything else. We'll see. It's a possibility as we now see the rain coming down. Is he going to trigger and get the rain on both rows to thin through the fish here. A lot of his rain value is on the board right now, and that is exactly what he does. We can see it is the Flaminica that he draws as well. We now know. Maxi didn't shuffle. Correct. And uh, the, the ship, uh, not the ships, <laughs> the fishes are out. And can we just take a second that we can see Scepter of Storm in the Masters, because that that uh, it's, card's not common. It's beautiful here, but it fits really well in this list because it isn't necessarily a rain deck, but being able to thin through, it makes a huge difference because it can give you the tempo value. He finally has round control in a series here, which you'll be really happy with. And now more consistency. Look at the draws there all of a sudden for Kaneki. He's got Flaminica, Care Trolled. Uh, this is, it's where he wants to be right now. It's so much better for Kaneki right now. And meanwhile, Pyaball uh, has played the Squirrelers, so Double Flaminica could be a thing here if Kaneki really wants to, I believe. Let me just check. It is on the cards. Yeah. I'm just checking if uh, Kaneki's actually bringing Reet, though. If he's bringing... Uh, Sigrita. Uh, no, it doesn't need it. He'll use, he'll use Fukusha. Yeah, true. Because you, of course, okay. want the deployability from it. You want more it. beasts yeah. rather than... Definitely, else, yeah. uh, which she also is, incidentally. Probably doesn't get the value because she has to be on the board, but you it means know. you get the deploy value from it, which is what you're looking for. Kaneki might consider, though, just taking a longer round, sets up his care trolled here. The amount of value that this location can play for is terrifying, even just once. We saw the other way around when you were looking at a list that was trying to set up all of those armored units, drop down and pair for a big finisher. If you remove the units, you don't get anywhere. True. So Kaneki uh, still can play one more card and then comfortably leave if he wants a long round three. But do you think he's going to bleed here? I th if I were Kaneki, I would be bleeding down here quite heavily. The squirrel has gone. He has the setup to be able to play Flaminica not once, but twice, knowing he's drawing into the Vakusha. So I certainly would be if I were Kaneki, but I'm not Kaneki and there's a reason Kaneki is here. So. It, we will see. We will see. He has plenty of choices. Currently, this Flaminica has one, two, three, four unique beasts. So it's not too impressive right now. I'm sure he would like to increase those numbers before he starts playing. And we still have a few beasts that can be played before the end of the round. So we see the Kraus, we could still see Squirrel. So Kaneki has things to put into the graveyard to make that Flaminica just a little you know, a, more a little bit more, yeah, yeah a little yeah. bit more power Impactful. to the punch, definitely. Now, it's he's still above seven cards though, so Pyabol toying with the idea, what am I okay to commit? He knows Kaneki does still have a potential squirrel, will be nervous about dropping his own Aneromancy. Equally, Precision Strike is a really useful leader ability for removal. It's also often used for thinning to give you better draws. Pyabol saw that he had the two at the very top when he played Maxi. Does that mean he will leave it alone or and guarantee to avoid them by mulliganing well? Well, like you said, this deck is a little bit of a brick city. So even if it's not the Sentinels, it could still be the Armourer's Workshop. True. It could still be the backup plan. There are a lot of things that you don't want to draw being Pyabol. That's very true here. And this is the moment for Kaneki. Now, I... It's, he can definitely play on here if he chooses. He's got a hand and knows he's drawing him well to something that will help him. We do see that bloodthirst come down. 
A crucial engine in this matchup is this Dwarven Chariot. Are we going to see the full leader to make this Champion's Charge a possibility on that? What is he going to do We're here? We're instead going to see Sov just Ooh. for those extra points to wow. make it more difficult for Paya to catch up. That is a huge amount of points as well. A massive swing. Kadeki saying, OK, take me seriously. Let me see what you've got now. Show me how you get the points. Because now we have Ooh. the Bloodthirst engine ticking as well. And Kaneki has, you know, played things that he doesn't mind playing. That's very true. He has given himself a massive gap. He's going to say now, you need to come find me. Catch up. You've got 38 points that I need you to find. If he, he I, I still think you'd go deeper here if it were me, but it's, it does give him a little bit more control. Pyaball slowly, meticulously doing the maths here, thinking to himself, what can I give? What's the least I can give right now? And we'll see what that ends up being, because it could be the backup plan. Oh, seamless it is. It's seamless. And he is saying, I'm going to remove your bloodthirst. This isn't necessarily about the armor here. This is more about denying some of that bloodthirst. Did he rope out on the second one? Oh, we'll get to see. No, no he, he didn't. Okay. Either he didn't or he got very lucky there as all, more of the bloodthirst vanishing. Smart line there from Pyobol trying to prevent value later on. Maybe even autopilot went is working for Pyobol here. Yeah, it's possible. It uh, is. Now the rain value hits but against all of that armor, it just gets absorbed. So still no bloodthirst, but Kelpie, of course, can be an engine the other way. Whenever a unit takes damage from rain or storm, it'll boost an unboosted allied beast. Well, there are plenty of those. The crows are all sat here, and but that armor keeps on eating it up. Yeah, we'll see if they get any value from it at all. I'm, all, I'm curious here, right? So we have seen Simlas and therefore the Armour's Workshop being played. Yeah. How's Dennis then getting his value? Or is Paya willing to commit Dennis in this round? Well, I mean, for the gap that he has, it may well be a sensible commitment. If uh, in a longer round, Dennis will still find some value from the Mahakam Forge. And if it is still there, of course, from the other Dwarven Chariot as well. Equally, it might just be worth playing it right now, honestly, when it's his turn. He is just taking every second here, and he does finally decide that that's the unit he's got to give. Maybe Pyro just wants to give us enough time Maybe. to explain all the things we have to it's say. It's very kind of them both to go that way. Verification, and it's now on your own side, so it's a 10 power. But in this list, that makes a lot of sense, because it's another unique beast. Yeah, a nice little bear. Just joining the graveyard Doing good for work. Flaminica. That sounds horrible, but either way, let's skip over I mean, that. Let's skip over the card art of Flaminica and we'll, uh, we'll move on um, from how harrowingly accurate that is. Right now, Kaneki is in control here. He's 20 points up in a situation where the round is going the way he would like it to. As it stands, he can potentially double Flaminica if it goes his way. Now, Pyabol does have access to a heat wave. Kaneki will be worried about that. And Kaneki still has that squirrel ready for Onayomancy, if possible. Mm -hmm. So it actually makes sense that Kaneki decided to stay here and just kind of get as many things into the graveyard as possible. Yeah, now, Pyre Pyre... taking eternity here. He's just playing out the leader. He hasn't even played a card yet. I don't know if this is the client or he just... Good Lord, that was every second. Oh my God, we will, you know, the wrinkles yeah. that we'll get after casting this. <laughs> Pi have heard us that you want better series than Maimon and Joe. Well, let me show you, because he took that, that entire gap and just made it up between his leader and then as well the commander's horn. What I said was a great position for Kaneki, looking a little bit worse all of a sudden. Remember, this Flaminica can be played twice, but the graveyard hasn't necessarily grown a huge amount here. Yeah, not yet. She's going to be much better in the next round. And right now, Kaneki will not find the value there. Instead, goes for the lock. He does, yeah. And again, there was no engine value to that lock. It's just a body points. Trying to find that extra bit of bloodthirst does grab one. Uh, one extra bit of bloodthirst, so it's now at three as we see the backup plan drop in. Makes sense. Kaneki just trying to now not lose the card 
and maybe get it back. I'm not sure because this is really suddenly flipped a lot around and now Paya is the one in control. He is. Now, the short round is still great for Kaneki, even if he decides to hold on to Flaminica, he will have some great choices of things that he can potentially bring back with that Fakusha as well. If we get there, of course, we are not done yet. Pyabol working out with every second what he would like to heal, what he would like to buff. Because the heal here is very useful against Bloodthirst, again, trying to deny more value for Kaneki. Uh, staying ahead, comfort not, not comfortably, Just. but staying ahead. And Kaneki now has a choice. He does. Corrupted Flamenco, like you've said, isn't it's, really... I mean, it's plus 12 right now, so it's a 16-point play, but you're worried if you're Kaneki. These are the points you're going to need to win that short round. Is there any way it's worth doing? Uh, he's in a situation where currently Champion's Charge is back to just being five damage. If the Bloodthirst had maintained, he's got a huge 13 or a 12 point removal. That has just been removed for him and he has no new way of getting it. He just, he takes the pass and he is so lucky here that the odds of the guaranteed rain hit on two units were, and you see, he thanks the sky. So Pyabol now has to play one more car. Kaneki is just, I don't think wow. Kaneki was even hoping for that. He was just like, I'll take the pass. It was his only chance and he does get it. You saw Pyabol roll his eyes in frustration that the armor didn't save him. He does have his first Aneuromancy though, so he can literally just play his worst card out here. Yes, that could be what Pyabol chooses to do. Just on or something that you don't really need to run through, or at least not having to commit something like uh, the Mahakam Pass or some of the engines you really want to keep for later. If this does end up in a reverse sweep of this series, that brave pass from Kaneki, that dice roll, could end up getting there. This is a choice. We, he finds the Dwarven Agitator and just ends up giving armor in hand to his Zoltan. One of the things that makes the Zoltan awkward in this list, instead of Mahakam Forge, is that, well, it doesn't start with the armor. Now it's an engine instantly. So, because you, you don't have the Dwarf Leader, this was a way how to guarantee armor on Zoltan. Interesting choice. It is. Um, and perhaps a way to kind of prepare the board for Pyaball. Uh, yeah, two things in the deck. Uh, that... Both at the bottom of his deck. He took every mulligan there trying to fish for either Oak or Heat Wave. They are the bottom two for Pyreball here. Okay, so we'll be able to only see one. Either way, uh, some of the good cards are still there for Pyre. That could still be a lot of points. Yes. Kaneki, meanwhile. <sighs> okay. So, Flamenica is much better. That's yes. a good that's a good start. She is now a lot of points. She is going to so many unique beasts in there now. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six, seven, yeah, so six. plus twelve, I believe, uh, could be a seventh in there as well, as Pyabol just begins. Same old way. Doesn't put it on the front row because the only way it's removed is a heat wave, and he is trying to reduce the value of killing it here. That dwarven chariot. Kaneki did choose to mulligan away his champion's charge, which would have removed it. Yeah, and this engine is really important for Pyabo. I think putting it on the back row also helps with uh, having more buddies, mm -hmm. which is what could be useful for Pyabo, uh, with the Great Oak still being an option instead of a heat wave. Very much so. I know we're, we're targeting Flaminica as a tall unit later on, but equally, Great Oak is 10 points on its own. It could end up being you more know, value. Yeah, it could end up being slightly better. As we, He does take the heat wave on it. That is huge. I was thinking, is this going to be his decision? The armor value into this can be huge. You're, there's so many point potential from the Fukusha here. You want to deny as much of that as possible with the armor. So Kaneki says no. A heat wave on a three power engine. And sometimes that is the right choice. It is. You know, engines, if left unchecked, can really make the difference. So Kaneki just didn't want to have to think about it. Paya, meanwhile, commits another bronze. Then we. So, by the way, this one kind of went under radar, the change on the Oxenfus color, I feel like. 
It, it's a really cool card now. The number of units above 11, 11 or higher in your starting deck, it will boost by. It can be a fantastic just sheer point drop now. A really interesting one for decks that are well polarized with their provisions. Yeah, it can work really well. It's not too big of a common, but it can be enough points. Interesting to see it being played. From Kanekisa, we just see the bear, another bear. Bears, yeah, bear, bear, bear. There are bears everywhere. As we now see more row stacking, you are right, more damage coming down as the engine begins to tick. As we've seen the heat wave come in on the armor engine, that choice for Pyabot earlier on, where he decided to give armor to Zoltan in hand rather than passing with his worst card, could end up being worth a lot of value. Indeed, because now he doesn't have to worry about that, and Zoltan will bring a little extra value for Paya. It will, so as it with, comes down. Yeah, with Eudora, by the way, maybe some we haven't played her yet or haven't seen her being played. I think it's a really nice little addition. And now we have one, two, six, seven, eight cards on the front row, am I correct? You are indeed, there are eight on the front row and this is going to be close here. Closer than it looks because Flaminica does have a decent amount of points in her. Pyre Ball, I assume here, it'll be a backup plan first. He'll probably want to hold off as long as he can. Does now, oh, the uh, the rain hits the one armor of Zoltan. No, rain no. is not Pyre Ball's friend. It clearly does not work for him. I think it could be the Oak now, just to make sure you get maximum value out of that fully stacked row. And that's what happens here. Extra armor for Zoltan as well. And then the backup plan, well, is Pyre's well backup plan. It was indeed his exact backup plan. An extra spawn comes in, the, they all jump out with the seagulls. Is this Flaminica even close to enough? That is the question. As I'm... Oh, and he finds the elf of his dreams as well. Kaneki nods in acceptance here, as I think we might just have had our first ever 3-0 for us to cast. Indeed, that was speedy. Okay, Whoa. wow. I bet she and Tilly are now thinking, well, this didn't happen for us. It didn't, and there is Pyreball. He is through. Uh, a, a, smi a slight a smile there from him, a, a little bit of a, yeah, I'm through. I'm happy as we even zoom, zoom in. Even Zoom on his Zoom, I need that emote in my life. He is through. Wow, okay, so Pyre went in confident. You guys in the Divination Challenge were also confident in Pyre. Well, he, you know, delivered. He did, you were right, he has made it through. Commiserations to Kaneki, he did have some horrendously difficult draws there. A few moments of luck in the Skelliger game, but he it just couldn't get anything going. The first two matchups were really rough for him there. There were indeed, and we talked to Kaneki that it was quite difficult actually to come back to Gwent. It, after qualifying. Uh, uh, yes, he so. qualified so long ago at the mid-season tournament, of course. It has been a while, because other people were still trying to qualify. And they fighting. had to fight the ladder. Meanwhile, Kanek had that warm and secure spot in finals. <laughs> and that can, you know, that can be difficult to come back then it after can. all that free time. You're right. So the first person who made it to the final weekend of World Masters is now gone. The legend of Pyreball continues to be written as he takes his series 3-0. I wonder, is there a single person with a divination challenge left? Well, uh, let us know, you know, hashtag Wordmasters. Yeah. We really want to know, is your divination still happening? Are you a really talented fortune teller? We want to know. We do. Uh, but wow. like, like you said, Kaneki did really well. It was brilliant to see it. And now we get to hear a little more from Paya. We do. We can send you over right now to that winner's interview. Hey, Paya. Good to see you back. Congratulations on winning yet another Gwen series and making it yet again to day two. Did that matchup go as planned, as expected? Because before you did say that uh, this was kind of what you were thinking was going to happen and Kaneki kind of agreed with you. But still, did it turn out as you expected? Uh... Honestly, I didn't expect a 3-0 win. Uh, I think I got pretty lucky uh, in some games. I mean, in the first game, I felt like I was in a good spot going into round 3, and then I saw Kaneki bricked and missed his cards, and then I was like, well, okay. Uh, there is not much he can do. Uh, the second game was very close. It was the matchup I was most worried about, so I was really happy to 
win it because I kind of felt like the series is over after that matchup as my precision strike was favored into all of his decks. So yeah, Kanaki put up a good fight, but uh, I don't think he could really do much in this series. Yeah, I saw you both actually hanging out today earlier at the party. Um, how was it for you to meet so many Gwen people again in person today? Uh, it was honestly awesome. I really missed uh, meeting all of you guys, so it was really, really cool uh, to see you again in person. And yeah, I don't think I can come to the watch party tomorrow because uh, <laughs> I kind of have to play my semi-finals. You but, have to get the, uh, the speedy pyre after you yeah. win it all to run over here. <laughs> <laughs> True. Maybe if I lived closer to the HQ I could come, but I live like 50 minutes away, so it's not great. <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking the time. Before I let you go, is there anything you would like to say to either the Twitch chat audience or actually the people in the studio, because they're going to be watching you right now on the big screen as well? Well, uh, Thanks for all the support, guys, and I hope you're having a fun time, and I might come visit you, I don't know, we will see, but if, in case I don't, I love you all, and yeah, hope you had fun. Incredible. Thank you so much for the interview, good luck tomorrow, and now it's time for our greatest geezer to take it away with the analysis. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Ryan. Lovely to hear from Paya and a dominant 3-0 performance. I think everyone was feeling pretty confident Paya would be taking this one home, including his opponent as well. Uh, commiserations to Kaneki Yamori. But let's dive into the games. Not as much to dissect in this series, to be completely honest, as the previous ones. It was a little bit more straightforward, but uh, a great moment for Kaneki in this first game was the Shiru popping off. But unfortunately, despite the Shiru really playing for some pretty impressive value for Kaneki, it just wasn't quite enough. Paya was in a really strong position. The Blood Money leader at this moment in time was damaging by nine. Um, so even despite this incredible Shiru, which is just around the corner, let me fast forward slightly. Here it comes. Uh, the Shiru moving the Squirrel with the Gorilla Tactics to buff it away from uh, buff it away from five. Then the Siri Nova being moved as well. The Milva leader charge putting the Elder Bear down to five, and then that final leader charge for an incredible Shiru. But even despite that, uh, the power of Pyaball's deck was still able to come out on top, as you can see here. Uh, we saw the Salamandra hideout, and then finally this this Royal Decree also. Uh, I mean, even without the Royal Decree, it just wasn't even close in the end, despite that Shiro, which really just shows you how dominant Pyre was in this first little series here. Um, in the second game, then, we uh, were in the tightest one, and, and Pyre just alluded to that. He was most worried about that second series, that second game, that second matchup. So let's take a pretty deep look at this one, because it was actually a really, really close game. It ended up just being four points as the difference and there was a few really important things that happened in this one uh, the thing i want to draw attention to most is the way that Paya played round one it's no surprise in round one as the death wish player that Paya is focusing on getting erendite value and this erendite ended up playing for around 17 15 to 17 points in round number three so Paya was just staying ahead nice and slowly and that was the important thing he didn't overdo it too quickly. If he just slammed down his Bruis and thinned out the Deathwish cards using the Urn of Shadows, then Kaneki would have been pretty tempted to have just passed. But instead what Pyre did is Pyre just continued to play quite slowly, forcing Kaneki to actually overcommit somewhat in, in this round one, which he inevitably ended up losing, as you can see with this Ramon play here. So by Pyre just delaying the Bruis that little bit, uh, that was able to be pretty nice for him. The other other bit of great carryover that Paya was able to develop came in round number two, as we saw Paya time this pass here in round one. Uh, Kaneki just takes the drive pass here in to round number two. And apologies, I've gone a little bit too far there. And Paya, as his carryover play, I, I've gone far too far, apologies. Paya, as his carryover play here, gets the giant toad down on the board. And, oh, I keep missing it. There we go. I finally managed to find the time step. The giant toad is that little bit of carryover. And this is really important against Nilfgaard. Having the giant toad in the graveyard just meant that as soon as the death wish card came down, um, it wasn't able to be locked or removed. And Paya got quite a lot of extra value off of that. Not only the, the points of the giant toad itself, but actually um, the, the, the fact that he was able to get that extra little bit of death wish through. And even with the fact that Paya had the uh, a couple of pretty big cards at, at the bottom, he was still able to 
come out on top. And as you can see, it was super tight in the end. Um, 20 point gap with just a few cards left. And then this Erendite, it was Erendite versus Ivo. The Erendite playing for an insane amount of points, removing the Fuka from the board because that would have been getting plus two. And while the Ivo was very impressive at 17 points, it wasn't quite enough. And just four points, a really, really, really small margin. And the key to success for Paya there was his slow opening to round one while still developing his Erendite every single turn and making the most efficient trades possible. And then finally, last but certainly not least, we had this game number three. Um, and what I want to draw your attention to is the way that Paya just snaps this pass. So Kaneki has just played his, sit his fourth card of round number one in the third game and he's now down at six cards and look at how quickly Pyre takes this pass. Pyre's on seven cards right now. The anglerfish come out and Pyre knows what's up. He has his plan. He just takes that pass instantly because he thinks this is a winning position for him. It's kind of a classic thing for a square tail control deck to do. Just play three and then pass and then the onus is on your opponent to try and uh, cause some trouble and this is what Kaneki was forced to do. Kaneki felt that they would be losing the long round and um, Paya clearly felt this confident in the long round hence why he just snapped this pass on three and then Kaneki tried some kind of wacky line to just you know try and get through. It was a valiant effort. A huge gap opened up. I, I really like the line. A 37 point gap at this moment of the time with the Sove and Full Leader. But just a few turns later, Paya was able to catch right up. We saw the Simless come through. We were a little bit worried about the rope on the Armour's Workshop, but it was all good. And as we just fast forward a little bit more, you can just see Kaneki continuing to try and stay in it. We saw the Full Leader from Paya and the Commander's Horn, which is just so perfect when you think Commander's Horn is one of the original Gwent cards uh, of course if you played the witcher 3 you know that commander's horn used to double the whole of the row and it was one of the best cards in the original gwent in witcher 3 so really fitting that we see it and then even despite paya as i mentioned earlier thinking it was this game paya's bottom two cards at this moment in time were great oak and heat wave despite that paya was able to come out on top pretty comfortably in the end and secured his victory over Kaneki. So congratulations to Pyreball, commiserations to Kaneki Amori. But I'm super excited now for tomorrow because we had some incredible games today and we've got some of the OGs of Gwen really that have made it through to the semi-finals. We've got Magpie, Miamon, we have Savantar and we also have Pyreball. Hopefully I didn't get that wrong. But if I did, our casters will now let me know because they're gonna show you the updated bracket. So over to Lionheart and Arya. Thank you so much for that, Spessy. Masterful analysis as always. And yes, you are right. That is a completed day two bracket. Oh my God. We have just realized that uh, we are casting Maya Ball tomorrow. Yeah, we <laughs> are. And wow, yes, you're right. Ours is Mayamon or Miamon, my apologies, versus Pia Ball. And of course, the first half was concluded earlier in the day. We have a lineup. What a phenomenal day one of Gwent. Indeed, I can't wait for tomorrow. Wow. The games will be insane. <laughs> Get some sleep, but before you die, you know, I'm of course, just so excited. We've got, we got lots to do yet. We can still check and see how much money did that come down to our first three zero. So we have whopping $3,000 for Paya yeah. for this three zero. <laughs> 1,000 for Kaneki. He's not walking home with an empty pocket, but Paya's will Feels a little better, you know? He's, he's currently out in front. He took the entire match stake because, of course, it is split based on the number of games that you win. He has taken it all. Commiserations again to Kaneki. We also did get to bump into him a little bit earlier. Absolutely lovely guy, a complete gent. Sad to see him drop out, but excited for tomorrow more than anything. Indeed. <sighs> you know what, when you mentioned that we get to like talk with people anytime anybody during the interview start talking about the community i'm just like okay yes let's not talk yeah. anymore danirai nearly I had can't. me in tears earlier i was struggling i was like i've got to go on soon danirai don't do this indeed and you know what let's keep composure until tomorrow at least and uh we are so happy to be here that series even though brisk was amazing it to was. watch Thank you so much for being here today with me. It's been my pleasure. We will be back, of course, tomorrow. The series will start again. 
with at 4 p.m. with Celie and Shimiri. But we can't close out this show when we have two stunning hosts doing their absolute best to upstage me in my suit. So with no further ado, we will send you over to Bouja and Ryan. Was was Lionheart really talking about us over there? Like us, us being I wonderful so. hosts? I think that's uh, that's us. I think that might be us. That might be us. Yeah. Man. What strong, a, strong words from a yeah. lovely gentleman like that. Especially that his suit game is always on point, on point. We try uh, as much as we can in order to, to reach that high bar. Speaking of high bars, the players today brought their A game. Yes. Maybe apart from the last match was a 3-0 but uh, you know some um, yeah some matchups are not favorable some are more favorable this one we kind of knew from the beginning that it wasn't gonna work out perfect this I don't is know the, why uh, you brought a sword this um, is the 3-0 sword that uh, Pyreball uh, used on Kaneki so uh, honestly uh, everybody played great I'm, I'm sad for everybody that left and for that I actually also have prepared a, a small candle as well it was an honor um, seeing you all play today, and I know this is a joke, but honestly, it's so much fun to watch you all play. And uh, yeah, especially from all around the world, we had so many different time zones competing today. And uh, I think that's also something you should always keep in mind when you yeah. see players there in the moment, super high tension, 100% focused, and it, it might be 5 a.m. for them. So, yeah, yeah, like Joe and uh, me exactly. and Juan, for them it was 5 a.m. and still they, they managed to be there and kind of bring, uh, of course there's some misplays, but I mean, you're bound to have it in such a uh, stressful and high level tournament, even like these people are, they're not machines, they're human, of yeah. course. And uh, yeah, we sometimes under pressure, not performed uh, our best, but still uh, that draw for me was the highlight for sure, uh, yes. because we restarted the game and everything went smoothly after that. Uh, but uh, you like to see it because you feel like, you know, when you're coming here, you want this to be like you know the best the best the best performance that was there oh yes and i've heard from all the people uh, at the watch party that uh during that draw and just in general when crazy <laughs> plays happen people are going nuts and it's so yeah. such a joy to you know hear people enjoy live grand competitive grand yeah. and uh, there will be more in the future for yeah, sure yeah i wish i can just move from the studio yes. there and <laughs> I work clone from myself. there and do like yeah but it's impossible it's impossible but yeah hopefully we'll get to get there um, once this is done and also tomorrow uh, we'll probably do a more uh, detailed uh, mm -hmm. closing speech tomorrow because it will be it will be the final final day of the final chairman so it's going to be like yes. the final of the final but it's not today so today we're just chill we're yep. easy we're winging it it, we're just having fun and uh, I'm excited for tomorrow because there's also not just high quality Gwent but there's also going to be some more interviews yeah. maybe in the studio. Yeah. Let's find out about that tomorrow. Yeah, we had some good interviews and that actually prompted me before we went on to ask you like, what's your favorite Gwent memory? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That is a very good question. Yeah. Well, Mine? Yeah. Are yeah. you asking me? Yeah, yours. Oh, uh, oof. Um, I'll put you on the spot oh because my I goodness. want like an honest answer. Okay, there's Apart a lot of Apart from working them. with me, well, I know that's the number one thing. I mean... I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean... <laughs> um, uh, now that you're not my lead anymore, I can say something else. You can, um, yeah, true. Uh, no, actually, I love working with you. And uh, to be honest, I will go more into detail tomorrow. Okay. Uh, but uh, obviously, this from means a lot to me because it's been quite a journey. But from the top, the past two weeks, I've been thinking about one special Gwent event quite a lot, and that's Challenger number five. Nice. That holds a very special memory in my heart because uh, I managed to travel here and accompany the players and the production and the cast and You're the hosts. And the, at that yeah, time. exactly. Yeah. So I was filming some stuff back then. And uh, the last two weeks, I've been working on, you know, refining the material and putting something together. So hopefully tomorrow I get to show that off to some people in the studio. Awesome. And then if they like it and if you like it and if Vlad likes it and I other people it. like it, then might be able to show that online but uh yeah so well gwen challenger five uh also you know magpie won that one back yeah, then and yeah. he's still competing today going to the semis my respect for tomorrow yeah incredible all right enough jibber jabber from us uh thank you all for watching today tune in tomorrow same place same time as we started today 4 p.m cet not cst no more summer there's snow outside so uh <laughs> we can actually try to pull that one off and yeah, it's been it's been awesome hosting day one and see you at day two. And tomorrow I'll ask you about your favorite gun memory. Bye. I'll be ready. Bye.